This is Journalstone Publishing's presentation of Hard-Boiled Horror, a series of short stories edited by Jonathan Mabry, read by Karen Allers and Dan John Miller. Out for Blood by Max Allen Collins and Matthew V. Clemens 2.42 a.m., Friday, November 4, 1960 a Cheshire cat smile blossomed on the craggly, handsome face of Lieutenant Cliff Hunter as he stood shivering in the cold night air. The shiver was only marginally weather-related. Mostly it came from the thrill of a chase successfully concluded, even if he'd not been there himself at the finish line. Hands in the pockets of his black overcoat, hatless to reveal close-cropped, gray-tinged brown hair, Hunter might have been a tall, angular scarecrow, if that scarecrow had been given a damn good stuffing of hay. Standing in the backyard of Coach Michael Massey, whose shredded corpse lay at his feet, Chicago's nastiest homicide dick damn near whooped and hollered for joy. Instead, Hunter stood stoically, studying the bustle around him, a team of uniformed cops under work lamps digging around the yard. Seven graves had been at least partially open when the homicide lieutenant arrived. All seven girls were cheerleaders some missing for as long as three years, the latest one, lucky survivor Bonnie Larkin, having disappeared not quite six weeks ago. A scrawny young uniformed officer named Jensen sidled up next to Hunter. There's a reporter at the roadblock. We told him to bug off, but he claims you called him. That would be Mr. Grail, Hunter said with a smile. It's Grail, all right, sticking his nose in again. Laddie Buck, the fourth estate has its uses. Go get him. Yes, sir, Jensen said, rolling his eyes, but doing as he was told. Hunter yanked a pack of cigarettes from his coat pocket like a gun he planned to fire at a fleeing suspect. He shook out a lucky strike, pulled out his zippo, and cupped a hand against the wind as he lit up. He took a deep, soothing drag, then exhaled its blue cloud as he watched the reporter coming around the house. The detective hadn't called the TV stations, they would love to have this for their morning broadcasts, lovely breakfast background for their viewers, or any of the other papers or even a radio station or two. But Grail he trusted, at least as far as any reporter could be. So only he got the call. Let the other news hounds do their own work. Grail was accompanied by a scrawny, bespectacled photographer, Kenton, who was practically dwarfed by his flash camera. To his credit, Kenton marched in the reporter's shadow and didn't immediately start snapping away. The photog had been around long enough to know that Hunter would bust up a camera if he felt his territorial rights had been violated. Blonde and blue-eyed and boyish, the husky grail had been mistaken for actor Troy Donahue by more than one autograph seeker. Hunter had no idea what the initials in C.T. Grail stood for. Like everybody, he called the reporter Digger. Beyond that, the cop knew little about the Chicago Daily Journal's top police beat scribe, other than that Digger Grail's investigative pieces had helped topple the last two corrupt administrations, and the guy wasn't even 30 yet. As the reporter and his cameraman neared, Hunter blew out another gray-blue cloud and nodded toward the two men. Digger? Kenton? They nodded and said, Lieutenant, so simultaneously they might have rehearsed it. Taking the lead, Grail said, Lieutenant Hunter, what goes on here? Looks like a treasure hunt. Not exactly. He gestured vaguely toward the looming Victorian monstrosity behind them. Maybe you'd like to interview the owner of the house. The reporter and Fotag traded puzzled looks, but then followed as Hunter walked a few steps, then pointed the amber eye of his lucky strike down at what was left of their host. The reporter sucked in a quick breath, and the cameraman took an involuntary step backward. They had seen plenty, but this was an especially grisly one. 9.17 p.m., Thursday, November 3, 1960 When Rusty was alive, she didn't believe in God. But Madeline Rusty Naylor had long ago begun to have doubts about her doubts. Long ago. The petite, slender, red-haired beauty with the ghostly pale flesh had been twenty-eight when she died. But what that meant in the context of her age now, well, she would have to look it up and do some math, ha, to give you an accurate count. Moonlight brushing her black silk jumpsuit, 
She crept along the edge of a row of high bushes, approaching an old Victorian home right out of Charles Adams. The man who lived in that house was a human devil, not in the supernatural sense, but a devil, all right. And that was what got Rusty thinking about God. She had encountered so many devils over these long years. They simply had to have a big boss, right? A top devil? Like the mob guys in Chicago, a big boy. And if Satan existed, didn't it stand to reason a higher power was working on the other side of the street, too? But which side of the street am I working, anyway? she wondered. Still, there was no doubt which side of the street Michael Massey worked. Massey, a consulting coach who traveled among Chicago's public high schools helping cheerleaders, was a prime suspect in a string of disappearances among the teenage girls he had taught. The police had investigated him for months, but come up empty. Her pal Cliff Hunter on the Detective Bureau had suggested to the Larkins, the distraught parents of one missing girl, that they try tooth-and-nail inquiries on Rush Street. Tooth-and-nail was Rusty and her longtime partner, Max Mantooth, and their small office was above the Rusty Nail Bar on Rush Street, out of which the two also worked, Rusty singing, Max noodling the 88s. She owned both businesses a little jazz blues club with a couple of P.I.s attached, just like Peter Gunn on TV. Almost. Rusty only worked nights, Max worked days, and the occasional night, but they met with clients together, at the nail, between sets. They had listened to the troubled parents for only a few minutes before taking on the case. Max, whose stumpy frame had seen him underestimated by more than one unlucky devil, had been digging into Coach Massey's life ever since. Her partner had put most of the story together, and tonight had phoned Rusty to say that he had verified their suspicions about the popular coach. Now it was Rusty's turn to get into the case. It was cold enough that she might have been able to see her breath, if she still drew breath. The moon hung high and full, a killing moon, they called it. A wintry blast off Lake Michigan had turned this north-side Chicago suburb into a veritable ghost town and Rusty knew where the bodies of those ghosts were likely buried. This far north, there weren't many houses, and the ones she had surveilled stood well apart from its few neighbors, woods buffering it on three sides. A two-story gothic, it reminded her of the spooky hilltop house in last summer's Hitchcock flick, Psycho. The killer in that movie would have felt perfectly at home residing here. She was downwind of it. Massey wouldn't know she was there, but even twenty yards from his lair and through its wood and mortar walls, Rusty could smell his cheap aftershave. But all the old spice in the world couldn't cover up the smell of corruption that oozed from that dark old house. That was one benefit of her weakened powers. The smell of Massey and his aftershave might have overwhelmed her had her senses been as sharp as her incisors were right now. She had not fed, really fed, for months. Her arrangement with a contact in the local blood bank allowed her to get expired blood, which did the trick, if barely, though the taste of the stuff was hardly gourmet. For the real, fresh thing, she relied on cases like the Massey one. Rusty Naylor's biggest problem was her conscience. She had never been comfortable feeding on the innocent. She could only live with herself, so to speak, if she dined on the guilty. But there hadn't been that kind of case, that kind of monster, available for some months now. As with humans, the quality of a vampire's health was determined by the nutritional value of their food intake. Tonight, to her, a healthy adult male in his thirties would be like a juicy rare fillet at George Diamond's to a day-dweller. The fact that Massey was a vicious, shrewd, resourceful, physically fit specimen, who would probably put up a good fight, well... <laughs> That was a bonus of sorts, though Rusty never gained weight. Being dead was a real benefit to a girl trying to keep her figure. She still needed to keep her muscles toned. In the wooded area to the right of the house, she perked, her nostrils flaring in recognition of another scent, this one more her partner. Keeping an eye on the house, she made her way around to that dark patch of woods. By the time she entered the tight tangle of trees, Max had moved on. He would be getting into position behind the house. The reason he had drawn her here, however, was immediately obvious. The aroma of death tinged the air. Not enough so that humans might smell it, but she caught it right away, a foul scent that grew stronger as she moved forward to where she could see a grave that lay open, 
as if an animal had dug up the body that was buried there. But the face that stared up at the night sky belonged not to a corpse, but the missing Larkin girl. Alive. Wild eyes, daring relief at seeing someone who wasn't massy, saucering up at her over a slash of duct tape gag. The girl's wrists and ankles were similarly duct taped, and she could wriggle down there, but not much else. Who could say what horrors this young woman had endured before her captor had finished with her and deposited her in a hole in a backyard where, Rusty shivered to think, he would likely bury her alive after having done with her. So many monsters in this world, she thought. That was why the smell of death had been so muted. The Larkin girl lived. But nearby, other graves had been scratched open by the claws of an animal, an animal that had somehow resisted attacking Bonnie Larkin. And if Rusty had held any doubt that Massey was their man, that doubt vanished into the moonlit night. This was a graveyard, the graveyard of a madman. Well, she thought, as matter-of-fact as a plumber about to begin an unpleasant but necessary job, it's time for Massey to pay for his crimes and for me to get a decent damn meal. 2.45 a.m., Friday, November 4th, 1960. The seasoned copper supposed he would have preferred that the system had been able to take care of the sadistic, perverted coach. But though they'd suspected Massey from the start, the Homicide Bureau had never been able to tie Massey to the disappearances, much less bring him to justice. And among his students at various schools around the area, Massey had been a popular, charismatic figure. The coach? Do something bad to those girls? Why, that's crazy. He's an all-American boy. A man's man. Everybody's favorite. Right now, the rescued girl was in the hospital. She had been beaten and sexually assaulted, apparently kept prisoner all this time, the plaything of the dead monster at Hunter's feet. The girl was in shock and had said very little, but even when she came out of it, she would give them jack squat about the exact nature of her rescue. This much Hunter knew. And that was fine with Hunter, because it was his recommendation of the tooth and nail agency to the child's parents that had put Coach Michael Massey on a collision course with rough justice. Hunter had no doubt about who had settled the score for those girls, but so far no evidence indicated that Rusty Naylor or her fat-ass partner Max were anywhere near the crime scene. Of course, if there had been any such evidence at the scene, Hunter would have made damn sure it went undiscovered. It didn't hurt that the surrounding neighbors had already been quickly canvassed, and no one had seen anybody around these parts resembling either of those two rather distinctive-looking private eyes. Hunter didn't give a damn if Naylor had killed Massey or if Max had done it, or even if it had been the animal attack it appeared to be. In the past, the villains he'd sick tooth and nail on had just disappeared. But this time, because of the missing girls, it had been necessary for the coach's evil to be exposed. Why the tooth and nail duo had chosen such a brutal, bloody, and even savage method of concealing their actions, Hunter couldn't hazard a guess. He would talk to them about it, suggesting in the future so gruesome a cover-up might not be the smartest way to fly, though, truth be told, Hunter flat out didn't give a damn what had been done to the coach in this charnel house of a backyard. Whatever had happened to beloved Coach Massey had been too easy, because the son of a bitch had earned the kind of fate the state was just too damn genteel to mete out. 9.21 p.m. Thursday, November 3, 1960 Rusty helped the child out of the hole, the girl obviously astonished that her slender female rescuer could lift her so easily. Like a groom carrying a bride over the threshold, Rusty transported this precious duct-taped cargo to the bushes where she deposited the still-frightened girl to relative safety. All Rusty did was raise a shush finger to her lips and go. Given the situation, she saw no reason to bother with stealth. Although Massey seemed to like blondes, a petite redhead turning up on his front porch might just arouse his attention. She unzipped the jumpsuit enough to give herself some cleavage and headed for the front door. Light shone in several downstairs windows, presumably the living room, and another in a room in the back, maybe the kitchen. She climbed the stairs, the wood creaking even under her slight weight. She knocked. Nothing. She knocked again, hard, 
insistent. Footsteps echoed hollowly within the old house, growing louder, until the door swung open and she stood face to face with a muscular man nearly a foot taller than her five foot five and easily a hundred pounds heavier than her one ten. His immediate, chillingly charming smile conveyed his certainty of a huge advantage over her in size and strength. Wouldn't be his first mistake, but possibly his last. He had a square-jawed, dark-haired Rock Hudson look, his dark brown eyes pouring over her like pawing hands. Let him try something like that, and she would break every single finger, then his hands, forearms, and so forth, and relish every moment. But she doubted he was so crude, so early in a relationship. Well, he said, hello. His collar was open at the throat, black chest hair curling, carotid pulsing. He wore jeans and a plaid work shirt, giving him a lumberjack air, and they were a little dirty, as were his clodhopper boots. He'd been digging, after all. Hello, she said. Car breakdown? She smiled without showing her teeth and fought the urge to rip out his throat where he stood. But the light was on over the porch, and the house wasn't that remote. My name is Madeline Naylor, Coach Massey, and I wondered if we might talk. It's something important. Perhaps reading her for a fellow teacher, or possibly parent, he dialed his smile down and creased his brow. Do come in, Miss Naylor, if you think you have something important to share. Of course I'm interested. Massey moved aside and gestured for her to enter. Sorry I'm a little messy, he said, grinning now as if they were old friends. I was doing some late-night gardening. Moon's right for it, she said. The living room was bright, welcoming, masculine, in an anonymous manner, more typical of apartments than an old Victorian home. It gave no hint of being the lair of a molesting murderer. He motioned her to a comfortable-looking leather sofa and took a seat on a nearby chair, his attention focused on her with well-practiced professional concern. So, what brings you to my door, unannounced at this late hour, on such a cold night? Now it was just half a smile, and he conveyed just a hint of displeasure. Without a phone call first, I'm in the book. She leaned forward slightly, giving him a good look at her cleavage. Rusty was a permanent twenty-eight, and wondered if she was too old for Massey. If he could have guessed her real age, well, she'd really be too old for this lethal Lothario. Coach Massey, it's about the disappearance of Bonnie Larkin. His eyes left her breasts and found their way to her face, and then he let out a long, slow breath. Very distressing thing, sweet child, lovely girl. Yes. I didn't have much contact with Bonnie. No? No, and I'm terribly surprised. You are? Yes, from what I saw, she didn't seem like the type of girl who would just run off like that. Oh, so you assume she's a runaway, then? He mimicked sadness and shook his head. It's a terrible trend. It's the loosening of values. I would never dream of blaming the parents, but, well, <laughs> if they were doing their job, this kind of thing just wouldn't happen. Actually, she didn't run away. Oh, you seem convinced of that. I am. I know the circumstances of her disappearance. He frowned in deep interest, leaning forward a little, cocking his head. Really? Uh, what? It was more of an abduction. A lot of these mass killers gain the confidence of their victims, ask them for help, or offer a ride home, often someone they know, that they trust, an uncle perhaps, or a teacher. Something flickered across Massey's face. Was it fear? Hard to tell, because almost instantly the monster's mask of concern was back in place. It's an interesting theory. Have you shared this with her parents or the police? I could, but it's not a theory, and anyway, that isn't what I was hired to do. He shifted on the chair slightly, sitting more forward, a concerned teacher who was actually a predator, ready to pounce. You were hired? You're not a counselor? or another teacher, though as familiar with the area school system, I think I'd have noticed if you were. No, I was hired to get her back. You mean like negotiating with a kidnapper? Not really. You see, I'm a detective, not police, private, 
This is a missing persons case, and the parents didn't feel the authorities were getting the job done. So here I am. Eyebrows lifted and dropped. Ah, I see. But as I say, I really didn't have much contact with that poor girl. Right. His expression turned openly lascivious as he allowed his eyes to travel her tight jumpsuit again. What's a nice girl like you doing in a job like that? You don't look like a private dick. Can't pay that well. I don't charge particularly high fees. Then why go into such a rough line of work? Because of the perks. What kind of perks? She shrugged a shoulder. Well, sometimes I get to take bad people off the street. He was enormously amused, the teeth in his grin huge. <laughs> really? A sweet little pussy cat like you? She nodded and, like an accountant giving the client the bad news about his taxes, coldly stated, You had your fun and were about to bury the girl in the backyard when I showed up and interrupted the party. Did you bury them all alive? That's a pretty sick kink, even for a bastard like you. Massey sat in silence for several moments. How much, honey? How much to take a walk? Now it was Rusty's turn to smile, still careful not to show her teeth. You think you can buy your way out of this? If this isn't blackmail, why bother with the visit? I'm willing to pay. Big. You are going to pay, she said. Big. He leapt. 2.46 a.m., Friday, November 4th, 1960. Who was he? Grail asked the detective, pale as a blister, his voice raspy. Now don't you go puking on my crime scene. I've seen worse. I doubt that, laddie. Who was he, Cliff? Michael Massey, Hunter said, not minding the informality. Grail's gaze met Hunter's. Your suspect in the missing cheerleaders case, Coach Popularity. Well, apparently not popular with everybody. The reporter shook his head, bared his teeth. I should have gone with that story. Why did I listen to you and not run the damn thing? Because the coach might have sued your ass. We weren't sure it was him. You're sure now? Those holes being dug up? The boys ain't planting flowers, bucko. And they ain't looking for truffles. Them's graves. The reporter and photographer took a slow look around, then their eyes returned to the bloody body at their feet. Grail asked, Have you identified any of the victims? Just the survivor, whose name we're withholding for now. Well, it has to be the Larkin girl. I didn't say so, but the surviving child hasn't even given a statement. She's getting medical treatment, and probably a head shrinker will be called in, too. She had a rough few weeks. And you're sure these others are the rest of the missing cheerleaders? Some of them, anyway. All of them, we hope. How can you know that, without being able to identify them? The good coach was thoughtful enough to bury him with their cheerleader uniforms on. Grail shuddered. Sick. Maybe so, but he's taken the cure. Blinking behind big lenses, Kenton asked. How so? I mean, what the hell happened to him? Hunter shrugged. Until the coroner gets here and scoops him up for an autopsy, your guess is as good as mine. 9.28 p.m., Thursday, November 3, 1960. The blow was a right that landed flush on her cheek and would have subdued any living human half her size. In Rusty's anemic state, she felt slightly stunned. Pressing his advantage, Massey grabbed an arm and flung her off the couch and onto the floor. She let out a soft moan. He threw himself on top of her, pinned her to the floor, and his fists rained blows on her slender body, blows that should have turned her bones to kindling. She gave no resistance, and he did not notice the lack of crunching or breaking of those bones. Assuming she had been properly subdued, Massey sent his hands to her throat, and she could hear his breath accelerating with passion. He was enjoying himself. Did he intend to kill her, or merely black her out and have his way, and then she, too, could be deposited in a grave and have dirt shoveled in her face to suffocate in terror? As he squeezed harder, she opened her eyes, then parted her lips, and gave him a good look at the distended fangs. Hell! 
he blurted, and let go as if her throat were a hot stove, then scrambled off her. At first he backpedaled, then he turned and ran, heading for the back of the house. She was right behind him, not having to work at it at all. Even weak, she was twice as fast as any living human. She caught up with him in the kitchen, where he had opened a drawer and pulled out two forks. He held them toward her in the form of a cross. Rusty laughed and threw a tiny fist squarely into his sternum. The sharp little punch shot him back into the counter, his forks flying in opposite directions, clanging to the floor. "'It only works when we believe,' she said, jerking a thumb at herself. Then she pointed at him like Uncle Sam on the poster. "'Plus, you gotta believe, and I'm pretty sure you don't.' Like a dancer, she kicked her pointed boot into his stomach and drove the air from him. He dropped to his knees. He looked up at her in shock and pain. <laughs> what are you? What are you? What do you think I am? A fucking vampire. Got it right off the bat. No pun intended. He gulped air and managed to struggle to his feet. <laughs> I'm dreaming, he said. I'm hallucinating. Yeah, that's probably it. She lifted him by one arm and threw him against his refrigerator, knocking his teaching schedule and the magnet that held it to the linoleum floor. Massey picked himself up, and his face tightened as he studied this creature who, whatever her ungodly powers, was so much smaller than he. And now he bared his own teeth, flew at her with a growl, and delivered a left-right combination that stung a little, even knocked her back. Then he scrambled for the back door. She followed him with no sense of urgency. She felt weaker, having really exerted herself. At least the odor of his cheap aftershave had been blotted out by the scent of fear. The full moon illuminated the dead grass of the backyard, making Massey's plaid shirt practically glow as he ran toward the woods, past the open grave and over the graves of other victims. He glanced in terror over his shoulder and saw her advancing, in no apparent hurry. As he neared the woods, she could sense his relief at the chance he might actually lose her in the thick brush. This was geography he knew, and that this intruder did not. Then the coach paused involuntarily as he heard the snarl of an animal. A dog? She could hear it too, though she wasn't near him yet. She smiled. No, not a dog. When she saw the coach next, he was frozen in his tracks until he spun toward her, wondering if the animal sound had emanated from her. A howl ripped through the quiet night in half, so loud, so terrible, it might have torn the moon in two. Now Massey turned to her, his handsome face horror-struck, his voice pitiful. "'Something's out there.' "'Yes,' she said. "'But it's not after me.' His clasped hands reached out. Please help me. I'll, I'll turn myself in. I'll give the police a list of all the names. The parents can have some peace of mind. Ah, uh, peace of mind, that can be comforting. His eyes bugged, and he held his palms out in front of him, like a crosswalk guard, as if that would stop her. P please, he said. Almost strolling now, moving ever closer, she asked, Did you make those girls beg, beg for their lives? I'm sorry. He moaned, the fight out of him now. It's something, something I, I can't control, something inside of me. I know the feeling, but with that kind of sickness you have to channel it, Coach. Channel it into something constructive, or at least not destructive. I'll do anything you want. She was close enough to kiss him now. His breath was in her face. What was that, Sen Sen? I know she said gently. Anything you want, if you just don't hurt me. She smiled and embraced him, pulling him tight against her body. The human felt so warm to her, it was like hugging a furnace. The enormous wolf, larger than any man, came out of the woods on all fours, then reared up onto its hind legs and walked several steps, as if that were the most natural thing in the world. The creature stood not far from them, his cold red eyes staring at Massey hungrily, the saliva dripping from fangs that made hers look meager. The coach made no effort to pull away from her, as if they suddenly were friends, even lovers. A, a wolf? he whispered. A around here? Not just any wolf, Massey swallowed. 
That can't be. That's not a... a, a, a werewolf? Yes, he's with me. What? Massey blurted, finally trying to pull away now, if only to see her face better in the moonlight. That's my partner, Max. Max, meet the coach. Coach, meet Max. The wolf took a big step forward. Massey seemed suddenly to have forgotten all about being in a vampire's embrace. To the werewolf, she said, Stay, Max. Not yet. You know the rules. Now, sit. The werewolf sat, its demeanor cooling, its tongue lolling, like a big Irish setter. Massey looked incredulous. H how do you manage that? Her answer was to sink her incisors into the coach's carotid artery. Arteries were better than veins, the blood more oxygenated, the flavor more full, the spurting liquid thicker and hotter, or at least it seemed that way, flowing freely and reminding her how hungry she really was. The coach didn't even have a chance to scream, though his mouth was wide, as were his eyes. He was learning what it was like to be violated. 2.48 a.m., Friday, November 4, 1960 Looks like an animal attacked him, Grail said, stating the obvious. But it's almost like that animal got interrupted. If it was an animal, it would have, well, finished its feast. And if the creature had kept at it, there'd be nothing left but bones that might get scattered. Or if the beast were doing someone's bidding, maybe buried? Chuckling, Hunter said, <laughs> with that imagination, maybe you ought to go on shock theater and help introduce the horror flicks. Grail ignored the crack. You don't think it's odd, a wild animal attack so close to the city? I suppose, Hunter conceded. Whatever it was, must have surprised him. Yep, the detective agreed. He wasn't about to help Grail on a fishing expedition. You know, Grail said, eyes narrowing, a hand on a hip. Three other really bad people, guys you weren't able to bring in, have disappeared in the last six months. There was that cheating husband suspected of killing his wife. That outfit guy who you figured burned down his restaurant and got three employees killed. And that nightclub guy whose ex-waitresses had a bad habit of dropping off the edge of the earth. Now this. I don't see a connection, Hunter said. You don't think they could be related? The detective shrugged. Hadn't much thought about it. Three guys who the Homicide Bureau couldn't bag just... Disappear, and now a mass murderer, who similarly evaded your grasp, suddenly gets attacked by a rabid dog or a bear or God knows what in his own backyard, and you don't think they might be related? Hunter was starting to regret that he'd given Grail the nod tonight, but they didn't call the guy Digger for nothing. We'll look at this thing from all directions, Hunter allowed. But isn't this enough of a story for you without dragging in some half-assed theory? A tiny smile made a half-moon curve on the reporter's surfer boy face. Okay, then, Cliff. Let's stick to the story. How do you explain an animal attack like this, essentially inside the city? Son, we're standing in the last suburb on the edge of civilization, Hunter said. If this hadn't been related to an ongoing missing persons investigation, I wouldn't even be here. But you are here. And the local cops are out setting up sawhorses in the street and keeping back the rubberneckers. Gives them something to do. Grail shook his head. So it's a suburb. That doesn't make it Yosemite National Park. Let's face it. Suspected killers don't usually just disappear or get mauled by bears in the city limits. I'll grant it's unusual, Hunter said, and he placed a fatherly hand on Grail's shoulder. But, Digger... I didn't call you out here to let you indulge that wild hair up your tail imagination of yours. The reporter was shaking his head. Look, Cliff, this is a fresh kill. How the hell did you even hear about it so soon? The girl who might or might not be the Larkin girl got free and then managed to find her way to the nearest neighbor's house. They called the locals. When they saw the graves, they phoned me and I called you. Why did you call me? I called you and only you. Hunter said, gesturing toward the graves. Because these girls need Digger Grail. Bodies of sad, skeletal cheerleaders were now visible all around them, washed ivory in the moonlight, an eerie tableau with work lamps creating spotlight effects on each grave. You, the detective said, 
can give them peace, them and their parents. Tell your readers that the killer of these kids is dead and that he won't be killing anyone ever again. You can quote me. To hell with alleged. But Grail wasn't fully on board yet. What? And I should just say that justice was wrought by a wolverine? Hunter moved closer to the reporter, and this time, when he settled a hand on the man's shoulder, he squeezed a little. Sonny boy, write it up however the coroner tells you to. The important thing to remember is that a killer of young girls is off the street. For good. Hunter drew back. Grail brushed his shoulder like Hunter's hand had left dirt there. You think that's all there is to it? A killer gets killed, so justice is done, and who cares how? Think of it as an early Christmas present, bucko. St. Nick come a month early this year. Then Hunter walked away from the reporter and his photographer to check in with his other team of diggers. 9.34 p.m., Thursday, November 3, 1960. Rusty followed him to the ground and fed for a good long time, hunkered over Massey, savoring the meal. There was nothing delicate about it, and she knew she was a beast, like Max, at feeding time. Speaking of Max, nearby he was growing impatient, scratching an ear with a clawed paw, as if any flea would dare travel on that fur. Finally, he began pacing, a lion not liking being caged. When she had finally drained their host of everything that had made him human, well, as human as a monster like the coach could be, she rose over the withered corpse and gave the werewolf a nod. Max needed no more invitation than that. Having a werewolf for a partner had its advantages. Once she had fed, she couldn't exactly leave Massey's body lying around on the ground with two big punctures torn in his throat. That was where Max Mantooth came in. First she fed. Then he ate. And for such a bad man, Massey had been delicious. With his wounds now camouflaged by even more massive injuries, the killer was barely recognizable. Yet he could still be identified. Rusty looked sternly down at the wolf, raising a finger. Enough, Max. The wolf continued to chew on the corpse, tearing scraps of meat off bone. He lingered over the ribs, his favorite cut. Max, she said sharply. Enough! Grudgingly, the animal stopped chewing and took a slumped-shouldered step back. Now, heal! Max crept to her side like a scolded puppy, and she scratched his ear for him. If she hadn't been undead, the werewolf would have torn her flesh off every bit as quickly as she had Massey's. Only part of her P.I. partner, the genial Max Mantooth, remained accessible within the werewolf. But in her state of unliving, she was able to help mediate and moderate Max's behavior and summon the man inside the beast. That was who she spoke to now. Max, the families of those girls deserve to know that their daughter's killer isn't out there any more. The wolf just looked up at her. Simple commands Max easily understood when the wolf took over. More complicated thoughts, that varied greatly. Still, she felt the need to try to explain why she had called him off. Getting the girls' bodies back will give the parents some peace, and being able to know their killer is dead, and not merely vanished, that will give them a different kind of peace. Max nuzzled her hand. Good boy, she said, and scratched his neck. The werewolf loped off into the woods. Max's car was somewhere on the other side, waiting for sunup. There was no danger to innocence, not when he had fed so recently and well. She went into the psycho house to freshen up, to get the blood off her face and clean off her jumpsuit, the silk cloth of which cooperated nicely. She looked at herself in Massey's bathroom mirror. Her incisors had withdrawn. She was sated. Then she went to the bushes, where she untied the Larkin girl. "'Who are you?' the girl asked, smiling and crying. "'No one.' I wasn't here, understand? You crawled out of that grave yourself and got away. <laughs> but it has to be that way. You'll hear that something terrible happened to Coach Massey. Good. Yes, but you know nothing about it. The girl's eyes were wide. <laughs> well, well, I don't. Bonnie, who am I? I, I don't know. Could you tell a sketch artist what I looked like? No. Who saved you? Uh, no one. I, I crawled away by myself. 
She patted the girl's shoulder. Good girl. Give me a couple of minutes and then find the nearest house with the light on. Tell them to call the police. Rusty pointed to the west. Go that way. It's not far to the neighbors. Oh, okay. Thank you. Pleasure is mine, Rusty said and ran off into the night. 11.13 p.m. Friday, November 4th, 1960. Many hours later, when darkness had once again fallen, Digger Grail, pulling his red Studebaker Avanti into a Rush Street parking space, wondered if he'd done the right thing, filing a story that said an animal attack had ironically taken out the animal that Coach Massey had secretly been. What better exclusive could a reporter ask from his cop contact? When the journal hit the street tomorrow morning, the news of the backyard graveyard, the surviving cheerleader, and the mauled murderer would have the city talking, hell, screaming. The good citizens of the Windy City would bemoan the loss of the young girls, celebrate the escape of one lucky survivor, and applaud the death of a madman, his readers caught up in a fever as animalistic as Massey's demise. Still, Digger felt he'd dropped the ball. He hadn't allowed himself, in his front-page byline story, to speculate on the possible connection between those other recent disappearances of human monsters. It was just too thin, too much of a reach, and anyway, this was not a story that needed any extra window dressing. Maybe in the days and nights ahead, he could dig. Maybe he could find the connection, if there was one. But to do that, he needed more than what he had now. What he needed now was a beer, the rusty nail, whose red and yellow neon sign, with its flashing hammer and nail, extended toward Rush Street like an invitation, or maybe a threat, was just the spot for that. The club stayed open till 4 a.m., and it was after 2 now, but the small, intimate piano bar was at near capacity. The entertainment here never changed, yet it always drew a healthy audience, Rusty Nailer singing, her pal Max Mantooth at the Ivories, a combo that locals and tourists alike couldn't get enough of. Why she worked her own little room like this, and nowhere else, never going on the road, was a mystery that eluded the city's star crime reporter. Digger stepped into the smoky club, nodded to George behind the bar, and got a nod back, the pug-faced bartender immediately drawing a glass of beer for the reporter. A sea of little round tables faced the tiny platform stage with brick wall backdrop. Perched on a stool next to the piano, Rusty was singing Cry Me a River in a sexy, breathy style that Julie London herself couldn't best. A pale vision of beauty with bright red lipstick, she wore a black sheath with side slits almost to heaven, her diminutive yet buxom form caught in the single fixed spot like a fog light glowing through the cigarette haze. Digger got lucky and caught a stool down toward the end, fairly near the stage, and George was right there with that frosty glass of Schlitz, with Rusty's voice in his ear whispering, Cry me a river, and a cold beer at his lips. Digger suddenly found life less horrible. When Rusty finished the tune, the audience applauded, only the out-of-towners really slapping their palms, while many of the hipper locals snapped their fingers, not clapping. Digger smiled at that. The beat scene was making inroads everywhere. Then Rusty did a very smoky that's all, and Digger had to admit that Max, the stocky piano player in the baggy brown suit, somehow lent a deft, nicely jazzed touch to everything Rusty sang, even if his fingers did look like sausages. More applause, more finger snapping, and Rusty slid off the stool, flashing lovely white limbs, blew a little kiss to the crowd, and stepped down from the stage. One of the oddities of the Rusty Nail was, you never knew what nights Rusty would perform. You never knew what time she'd begin, what time she'd end, even how long a set was, or whether she'd be back for another. It was her place, after all, and the spirit had to move her. Digger dug that. And then she was standing beside him. Buy you a drink, handsome? I should buy you one. You're the girl. I'm the boy. An eyebrow arched. I could tell that right away, but I own the place, so I do the buying. Come, sit. Though the dialogue varied, this was a ritual. He would come in almost every night about now, and if she were singing that night, she'd come over, they'd flirt a little, then she would lead him to the private booth in the corner that always had a reserved sign on it. They sat across from each other. Coffin now? 
he asked her, offering her a cigarette. No, I quit. She'd brought along her standard Bloody Mary. Yeah, they're saying it's bad for you. He fired his up. But I smoke filter tips. It cuts the risk. Not that I care. She sipped the drink. You're in a mood, aren't you? Am I? Maybe I'm wondering when you're going to go out with me. I mean, night after night we sit here and I get the feeling that you, well, that you like me okay. I do like you okay. Then how about lunch tomorrow? The burger off? The blood-red lips smiled and showed off very perfect white teeth. You know I don't go out much in the day. It's my condition. You're sensitive to sunlight. More like allergic. It's fall. Damn near winter. They predict clouds tomorrow. Let's get lunch. Another sip. No. I need my rest, Digger. I need my sleep. As long as we both work nights, it's going to be tough getting to know each other any better. It's a nice friendship. A nice flirtation. Don't mess with it. The reporter sighed. I can't blame a guy for trying. The red lips formed a sexy little smirk. I'd be disappointed if you stopped. But what's wrong, Digger? Something's different tonight. You've got a weight on your shoulders. Digger shrugged. A man died last night. Or really, this morning. Men die every night. Was he a good man? No. A very bad one. You know those missing girls? Ah, the cheerleaders? I read about that. A trusted coach behind the disappearances. Seven dead girls. That we know of, Digger said. That one girl got away is a blessing, but... He blew a wreath of smoke. <sighs> kind of a lousy world, isn't it? You're a crime-beat reporter in Chicago, and you just noticed this? The news is mum about how this coach met his fate, if I may be so flip about it. Digger sighed. Eh, the coroner calls it death by misadventure. Well, that's a little vague. Animal attack, coyotes, according to the M.E. on the scene. Was this in the city? Up north, Grail said. Suburb right where the city turns into the country. So God decided to step in and balance the ledgers. Does that bother you? You sound like Cliff Hunter. Digger shrugged again. It's just uh, too many coincidences lately. Three other bad guys disappeared in recent months. Maybe they had misadventures, too. George brought Rusty another Bloody Mary. She sipped it casually and asked, Gonna do a story on these coincidences? He finished his beer, then nodded. Think so. Gotta dig some first. She thought about that, then said, I'm going to do one more set, if you want to hang around and talk about it. Digger shook his head. Nah, I need some sleep. Then, uh, how about that date tomorrow? Still up for that? Lunch at the Berghoff? No. How about a pizza at Gino's down the street? Meet me here at seven and we'll walk. I'm not going out until about ten tomorrow, so we'll have plenty of time to talk. Cool. Another little red smirk. Do me a favor, would you? Round up Max. He's up at the bar. Tell him I want to go over the set list with him. Then you go home and get forty winks. Sure. But it'll be like fifty winks. <laughs> I am beat. He slipped out of the booth, winked at her, and got one back for the effort, ran his errand, then headed out into the cold night. But he felt better now, knowing that he'd finally wrangled a date out of Rusty, though he had no clue why tonight had done the trick. He was pulling his Avani out of its parking place when he noticed the car waiting to pull in was a familiar one, an aqua blue Thunderbird. Couldn't be two cars like that, he thought, as he pulled away. He glanced in the rearview mirror and saw Lieutenant Cliff Hunter step from the car and head toward the rusty nail, his footsteps keeping time with its pulsing neon. But a voice from somewhere back in his skull whispered, Time to start digging, Digger. Time to start digging. Digger Grail didn't see the lovely young woman, who was not really young at all, shooing the homicide detective inside, only to linger beneath the pulsing rusty nail sign, watching the reporter's taillights recede. Rusty Naylor didn't want to have to make a meal out of this good man. Maybe she should just bring him deeper into her world. He was smart, tenacious, resourceful, and would make a better ally than an enemy. And he was certainly taken with her, 
and she knew that getting him to, well, neck with her would be easy enough. Anyway, he already worked nights, didn't he? Grim Repo by Aletha Contis Read by Karen Allers Grim Repo by Aletha Contis Read by Karen Allers I hadn't expected to die today. Once I realized what was happening, though, I wasn't pissed. It was almost kind of amusing. I mean, I was going to visit Logan anyway, just like I had every year on his birthday since the day he died. It was raining cats and dogs, so I left the RV at the campsite and summoned a car service to take me to the cemetery. I vamped it up properly, little black dress and heels to match, pearls and curls despite the downpour, only the best for my beloved. My driver was an enthusiastic freckled kid. I probably didn't need to tip him a twenty to stop for flowers on the way, but I was feeling generous. Ten blood-red roses and two yellow daisies, because Logan and I had never been traditional. LaDonna gave me a discount on the roses and threw the daisies in for free. I let her. She knew what they were for. She didn't say anything, just squeezed my hand when she handed the change back to me. I don't remember the crash. There was no screeching of tires. There was no replay of my annoyingly short life. There was a light, a pop, and more light. I woke up at the foot of a giant black alligator, roses still in hand. The alligator stood like a man, casually smoking a cigar, while leaning back against the trunk of the largest tree I had ever seen in my life. He wore a three-piece suit, well tailored, and he filled it out like a boxer, or the guy who taught boxers. Shadows of translucent leaves shifted on the ground like a pale green kaleidoscope. But there was no wind. No sun. Just the tree and the alligator and me. I took a deep breath, surprised I could still breathe. My head was pounding. I wondered if the flask tucked into my garter had made it to this strange place. I kind of hope it had. Take your time, said the alligator. The deep bass of his voice vibrated in my bones. I took his advice. Eventually I got to my feet and collected myself. Straightened my dress. Hidden flask? Check. Smoothed my hair in pearls. Loosened my grip on the roses so that the thorns were no longer burying themselves into my palms. Tidying was always a fabulous excuse for a woman to take in her surroundings. Over the years, I'd become quite the quick study. The alligator and I were of a height, and petite had never been a word used to describe me. The bony ridges above his eyes looked like rock, the skin along his narrow snout was mottled black and lighter gray. Hard black scales started around his neck and disappeared beneath his collar. He stared at me with one large brown eye, split down the middle by an elongated pupil. I'm dead, right? Dead like Logan and his sister had been, in the crash that had erased Logan from my life five years ago. Oh, irony. The alligator tapped his cigar. The ash disappeared into the green-sprinkled ground at his enormous feet. He wasn't wearing shoes, which made sense. Those ebony claw nails would have made footwear problematic for anyone. Clever. But they did say you were a P.I. Despite his wide mouth and what looked like thousands of sharp, jagged teeth, his diction was remarkably clear. Not having to convince you is going to speed things up nicely. They? I asked. Granted, I probably should have been more focused on the word were. He waved my question away with a lethal hand. Figure of speech. Maybe it was the headache or the heels or the thorn holes in my palms. If I was dead, why was I still feeling pain? But this alligator was aggravating the hell out of me. So what happens now? Better yet, cut to the chase. When do I get to see my husband? I had the rest of eternity to be sad about my demise. Logan was waiting for me on the other side of that trunk or some magic veil or whatever, and I didn't want to waste another minute. The alligator crossed his arms. See, here's the thing. Oh, shit. I wasn't going to see Logan. If my head hadn't already been in so much pain, 
I would have felt like I'd been punched in the gut. I'd interviewed enough people in my life to know, see, here's the thing, meant that whatever information you were after, you weren't going to get it. My mind instantly jumped to every conclusion. Had Logan gone to heaven and now I was being sent to hell? Or in the much more unlikely scenario, vice versa? Logan's not here. I looked around. Clearly the alligator wasn't referring to this very spot. And by here you mean... With the dead, where he's supposed to be. Okay, then where is he? The alligator chopped down on his cigar. Smoke trickled through his oversized nostrils. This part requires some explanation. Have a seat. But there's no... Only there was. I sat down in a brown leather chair. It had gold studs, just like the one in our office, when we'd had an office, and proper clients, and lives. The alligator did not sit. How could he with that massive tail? And chose instead to pace slowly back and forth. I suspected it was as much from apprehension as it was from lack of binocular vision. I folded my hands over the roses in my lap, forcing myself to be patient and hear him out. It wasn't like I had anywhere to go. I'm Zip Pakna, he said. Can I call you Zip? Not to my face. I quickly switched gears. Sophie Chandler, I said. Pleased to meet you, I think. Can't say I was expecting an alligator god to show up in my afterlife. Cayman, he corrected. Not alligator. Sorry, what's your pantheon? Egyptian? He snorted great plumes of smoke at that. No, that's Sobek, a cousin of sorts. Don't get me started on that asshole. I'm Mayan, a guardian of the world tree. For the first time since my death, I felt a twinge of excitement. The tree of life was definitely not a thing I'd planned to see today, or ever. Stay casual, Sophie. So what? You weren't really doing anything today, and... I got shuffled off to you because I'm not super religious, and the contemporary gods had their hands full? I always imagined the line to the pearly gates would rival every attraction at Disney World. Something like that, he said, and yet not. Now I want to hire you. I was suddenly glad I was sitting down. You're joking. If only. This was nuts. Maybe I wasn't actually dead. I was just in a coma, having an insane, chemically-induced dream. Or maybe I was dead, and this ancient Mayan god really did need my help. Hiring implied work, and ultimately compensation for that work. If payment for this job was the ability to be with Logan again, I'd sign up, no questions asked. What did I have to lose? I allowed my body to soften, relax the muscles in my jaw pushed a strand of hair behind one ear. I adopted the posture that got me the most results from clients, that of a sympathetic woman who has seen her share of tragedy. In the gentlest voice I could muster, I said, Tell me what happened. The corner of Zipacta's lip curved up in what might have been a smile. It was slightly terrifying. Remember back in 2012 when the world didn't end? I do. December 21st, 2012, the day Logan died. The rest of the world might not have ended that day, but mine certainly had. Another car accident, ironically. The police said Logan hadn't suffered. In the months that followed, I suffered enough for both of us. Well, on the divine plane, it was a different story. There was a major shift. Everything was out of whack. Wires got crossed. Souls suddenly started showing up where they weren't supposed to, at the gates of gods they had never heard of or believed in. Like an ethereal Y2K? Zipakna nodded. From Valhalla to the Vanishing Isles. Wow! That sort of thing would have had ramifications on a scale so colossal I couldn't begin to imagine them. Is that still going on? Is that why I ended up here? It was easy enough to sort out the heavens and the underworlds. Lost souls were quickly discovered and forwarded to the correct addresses. The problem came with the reincarnationists. 
Oh, crap. In my head, the scene played itself out in a dramatic television montage. A seriously damaged soul, doomed to an eternity of hellfire, suddenly got a free pass at another life. Or a lot of somebody's. Who knew what kinds of serial killer menace had been let loose on an unsuspecting populace? But it had been years since 2012. The gods hadn't found some sort of solution already? A better solution? Things were so bad that they had to come to me? A widow who was only half of a decent investigative team? Logan was the one Zip really needed. My talent was contracts. If there was a loophole somewhere, I found it. Or invented one. Logan was the bloodhound. He could find anything or anyone. And then it sunk in. Logan got reincarnated. Worse, Logan got reincarnated and didn't come back to me. At first, we all decided to let the glitch play itself out. Most of the souls that went back were harmless enough. Like Logan, I didn't say. Obviously, those are the ones we need found. Obviously. I tried to focus on what Zapakno was saying, and not the fact that he was speaking at all. Half of my brain still couldn't comprehend that any of this was happening, but the other half seemed eerily okay with it. All of me was disturbed by both of these things. The souls we're hunting aren't just unsavory characters, though we need to find those as well. And they've learned to be subtler about their chaos the second time around. What we really want to nab are the foul beasties that have no business whatsoever on the mortal plane. I hoped foul beasties was some sort of euphemism. I was also madly comforted by his casual use of we. Somewhere there might be an army of soul agents clad in leather jumpsuits with utility belts and trendy code names, a ragtag bunch of well-funded genius misfits. Something, anything more than Zip, the tree, and me. I hadn't done any decently involved detective work since Logan, it was all nanny cams and background checks on internet dates and the occasional light stalking of asshole made divorcees. I'd loathed getting involved in the last one, but divorce cases ended up being the most fun. I didn't have to seduce anyone, a good thing, too, since my temptation muscle had gone a little rusty. I didn't even have to shed a tear. I just showed up at the bank, realtor, car mechanic, and played the sap. Once they heard my sob story, People fell all over themselves to give me information. Turns out folks enjoy pulling for a wronged woman, especially if she's fairly young and reasonably pretty. Everyone has been treated like dirt by someone at some point in their lives, and they will jump at the chance to be superheroes for the underdog. Now I was being asked to become a superhero for real. I needed to think like a superhero. Just because the circumstances were strange didn't mean there wasn't still a contract involved. Verbal, written, divine, or mundane, this was contract work, plain and simple. According to Faust, even the devil used contracts. This was my wheelhouse, and I was determined to receive the best of whatever a god could offer. So how do I repossess these lost souls? Proton pack, laser beam eyes, magic handcuffs? That's the beauty of it, said Zapakna. You just need to find them and tag them. I'll take care of the rest. Easy peasy. I would have bet a fat stack of cash that Zip had never eaten a pea in his life. Tag how? You just have to touch them. So far, this all seemed way too easy. I was determined to find the catch. Then let's go back to the hunting part. I can find people... People inside people, people that know they're being hunted and don't want to be found, I wouldn't even know where to start. It's a tricky business, but I can help with that as well. Zapakna turned to look at me with his other eye. I can give you a general area in which to start your search. And I'll get this information in a letter, voicemail, carrier pigeon, dream quest? I gesticulated madly around myself. Come back here? Let me worry about that part. But how will I know it's you who sent the message? If Cayman's had eyebrows, Zip would have raised his. At that moment, 
a leaf from the tree fell onto his enormous snout. The act of snorting it away took the edge off his baleful stare. Trust me, you'll know. This doesn't exactly bolster my spirits. Zip took a long drag off his cigar. You are a frustrating woman. I gave him my thousand-watt smile. It's part of my charm. Fine. I'll also heighten your sensitivity. That sounded promising. In what way? You'll be able to tell when you're getting closer to a lost soul. It'll be like a vibration, a tingling of sorts, something jarring that sets your teeth on edge. Sounds delightful. It did not. It needs to be uncomfortable enough that you don't write it off as a warm fuzzy, he said. It's a warning, not a hug. I want it to capture your attention. It'll stop as soon as you've tagged the mark. I want you to want it to stop. Fair point. As superpowers went, having my own spidey sense didn't sound too terrible. Flying would have been a bit too obvious, and mind reading never worked out the way you wanted it to. People were horrible. I didn't want to be bombarded with the thoughts of strangers. What else? That's it. You hunt them down and tag them. I bag them. But what do I get out of this? The surprise on Zipakna's Cayman features brought me a great deal of satisfaction. His eyes got larger, and I detected a bit of a snarl. Good. He needed to know I wasn't just some dame he could mess with and send on her merry way. You get your life back, he said. Most people would give a lot for that. I shrugged. My life wasn't particularly worth living. Got to be honest, I was kind of thrilled to be done with it and start my afterlife with Logan. I leaned closer to him, as if I was concerned the tree might overhear. But you already knew that. What do you want? he snarled. I'm going to need to travel a lot for you, and the RV isn't cheap. Mortals and their money. Fine, I'll give you a bottomless expense account. Just remember, you can't take it with you. I'll keep that in mind. Also, I want a time limit on this. A what? It was clear that he'd never been presented with this stipulation before, or any stipulation. Chalk another one up for me. For a second, I felt bad for all those other suckers trapped into being on Team Zip for eternity. Okay, maybe half a second. I'll do this for six months, a year tops, at which point we meet again and revisit whether or not I want to renew my contract. Zip grumbled. I could have sworn the ground shook. But I'd been bullied by big men before. It only made me pushier. Call it a performance review, and I want an out clause. When I find Logan, I want the option to stop doing whatever it is you've asked me to do. Zip narrowed those huge brown eyes. You realize stopping means death. I shrugged again. Could be. I decide to stay on with you. Could be we do both. Logan would be a real asset. Either way, I want that discussion to happen. He could have said no. He could have sent me to whatever cloudy abyss of beyond he chose and interviewed the next applicant on his list. He could have damned me to the hottest corner of hell. I would have had no say in the matter. He could have, but he didn't, which told me a lot more than it should have about just how desperate he was. Agreed, he said, the pleasantness gone from his voice. That had been part of the risk, but I was glad I'd taken it. But I also want the right to call you back for a review, should I feel that your performance is less than optimal. Agreed, I said, and then screamed in pain. It was as if all the thorns I'd brought with me had buried themselves inside my left wrist without warning, while also on fire. When I caught my breath and the world stopped spinning, I discovered a fresh cluster of freckles imprinted in the soft skin there. Except for the fact that I knew nothing had been there before, the freckles looked completely natural. They reminded me of the freckled kid that had driven me to my death. I wondered if he'd made it. Sorry, Zip said without apology. Should have warned you that that would hurt. This marks you as my agent, in the event that you're an afoul of any other deity. That's a possibility? 
I didn't want to run afoul of anyone, let alone some rival face-eating god. You never know, he said. But seriously, best of luck, kid. The tone of the sentiment said I'd just been handed my walking papers. Good. I'd rather quit while I was ahead. See you in six months, I said. Not if I see you first, he replied. And then the world disappeared. Again. I woke up face down on the floor of my house, a.k.a. the RV that Logan had given me when he died. Having the freedom to travel where the wind took us was a pipe dream we laughed about every time we had one too many. The sneak had written its purchase and payments into a life insurance policy without telling me. I was able to break the lease on our office space, sell the house in Florida, and walk right out of our old life and into a new one. I loved him for it, just as much as I hated him for leaving me. Almost as much as I hated him for not coming back to me as soon as he'd been reincarnated. Yeah, I no longer had a permanent address, but Logan could have easily found me. He was a bloodhound. He could find anyone. I lifted myself up. Same dress, same heels, same fat curls in my hair pulverized confetti of what used to be roses all around me. I maneuvered myself into a sitting position and leaned back against the dishwasher. I felt like I'd been run over by a Mack truck. Sliding the flask out of my garter, I took a hit. Taking a round trip to the Tree of Life must have turned it into holy scotch or something, because it went straight to my head. Within about ten seconds, the inside of the RV swam. Every hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and my head buzzed like it was full of bees. I gagged reflexively, but nothing came up. If this was a sample of my newly gifted spidey sense, well, it would serve me right, I guess. I'd find a way to manage. I'd pay the most attention to the skin response. The head buzz wasn't too different from random tinnitus, and I could carry peppermints for the nausea. But the hallucinations? A fat, green, rough-scaled lizard with a line of sharp spikes down its back waddled across the floor of the still-spinning RV. What's up, Doc? I asked. This lizard either couldn't speak or didn't. He opened a mouth far wider than I'd supposed him to have and belched out a slimy green scroll. My instructions, I supposed. Fantastic and gross. I picked up the scroll it wasn't paper, it was a leaf. Rolling it open, I saw several swirling figures and symbols imprinted along mid-rib. Hieroglyphs? Seriously? Come on, Zip, work with me here. The room swam again, and I gagged again, and when I looked back at the leaf, the hieroglyphs had been replaced by two boldly printed, very American words, Huntsville, Texas. I screwed open the flask again and poured a bit of scotch onto the ground in front of the lizard. Message received. Thanks, dude. De nada, croaked the lizard. He slid his long tongue into the small puddle of alcohol and then waddled back across the floor, disappearing before he got to the door. I stared at the words on the leaf in my hand. I guess I was going to Huntsville, Texas. But not before I spent at least one day here looking for Logan. Surely Zip wouldn't begrudge me twenty-four hours before I started this new, life-changing, death-changing gig. If Logan's spirit truly had been reincarnated, there was no better place to start looking for him than here, the town where he'd grown up, the town where he'd been buried. I tried to imagine what it must have felt like waking up into a body, a life that wasn't your own. There were so many possibilities— he might have woken up in jail or in China or in the suburbs with a wife and three kids. Logan might have assimilated into his new body so well that he'd forgotten himself and me right along with him. But he might just have easily freaked out and come back here, his hometown, where his body was buried, where things felt familiar on the outside, if not the inside. I shimmied out of my vampy widow's garb and hopped into the shower to wash off the imagined residue of magic. I was alive, 
I was on the hunt. I wanted answers, which meant talking to people. I needed to look wide-eyed and fresh-faced, approachable in every way that vampy widow was not. Very little makeup, lip gloss, sundress, sandals, no umbrella. If it decided to pour again today, I'd use the rain to my advantage. I drove the RV to Logan's old neighborhood and parked the beast in the driveway of a house on the market. I took my time walking down the sidewalk, breathed deeply and slowly, tried to feel anything. The trees were taller and fuller than I remembered. The magnolias were in bloom. Pink and white flower petals lined the gutters. A gaggle of children shouted and laughed as their bicycles came around the corner. A golden-haired Adonis in running gear paused at the crosswalk and executed a series of stretches. I paused similarly to appreciate him. I did feel something then, a fluttering in my chest, but I knew this one. This was the feeling of me asking myself once again why I hadn't moved on in the years after Logan's passing, why I couldn't move on. Maybe somehow, subconsciously, I knew that Logan's soul still walked this earth. Yeah, that last one sounded like bullshit to me, too. I traversed the neighborhood, but that nauseous buzzing I'd experienced with Zip's delivery lizard never returned. It was possible that my prey hid in one of the picturesque houses, but I hadn't budgeted the time to go knocking on every door. It also seemed to be an off day for busybodies, as no one approached me to chat about the weather or my business in the area. Perhaps I'd blended in too well, or perhaps there was just nothing here to see. Next stop, our old office. I parked the RV in a public lot down the street and looked up at the squat square building. My worst day at the office involved three walk-ins, several reams of paperwork, and a dodgy internet connection, and a lost case file. I'd give anything to have that day back. I sat on a bench outside the front doors and pretended to look at my phone. It was late. The early evening sun was overly warm, but it was still cool in the long shadows. Most folks would be calling it a day soon, leaving their desks and walking right past me. My plan was to get a sense of every one of them who walked by. That plan was thwarted by Dolly. Sophie Chandler, girl! Dolly plopped down beside me on the bench and pulled me into a bone-crushing hug. Her naturally curly hair fanned out around her face like a halo. Her perfume smelled like honeysuckle on a corpse blossom. She was bedecked in a rich purple, red, and orange outfit that was an affront to the rainbow, and her face was such a sight for sore eyes that I almost burst into tears. I have half a mind to slap you, silly, she scolded. You come back and visit his grave every year, but you never come see me in this hellhole. I'm sorry, I said, because I was. And my number hasn't changed, she said without subtlety. I know, I'm an ass, I said, because I was that, too. Dolly was the most amazing assistant we ever had. She'd been one of those walk-ins on that worst day, looking for dirt on the guy who'd just fired her without cause. She took one look around the office, put her hands on her hips, and said plainly, You need help, and I need a job. I never had to worry about paperwork again after that. We eventually nailed that slime ball who fired her to the wall, too, though his real punishment was not realizing what he'd had in Dolly in the first place. Logan and I always said we didn't know how we lived without her. But then Logan died, and I ran away with my grief. We'd both left Dolly without a second thought. Now we were the asshole ex-employers. To be honest, I wasn't sure you'd ever want to see me again. Dolly waved away my nonsense. You were in pain. That was obvious enough to anybody. I'm just sorry I wasn't able to help you. I'm sorry I wasn't able to let you, I said. But what about you? Are you doing okay? You look great. I landed on my feet well enough, walked across the hall and forced my services on that bail bondsman who was always sniffing around. The work's not half as interesting and the company's not half as intelligent, but I have job security. How's that? 
He doesn't fire me, and I don't tell his wife about his extracurricular activities. Good girl, I patted her hand. Proud of you. She took my rough, pale hand into her smooth, dusky one. You're not back for good, are you? Just for today, I hated to tell her. I've got a job waiting for me in Texas. Freelance. She brightened. Need any help? Zip hadn't said anything about an assistant. Having Dolly on my repo team would be a huge asset. I'll look into it. Dolly eyed me skeptically. I promise, I said. She nodded, but I could tell she didn't believe me, which was okay. Considering all the things that had happened today already, I didn't believe me either. You know, I kept all the old office files. They're out in my shed just in case. Thanks. I didn't know when I'd ever need them, but leave it to Dolly to have taken care of things. You visit his grave yet? No, I said. How do you know I go every year? Dolly gave me that look that conveyed exactly how stupid she thought I was acting. Because every year when I go, there are roses and daisies. This time, it was me who hugged her. You want company? Might be nice for us to visit him together this time around. That would be nice, I said. I still have a few errands to run downtown, but my RV's parked on the block. Meet me there at, what, seven? Sure, give me time to get home and change out of these god-awful shoes. She pointed a perfectly manicured finger at me. Don't you go running off on me again. I wouldn't dare. I waited until Dolly sauntered off before making my next move. I'd been distracted, but most of that office building had walked by during our conversation, and I'd felt nothing beyond sorry that I'd been such a jerk to Dolly. I stood up, moved to the edge of the road, and looked both ways down the street. Where to now? Well, if Dolly was coming over tonight, I was going to need more energy. That meant coffee. I passed by two major coffee chains before I realized where my feet were taking me, hot and fresh. The coffee wasn't the best in the world, but it was cheap, local, and Logan had always had a soft spot for their donuts, which they made around the clock. Growing up, Logan and his little sister had arranged their days around fresh donut time. Like now, I could smell the sugar and grease long before I even approached the storefront. The shop seemed to be doing a bustling post-five o'clock business, but I couldn't bring myself to go inside. I just stood there, staring at the neon sign, smelling the memories. And missing my husband so much, my chest ached. There was that damned flutter again. Maybe I was having a heart attack. No, it was more than that. I turned my head slowly to the right. In the waning light, below the street lamp, stood the golden-haired Adonis. He must have realized I was staring. I don't know what it is, he said. I haven't had a donut in over a decade. But that smell, it's just intoxicating. You must be part bloodhound, I said carefully. This time he did turn to look at me, as I knew he would. Like me, he was tall and Nordic, where Logan had taken after his dark and swarthy Italian grandmother. I searched those empty gray eyes looking for something, anything familiar. Logan? There it was, confusion, then recognition, or something like it. The buzzing in my ears turned on like someone had hit a switch. Sophie? he said, and then, oh my God, Sophie! He opened his arms wide, and it killed me not to run straight into them. I held up my hand and stepped back. Don't touch me. Why not? It's kind of a long story, one we probably shouldn't talk about here. I looked around at all the normal people living their normal lives and drinking their normal coffee, none the wiser and better for it. Are you really, Logan? Yes and no. He glanced at the crowd on the street, the same way I had. I guess that's kind of a long story, too. Where should we go? My place, I said. I'm parked around the corner. You live in your car? I live in the RV, I said. 
Thank you, by the way. I didn't think either one of us had any sort of life insurance. Right, he said, as if he'd forgotten. Surprise. It certainly was. So have you been to a lot of places? he asked as we strolled together in the twilight, just like any other young, reincarnated couple might have. You always did want to travel the world. A few. I wanted to take his hand so badly that I clasped my own behind my back to avoid temptation. But I always came back here, to you. We walked to the next block in silence before he said, You want to know why I never sought you out? Yep. Would you have believed it, that I was your husband shoved into this body? Shoved? Is that how it happened? I woke up in a hospital. They said I flatlined on the table. Heart attack or something, which didn't match anything in my brain. I remembered Lisa being drunk off her ass and me driving her home in the rain. But suddenly there were all these strangers hanging around the hospital room. It wasn't until I got to a mirror in the bathroom that I realized I wasn't me. The only thing I wanted to do was run to you so we could find out what happened. But would you have believed me, really? I'd been wondering that same thing since Zip had laid out the whole revelation. I shared the only answer I'd been able to come up with. I'd like to think I would have. I feel sure that you, of all people, would have been able to convince me. Honestly, I don't know. I guess we'll never know. The buzzing in my head and the pressure in my chest grew stronger as we approached the RV. I wasn't sure if the holy scotch would dampen the effect or make it worse, so I opted for a glass of water and a couple of antacids instead. Sorry about the mess, I said as he stepped through the door after me. It's been a hell of a day. Died, met God, came back, met a talking lizard, went looking for my dead husband, found him. He was so tall that his head almost scraped the ceiling, so he sat in the makeshift kitchen table booth. Mind if I eat this apple? Well, I'm always starving after a run. Be my guest. I pulled a paring knife out of the drawer to hand to him. Logan hated biting into apples. This guy apparently didn't mind at all. I set the knife on the table and sat down across from him watched the muscles in his arms flex as he raised the apple to his mouth, watched him chew and swallow. The man suit that my husband was wearing was certainly handsome enough, but I couldn't tell if I was attracted to him. The buzzing was loud enough now to set my teeth on edge. The powerful heartburn made every swallow taste like bile. I opened the bottle of antacid and chewed up two more. So what happened with you? he asked after a few bites. I gave him the nutshell answer. I got hired by a guy to repossess lost souls. Even talking hurt. All I had to do was touch him, and the noise would stop. We would both go back to Zip, and then happily off to rest in peace together. Maybe. I still didn't trust that Cayman as far as I could throw him. I wanted to have all the negotiating power when we met up again. I also needed to find out what Logan wanted. Who knows? Maybe he liked the life of this star athlete. He gave you magic handcuffs or something, he said around a mouthful of apple. Logan always could make me laugh. I asked about that. He gave me a splitting headache instead. He reached out to console me. I leapt to my feet and moved to the opposite side of the kitchen. I can't touch you, I explained. That's how I repossess the souls. I just have to touch you, but I... My breath caught on a sob. I'm not ready for you to go yet. He stood up, unwisely crossing the kitchen toward me. It's okay, I'm not ready to go either. And then he tore a hole in my gut with the paring knife. I should have reached for him then, but I instinctively clasped my stomach in an effort to keep my insides from spilling out. I gasped for air, my head filled with bees, my chest and belly now both filled with fire. He'd managed to do the deed without touching me at all. Sorry, sis, said the Adonis. This is so much more complicated than you realize. And that's when I knew. The soul in that body wasn't Logan. Instead, it was someone with the skill to fool me into thinking it was Logan. Lisa? 
Just speaking the word hurt my everything. My sister-in-law dropped the bloody knife back on the table as she backed away. You don't know what you're getting yourself into, Soph, she said through the mouth of the Adonis. If you did, you would thank me right now. Promise me you'll go to the light. Choose death. It's the safest way out of this. But, Logan, I managed. Your sweetheart is wanted by several pantheons, said Lisa. You know my idiot brother. Never one to leave well enough alone when there's hell to be raised. I did know him, and as pissed as I was with Lisa at that moment, the thought of Logan stirring up trouble with the gods of multiple religions made me smile as I died for the second time that day. I was still smiling when I woke up, staring at a giant ebony-clawed foot. I'm going to go ahead and say you failed your first performance review, Zip growled around his cigar. Dead twice in one day. That's got to be some kind of record. You didn't give me all the facts. As I pulled myself up to a sitting position, my gut spilled onto the leaf-colored ground. It didn't hurt, so I didn't bother scooping them back in. Zip bent over and growled in my face this time. His breath smelled like smoke and anchovies. I gave you all the facts you needed to do your job. The job that you didn't happen to do. I took a moment to think about my current situation. I stared at my insides now on the outside. Gross. Does this mean I'm fired? Zip unbent to his full height, crossed his arms over his broad chest, and stared at me with one baleful eye. Do you want to be fired? I want to go back, I said. I needed answers from Lisa. I needed to talk to Dolly before she walked in on my bloody carcass. I want to do the job you sent me to do. There was a threatening rumble in the back of Zip's throat, but I wasn't afraid. I only had slightly more to lose than the last time I'd been in this position. This time... You play by my rules. I had expected as much. Fine. That means no superpowers. No buzzing and heartburn? Good. They weren't all they were cracked up to be anyway. Okay. And you'll have a handler. He'll manage your expense account and you. You'll be required to check in with him every day. I grimaced at Zip's words, but so far this offer didn't sound too terrible. Not that I would ever let him know that. Oh, goody, my very own parole officer. And the second you even think about going after your ex, you'll fall down deader than a doornail and be sent to whatever horrible oblivion I choose. Worse than the eternity of untold nothingness was the notion that Logan would be considered my ex. Till death do us part, they had said, and here was death, and here we were, parted. But that's not how it felt in my heart. I hope to God that's not how it felt to Logan. And then I wondered which God it was I thought I was hoping to. Sure, I said, you're the boss, and you can't have that body back, he went on, adding insult to injury. You've ruined it, but don't worry, I'll sort you out another one. I don't suppose I have any say in that either. Consider yourself lucky that you still have a tongue to say anything at all, Zip snarled. You don't need to speak to capture a soul. As it would make finding said souls a lot more difficult, I chose to hold my offending tongue. Smart girl. So these terms are acceptable to you? I nodded. Good. Try not to screw it up this time. With the last word, Zip blew his cigar smoke right into my face. I didn't wake up on the floor of my RV this time. No roses, no black dress, no holy scotch. New body, new place, I told myself as I tried to get my bearings. Nighttime. Chilly. But it was the smell that hit me hardest. Sour and spicy. Garbage. Garbage and tacos. I was propped up against a dumpster behind some fast food joint. I was burning up. Must have had fourteen layers of clothes on, and my throat ached as if I'd been screaming all night. I took a personal inventory. Human, female, slightly overweight, stringy hair, 
tan, brown, or dirty skin of unknown origin. Ratty clothes on top of ratty clothes. Oh, for Christ's sake, I was a bag lady. A recently dead bag lady. No address. No RV. I'd be lucky if I had a shopping cart. A young man in slacks and a polo shirt stepped into the light and tossed a large bag of garbage into the dumpster. I groaned. Sal, is that you? The kid's hat read Ken's Taco Hut. The freckles along his cheekbone reminded me of my unlucky driver from yesterday. Hard to believe that was just yesterday. You okay, Sal? Here, let me help you up. The arm he offered had another cluster of freckles, tattooed on the inside of his wrist. Just like mine. Instead of taking his hand, I pulled my sleeve back. I'm not Sal, I told him. My voice sounded like four packs a day. Sal's dead. My name's Sophie. The kid cursed in what sounded like Spanish, but I understood the word zipacna loud and clear. It might be easier for you to stay Sal, he said. Come on in, I'll help you get cleaned up. Can I borrow your phone? He shook his head, but unlocked his cell phone and handed it to me anyway. Make it quick. I dialed the one number I'd never forgotten. Dolly, I said as she answered. It's Sophie. Sophie, girl, you sound like shit. What happened to you? I went to meet you at the parking lot, but the RV wasn't there. Tell me you didn't run out on me again. It's complicated, I said. I'm sorry, but I promise I'll explain everything. Let me get some stuff sorted out and I'll call you right back. Okay, boo, but you better call me. I will. I pressed the button to end the call and handed the phone back to the kid. I left Dolly's number in the call history on purpose as a gesture of good faith. Friend of yours? he asked. Maybe. That against the rules? My handler shrugged. As long as you get the job done, what do I care? I liked this kid already. I stood up to follow him into the taco hut. The back of his shirt read, Cross the border. I almost laughed. I had certainly crossed a few borders to get here. I took a deep, rattling breath. My stomach grumbled. I wondered if this gig came with free tacos or a shower. I needed to bathe. I needed to call Dolly back. I needed to get her on Lisa's trail before she got too far. That bitch had my RV. Headcase a Dan Shamble Zombie P.I. Adventure by Kevin J. Anderson At a glance, I could tell that the little conscience demon who came into our offices was the bad one. Scarlet body shaped like a miniature devil, horns on his forehead, pointed tail, even down to the diminutive pitchfork. Since he was only about as big as my hand, he looked kind of cute though I wouldn't have told him so, since that was sure to evoke a tantrum. Cheyenne, my ghost girlfriend and office manager, had cooed and called him, Oh, how darling! which only annoyed the little guy further, as he asked to engage the services of Shambo and Dyer Investigations. He was hyperactive, easily provoked, and right now the conscience demon was desperate, which was why he'd come to see us in the first place. If they can't find a body, there's no crime, right? They can't arrest me or charge me with murder. The little demon's arrow-pointed tail thrashed back and forth. He wobbled his pointed pitchfork as he pranced on the tabletop in the conference room. Be careful, I said. You're going to poke somebody's eye out with that thing. Across the table sat Robin Dyer, my lovely and talented business partner, the best lawyer to appear since the big uneasy returned all of the monsters to the world. Robin looked up from her yellow legal pad. The spell-attached pencil scribbled notes all by itself, as fast as she could think of things to record. But there's a crime if you've just confessed to it, Mr. Conscience Demon, he said. CD for short. I'm pretty good at digging up bodies, I said. I'm a zombie of many talents. The little demon swiveled around on the table. I'm not interested in you as a zombie, Mr. Shamble, but as a detective. It's Shambo, I said out of habit, though the imp wasn't interested. Most importantly, he continued, 
I'm here because I need a lawyer, a defense attorney. Can you save my bacon, Miss Dyer? He lowered his voice to a sultry, tempting tone. I really like bacon. You should eat more of it. Don't worry about your cholesterol or your arteries. It tastes so good. Then he shook his head, snapping his attention back to his own urgency. If there's no body, they can't pin it on me, right? No one will even investigate the crime, right? Why would they bother? No one will miss him. No one could stand him. Well, just because you can't stand somebody doesn't mean you can murder them, I pointed out. Robin added, Dan's right. There's a lot of legal precedent. The conscience demon grumbled. He was impossible to live with. Such a goody two-shoes, always getting in the way and thinking too much. So I took that ridiculous halo above his head and strangled him with it. Sometimes you have to do what feels right without thinking about it too much. <laughs> and boy, did that feel right. So, you killed your counterpart demon, I asked. The angelic one? Robin tapped a finger on her yellow legal pad while the pencil continued taking notes. Don't answer that, Mr. C.D., because it's best if we don't know the answer. But you're my lawyer, the little devil said. You have to defend me. You have to protect me. You're supposed to presume I'm innocent. Besides, don't we have confidentiality? If I can't be honest with my own defense attorney, who can I be honest with? He scratched his backside with one of the tines of his pitchfork. And I don't usually make it a practice to be honest. I'm not supposed to presume you're innocent, Robin explained. Once I accept you as a client, then I'm supposed to defend you to the best of my ability. And even once we do have lawyer-client confidentiality, attorneys generally don't ask outright if the client committed a crime. But the ends justify the means, C.D. said. That's another common misunderstanding of the law. Cheyenne's ethereal form drifted in, bringing refreshments, green tea for Robin, sour old coffee for me, and a minuscule cup of water for the imp. His cup was so small, I had to lick twice before I realized it was the rinsed-out cap from a tube of toothpaste. What defines good and evil? C.D. asked. That's my job, isn't it? Maybe I can be an expert witness in my own trial, right? I could tell Robin was getting exasperated. She was in her late twenties with smooth, coffee-colored skin and intense brown eyes. She'd been raised upper middle class, gotten her law degree, and decided to seek justice for the unnaturals, because the downtrodden ghosts, mummies, and golems in the unnatural quarter needed her help much more than any fat cat corporate executive did. While it's not a glamorous job, Robin found it satisfying. As far as I could tell, she never regretted her late hours or her sometimes frustrating clients. Before Robin could continue to explain the subtleties of the law, we heard a loud thump against the outer wall of the office. Cheyenne's luminous form brightened as she spun in the air. It's coming from out in the hallway. Maybe someone's knocking on our door, I said. If it turned out to be another new client, this was shaping up to be a good month. The thump came again. Definitely not the door, Robin said. Cheyenne flitted out of the conference room, and I followed her, proud of my smooth muscle movement. I'm a well-preserved zombie. I exercise regularly to keep the rigor mortis at bay. I make regular trips to the embalming parlor for a touch-up, and I take care of my physical appearance. Other than being a little gray-skinned and, of course, dead, I'm a good-looking guy. And a decent detective. We heard the muffled thud one more time, and Cheyenne flitted straight through the door without opening it, which is an advantage of being incorporeal. I opened the door just as I heard shouts coming from one of the other offices here on the building's second floor. You clumsy oaf! You're scaring away the customers! As a P.I., my mind is like a steel trap, and my powers of observation are instantaneous. I immediately noticed several things. First, the small, mustachioed, and florid-faced man who called himself the Angry Hatter stood in the doorway of his shop down the hall. His hair was curly and unkempt as if he tried on hats all day long. The angry hatter was the proprietor of a new boutique haberdashery, though despite his infuriated shouts, I couldn't see any customers that were in danger of being scared away. Second, I saw a large man wearing a black turtleneck and a dark sports jacket careening down the hall. He was disoriented, losing his balance, and repeatedly thumping into the wall. 
Third, I noticed the man had no head, which, under normal circumstances, should have been the primary thing to notice. But here in the unnatural quarter, there's really no such thing as normal. Cheyenne drifted down the hall, trying to intercept the headless guy. He didn't seem to know where he was going. But in his hand, he held a scrawled and nearly illegible note, waving the paper in front of him. I've lost my head. Have you seen it? Cheyenne drifted close. Here, sir, let me help you down the hall. I'll take you into our offices. Judging from the note, I assumed the poor decapitation victim was looking for us. I lurched forward to intercept him. Always trying to stay friendly with my neighbors in the building, I gave a reassuring wave to the floored-faced angry hatter. Uh, we'll take it from here. Sorry for the disturbance. The haberdasher had tried to drum up business with memorable radio ads that played too often. In his loud, exuberant voice, he railed, I'm not just a mad hatter, I'm angry, and that lets me give you the best prices. Judging from the lack of customers, the ad wasn't very effective. As a ghost, Cheyenne can't touch any living thing, so she couldn't help guide the headless guy. I took his arm and led him stumbling down the hall to our offices. Robin and the little conscience demon were both there, curious. I led the new client to Cheyenne's desk, trying to pump him for more information. He held up his piece of paper, giving us the basics of the case, but it wasn't enough for me to start investigating. You'll have to tell us a little more about yourself, sir, I said. Cheyenne yanked out the printer tray and removed a sheet of white paper, then placed a pen in the man's hand. First off, can you tell us your name? Write it out for us? Robin watched, curious and concerned. The devilish imp hopped on her shoulder to get a better view, but she quickly brushed him off. C.D. sat on the corner of Cheyenne's desk instead. He fumbled with a pen and scrawled across the paper. He misjudged the edge, so the latter part of his letters ran off onto the desk. Headless guy. Headless guy? I asked. That's your name? The big man shook his shoulders, and I realized that he was trying to nod, but without a head. That's a very appropriate name, Cheyenne said. Guy tried to write more, but his letters were ill-formed and crossed over his other words, then ran off the paper. He scribbled so fast we couldn't read any of it, but he seemed full of things to say. I have an idea, I said. Can you type? When Headless Guy's shoulder bobbed again, apparently another nod, I set him down in Cheyenne's office chair and placed his hands on her keyboard. He immediately began to type, frantic to explain himself. Good thing he didn't need to hunt and peck. If you're a man without a head, it's imperative you learn to be a touch typist. Unfortunately, only a mishmash of garbled letters appeared on the screen, until I realized that his fingers were offset. So I adjusted his hands, made sure his fingers were in home position, then Headless Guy began to type again. I've lost my head. It's gone. I've been looking everywhere. Can you help me find it? The little imp sprang from the corner of the desk and landed on Headless Guy's shoulder. How can you look for anything when you don't have a head? Guy shrugged, making C.D. bounce up and down. Sounding compassionate, Cheyenne said, At least he found his way here to us, and we can help him. I always appreciate resourceful clients, I said. He must have heard of my skills as a detective. When was the last time you saw your head? Headless Guy pondered, then began to type out in detail. It was just another lazy Sunday. We went for a walk so my head could smell the flowers around the drainage ditches. We went to the candy store because my head likes hard candies. He used to like drinking coffee, but that's a mess, unless I adjust him carefully over my neck. Then we went hat shopping because my head is very fond of hats. Then we went to hear a skeleton jazz band because my head likes music, even though I can't hear very well. And I don't like jazz anyway, but you have to be patient with your partner. We've been together so long. I frowned. You mean your head and your body? Ignoring my question, Guy kept typing. When I woke up, my head was gone. I'm sure it's been kidnapped. Someone's holding my head for ransom, but I haven't found a ransom note yet. With his big hands, he patted his jacket, fumbled in his pockets, then went back to typing, somehow finding the right position on the keyboard again. What am I going to do? I'm lost without my head. Can you help me, Mr. Shamble? 
Even typing, he spelled my name wrong, but I don't hold that against a potential client. Maybe somebody buried it, the conscience demon suggested, still perched on Headless Guy's shoulder. And you'll never find the body. It worked for me. You're not helping, CD, I pointed out. We have the body right here, Robin said, and we'll help you find your head. First, the formalities, I said, already formulating my plan. The cases don't solve themselves. We better go down to the police station and talk with Detective McGowan. We'll file a missing persons report, I reconsidered, or a missing piece of a person report. Headless Guy stood from the office chair, eager to follow me, but he crashed into the desk. Recovering himself, Guy moved in the other direction and lurched into the chair, nearly tripping. Exasperated, C.D. kept his balance on the dark-jacketed shoulder. This is ridiculous. Let me help you out, right? The devilish little creature broke into a wild, malicious grin. I won't steer you wrong. Officer Toby McGowan, or Magoo to his friends, is a wise-cracking, insensitive, but reasonably confident beat cop who was no more happy about his transfer to the unnatural quarter than his superiors were to hear his offensive and politically incorrect ethnic jokes, which had led to the transfer in the first place. Here among the monsters, Magoo could be as rude as he liked, since unnaturals had thick skins, sometimes scaly skins, sometimes covered in spines or fur. I led Headless Guy through the bustle of the UQPD. I made my way past the ringing phones, the officers typing on keyboards, other cops dragging a wide variety of handcuffed perps. Magoo's desk was in back, and I waved at some of the other cops. They were all familiar with the most prominent undead detective in the quarter. The imp on Headless Guy's shoulder directed him. Straight forward, two more steps, now a little to your left. Guy crashed his hip into the corner of the detective's desk, scattering the papers from an inbox. Sorry, I meant right, not left, C.D. said. Headless Guy stumbled along, bumped into another desk, and I realized that the imp was teasing him. That made me impatient. Come on, let's go. This is serious business. Yes, but it's fun too, right? said C.D. But he did cease his practical jokes, and we arrived at Magoo's desk. Hey, Shamble he said, looking at Guy. Let me guess. He's a jogger who doesn't remember to duck when he runs under low bridges. Or maybe it was a low-flying haircut? The conscience demon snickered. I like him for a cop. We're not here to talk about how Headless Guy lost his head in the first place, I said. We're more interested in the second time he lost his head, and it was recent. We think his head has been kidnapped and is being held for ransom. Magoo took out a set of forms. Sorry to hear that, Mr. Guy. His serious tone lasted only a moment before he turned to me. Sounds like you've got a real head case here, Shamble. Magoo has freckled skin, reddish hair, and a wide mouth with a persistent grin that made him always seem to get in trouble. In our work in the unnatural quarter, I often got Magoo into trouble, and he did the same for me. He's my BHF, my best human friend, and that's what friends are for. We've come to fill out a missing persons report, I said, and then I'll start investigating. Magoo scribbled some information on the form, looked at Headless Guy, then tore off the bottom third. It's just a partial missing persons form for just a partial missing person. The joke's already been made, Magoo, I said, and he seemed disappointed. Give me a description of your head, he said. We'll need to be able to identify it. The conscience demon on his shoulder peered down into the open mouth of the turtleneck, but didn't hear any answer. He's better off using your keyboard, Magoo, I said. Headless guy typed out descriptions. The height of the head, the color of hair, brown, wavy locks, well-combed, eye color, beautiful, hauntingly blue, distinguishing features. Chiseled nose, square jaw, handsome features, a perfect smile. Magoo snorted. <laughs> Sounds like he's describing me. I don't think he'd want your head as a replacement, Magoo. We'll put out an all-points bulletin to see if anyone spots a suspicious-looking head. Agitated, headless guy typed on the keyboard using all caps to show his exasperation. It's been kidnapped. We better go find the ransom note. 
I suggested. Once we've made contact with the headnappers, then your missing head will have a lot more to stand on. Magoo got right to work after his coffee break. After we finished, the conscience demon began whispering down into the turtleneck. It's not so bad, really. Think of your options now. You're free to do what you want for the first time in your life. Effectively, you're a bachelor. Live a little, right? Headless Guy did not seem overly enthusiastic, although I couldn't read his expression. He followed me, occasionally bumping into desks and people as we left the police station. C.D. worked harder at giving him better guidance. If Headless Guy's head had been kidnapped from his apartment, then that was the obvious first place to look for clues. The scene of the crime. It was in Chapter 1 of Every Detective's Handbook. Headless Guy followed me with C.D. on his shoulders, providing mostly helpful directions, making sure he didn't bump into too many obstacles on the way. Guy looked dapper in his black turtleneck and dark jacket, but he wasn't much of a conversationalist. In the companionable silence, I mulled over possibilities, using him as a silent sounding board, as we climbed the stairs to his third-floor apartment in a rent-controlled complex for unnaturals of modest means. If the head had been kidnapped, then why would anyone want it? Obviously, Guy was not a wealthy man, so he could never afford a large ransom. I had forgotten to ask him what he, or his head, did for a living, and maybe that was relevant. Was it for blackmail? Did the head possess any special, valuable, or dangerous knowledge? Had the head witnessed a terrible crime, perhaps? Something so awful he hadn't dared tell his body? Or maybe the head was an accountant, helping to launder money in illicit operations? If so, the head might have many important facts and figures in his memory. The head might be held hostage. Headless Guy wasn't saying. His empty turtleneck didn't speak a word. We reached the door at the end of a dimly lit hall. Loud, thrumming music came from the next-door neighbors. Shrieking banshee children howled as they played and wrestled, and even the muffled noise was loud enough to crack glass. "'We're here,' C.D. said, bouncing up and down on Headless Guy's shoulder. "'Get out your key. We'll find the ransom note in there.' "'We don't know what we'll find, but we should be prepared.' I reached into the pocket of my sport jacket, making sure I carried my thirty-eight for protection, though I preferred to use harsh language, unless a situation got really extreme. Guy fumbled in the left pocket of his trousers and pulled out a key ring, trying to find the right one by feel. But he couldn't accurately hit the keyhole, so he dropped the chain to the floor. He bent over and fumbled around, but I quickly snatched the keys and unlocked the door, which swung open with a creak on old hinges. I could sense a tension in the air, and I cautiously entered the dim apartment. No lights were on, but then I didn't suppose Headless Guy had much use for lamps. Maybe I should have brought Magoo along, or even Cheyenne, because a ghost could scout ahead by passing through walls. Hello? Anybody here? The feisty imp called, startling me. So much for our element of surprise, I said. Ah, but that was unpredictable, right? asked C.D. It's good to be unpredictable. I didn't argue the point. We heard no sound from within, and I entered, doing a quick assessment, especially trying to spot any signs of a struggle, overturned furniture, ransacked drawers, smashed lamps. But no, Headless Guy's apartment looked comfortable, just like any other place set up for a man with no head, and a head with discriminating taste in interior decorating. A sofa, a kitchenette table, a television set, a coffee table, an end table, bookshelves, and a small stand for propping up a book adjacent to a pedestal, where, presumably, the head would be propped when it wanted to read. And hats, a great many hats, arrayed on a separate set of shelves, hung on a hat stand near the corner, dangling from pegs on the wall. Dapper top hats, pork pies, bowlers, numerous baseball caps with sports team logos, even a colorful propeller beanie, apparently for when the head felt facetious. Your head really enjoyed stylish hats, I said. There must be one here for every day of the month. When Headless Guy didn't respond, the conscience demon leaned over and shouted down into the empty hole of the turtleneck. He said it looks like your head really likes hats. Seeming dejected, Guy let his shoulders slump. 
He walked through the apartment, easily navigating the hazards of furniture, not bumping into any table corners or chairs. He made his way over to the bed up against one wall and sagged down on the creaking mattress. He sat dejected and leaned forward, putting the empty space where his head would have been into his hands. C.D. shook his head, waving his little pitchfork. Man, this guy is miserable! Still looking for the ransom note, I circled the shelves, poked at the hats in their hat boxes or on their hooks, even picked up the propeller beanie and spun it in my fingers. I went into the kitchen, where several dishes had been washed and stacked in the sink. The small kitchenette table had one chair for Guy to sit, and a little stand for his head so the two could have dinner together. I found the note in the middle of the table lying in plain sight. Anyone with a head, or at least eyes, would have seen it right away. This is it. I grabbed the paper. The ransom note? asked C.D. Guy lurched to his feet and stumbled into the kitchen. I read the note, expecting to find threats and terms, dollar amounts, secret instructions. But it wasn't that at all. This letter was devastating in a completely different way. It's a Dear John letter. His name is Guy, not John, said the conscience demon. I cleared my throat because that seemed to be an appropriate thing to do, and read the words out loud, not sure whether Headless Guy could hear me. <clears throat> Guy, I'm sorry, but the time has come. I'm leaving you. I just can't keep sticking out my neck for you any more. I swallowed hard. Guy stood stiff as a tree, stunned but my client deserved to have all the answers. I continued. You're boring, sluggish, lethargic, and a terrible conversationalist. You never want to have fun. You don't stimulate my intellect. I swallowed hard and muttered apologetically. Sorry, that's what the words say. Guy's shoulders slumped even further, knocking the conscience demon off balance, but he jammed his tiny pitchfork into the fabric of the jacket and held on. I found someone else, someone who shares my passions. I'm going to the Angry Hatter, a man who appreciates me for what I am. Don't try to change my mind. This is the only way I can get ahead in life. Headless Guy collapsed onto the lone chair by the kitchen table. His body shuddered, racked with unexpressed sobs. It's not the answer you wanted, but at least your head is safe, I said. This isn't over yet. Let's go talk with him. Headless Guy couldn't move on with his life until at least he faced his faithless head. But I knew that domestic disputes and inflamed passions rarely turned out well. Solving a kidnapping might have been easier. Although I'm a crack private investigator and very good at what I do, sometimes I'm a clumsy oaf when it comes to delicate emotional matters. Both Cheyenne and Robin have told me that enough times, so I take them at their word, even though I've personally seen no evidence of tactlessness. Who was I to say? The bullet hole in the middle of my forehead is clear evidence that I don't always get along with people. Returning to our building with Headless Guy and the somewhat subdued conscience demon riding on his shoulder, I decided not to go straight to the angry hatter's haberdashery. I needed to bring out the big guns, the emotional and relationship experts. I wanted Robin and Cheyenne there as moral and emotional support, and to help me pull my foot out of my mouth if I happened to say the wrong thing. With a stern-looking Robin on my left and headless guy on my right, I marched down the hall from our offices. Cheyenne drifted ahead of us, her luminous form glowing with anger. She was indignant on Guy's behalf, although I knew that painful breakups usually had two sides to this story. We converged on the angry hatter's shop, with shades drawn and the doors closed. The haberdashery seemed to willfully disinvite customers. Cheyenne forgot herself and pounded on the door, but her ghostly hand simply slipped through without making a noise. Then she concentrated on her poltergeist abilities and knocked more successfully. Since it was during normal business hours, I didn't feel we had to knock. Let's surprise them. Better to keep them off balance. We all entered a hat shop that was filled with countless colorful hats, women's fashions, gaudy Easter bonnets, and spring flowers. Gentlemen's hats were lovingly arranged on another shelf. The air smelled of simmering potpourri. At a little table in the middle of the shop, the angry hatter sat holding a china cup with a teapot in front of him. 
Across the table, a disembodied head sat on an ornate brass stand. A china cup of tea was close enough to the mouth that the head could drink through a properly positioned straw. The head wore a gaudy, frilly, lavender spring hat adorned with ribbons and fake flowers, like something Queen Elizabeth II might have worn on one of her more hallucinogenic days. Startled by our abrupt entry, Guy's head spat out the straw and sputtered his tea. I saw a little dribble of hot liquid run out the bottom of his neck into a catch basin beneath the stand, thereby solving the inconvenience of a head-drinking tea without an attached body. The angry hatter lunged to his feet, his face florid, his long mustache sticking out like a sharp weapon on each side. He blurted out the standard line of all guilty persons caught in the act. What is the meaning of this? It's about time you found my note. The guy's head sneered. Headless guy lumbered forward, raised both hands in a beseeching gesture. We found it all right, I said. He hired Shambo and Dyer, and we always solve our cases. Well, I did leave the note right out on the table, said Guy's head. It couldn't have been too much of a challenge. The angry hatter stood fuming, bawling his fists. Though he was barely five feet tall, he could swing a roundhouse punch and strike headless guy directly in the crotch. Even though he was missing everything from his shoulders on up, I assumed Guy was fully equipped down there in his second male brain. You have no business here, said the hatter. How do you know we're not customers? I asked. I was thinking of buying a propeller beanie for myself. Robin said in a stern voice, You put our client through a great deal of emotional pain and suffering. Breakups happen, said Guy's head, not sounding at all apologetic. Cheyenne looked soulful as she opened wide her beautiful blue eyes. How could you hurt the poor guy like that? Why don't you two try going to counseling? "'Because I don't want counseling,' snapped Guy's head. "'I want a better partner.' The fuming haberdasher stomped around to the other side of the tea table and gently removed the ridiculous lavender hat so he could stroke the wavy hair on Guy's head. "'We're a perfect match, and don't you try to convince us otherwise. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry.' "'I don't like you right now,' I said. Headless Guy waved his hands, gesturing plaintively. He placed his palms together in a prayerful gesture, but Guy's head merely sniffed. On his shoulder, the conscience demon harumphed. <laughs> that head doesn't deserve you, Guy. You're better off without it. Think of how much fun we could have, just you and me, right? I got your back. The head struggled, somehow managed to swivel itself about an inch to the left so he could look directly at Robin. I demand a legal separation. Robin's expression was hard. In this particular case, it's called a legal decapitation. She gave an apologetic look to Headless Guy, who couldn't see her anyway. And I'm afraid one party can request it. Your head is within his rights. Still stroking the wavy hair, the angry hatter turned the head to one side, so he no longer needed to look at his forlorn former body. C.D. was having none of it. I promise I'll show you great fun. I won't steer you wrong. We'll have a good time, and you'll never once regret that cheating head, right? Just look at the angry hatter. He's one argument away from a blood pressure stroke, and then what's your head going to do? Come crawling back? No way. It's just you and me now. Headless guy squared his shoulders, drawing his resolve. Suddenly, on his opposite shoulder, a bright glow appeared in the air, and a white angelic figure formed, another conscience demon, this one sporting stubby little wings and a tiny gold halo that hovered above the blonde locks of its head. The angelic conscience demon gave a beautiful smile. We'll both guide you. We'll provide you with the balance and the happiness you need in your life. What the hell are you doing here? C.D. demanded, waving his tiny pitchfork. I strangled you. I got rid of you for good. Then why aren't you in jail? asked the angelic conscience demon in a voice of beatific calm. Because there wasn't a body, and nobody could pin the crime on me. Even though he blabs it to anyone within earshot, Robin said with a sigh. The angelic imp smiled. And there you are, my friend. You can't keep a good man down, and I am definitely completely good. I was just taking time to meditate, and now I've manifested myself again. 
You need me, and Headless Guy needs both of us. I looked at the two opposing conscience demons and said to Robin, I guess we don't need to defend C.D. against murder charges now. He didn't really kill his partner. I did. I know I did. C.D. stomped his little hooves on Headless Guy's shoulder, but Guy reached up to put a hand on each shoulder, gently tapping the two conscience demons as if to reassure them. I think we're done here. I said. Case closed. There's nothing more we can do. Domestic disputes never end with anyone satisfied. I turned to the angry hatter. I'll get my propeller beanie from a different store, although those fedoras do look nice. I'll do the separation paperwork, Robin said, resigned, though it's not the happy ending I would have hoped for. It's a happy ending for us, said Guy's head with a sniff. The angry hatter selected a pale yellow hat with a wide floppy brim and dangling ribbons. He placed it on the head. We'll have so much fun together. Guy lurched out of the haberdashery, gathering his pride as he walked away with the two conscience demons giving him directions. As we left the haberdashery and headed back to our offices, Cheyenne slipped her spectral hand into my undead one. Not everyone can have a relationship as perfect as ours, Bo. I thought of our times together, how she'd been poisoned to death after we first started dating and then came back as a ghost, and then I was shot in the head while investigating her murder, but we still had each other. Not everyone can be as perfect as us, Spooky, I agreed, and we went back to work on our more solvable cases. Lime by Josh Mallerman in 1956 Detroit, Be Here by the Danes was a regional hit, and the former war heroes' cum rock and roll band were the soundtrack for everybody, including William Duncan Eddy, 15, who was listening to that very song when he discovered the knives growing on a tree in his backyard. In truth, it was just beyond his backyard, in the lime grove, but Dad and Mom liked to pretend that they owned the grove, too, it being so, so close to home. William saw the knives glistening, reflecting a scorcher of a Detroit summer sun through the screen of his bedroom window. At first he thought they were animal eyes, squirrels or raccoons in the lime trees, stealing as they do. But a slight tilt of his head, on beat with the magnificent drums through the radio, and William understood it was no animal in the trees way back from Indiana Street, in the grove between two high-rise brick apartment complexes, grown by who knows who in a city with so many secrets. He was already sweating like hell. The sunshine came straight through that screen like gunfire, and Mom told him not to wear all black on days as such. But William Duncan Eddy felt all black, all the time. And when Mom told him that such and such clothes attract the heat more than others, he zoned out, thought instead about what a woman would look like if she was born with legs where her ears should be or two noses, the same way he zoned out when Dad told him he ought to exercise more. The Danes' hit song was just beginning as William plopped off the window sill and went to turn the radio up as loud as it would go. Mom and Dad were both working, and he had the house to himself, and the tune never got entirely lost as he exited his bedroom and took the stairs down to the back door, which he kicked open with a black sneaker. And the song certainly remained audible as he crossed the backyard, slouched, his fair blonde hair drenched in sweat as the great guitar line sang out his bedroom window. The things in the tree did more than glisten the closer he got to them. Now they positively glossed. And it was only the one tree, this William could already see, as he wiped his sweaty palms on the belly of his black T-shirt and intentionally kicked at a pile of cat shit in the grass. One tree, yes, one lime tree, glossing in all that grove, the grove wedged between the buildings, somehow capable of gulping down enough sunlight to grow, grow, grow every year, like a newborn baby, bloated, with many green eyes. Someone called out from one high window to another, but William paid no attention. They paid no attention to him. And by the time he reached the glossy tree, the Danes were so deep in to be here that it was like one could hear them knowing it was a hit. William stared at the long steel objects dangling from the tree in the places limes ought to be growing. He stared for a long time, 
And even before he called them what they were, even before he reached out and touched one, piercing the tip of his right pointer, he imagined what he might be able to do with them. Pluck one, pluck many. The tree seemed to say these words outright, a succulent voice riding a breeze under the blazing summer sun. Then William did reach out and touch the tip of one, to make certain he was seeing what he was seeing, and yes, when he brought his hand back, red blood popped up on that pointer finger like a little angry lime. Knives. The word came out quick, and with such certainty, that William Duncan Eddy didn't have the time to think about the hows or the whys. Knives. And the tree spoke to him again, a rich voice, not like Dad's whiny pleading or Mom's shrieking demands. No. This voice was like black leather, cool and dark, sliding up William's fifteen-year-old body like a boa in a jungle of lime. Savor the moment, the tree said. Savor the means. William looked to where the knives actually were connected to the tree and saw little roots there, a twisted tangle of smooth beige that morphed seamlessly into the bold black handles of many knives. William sucked the blood from his fingertip and wiped the considerable sweat from his blond brow. Then he picked a knife from the tree. And later, long after Mom and Dad had come home and fallen deep asleep, after the Danes' hit song was played another twelve times in the rotation, once per hour, William Duncan Eddy savored the moment, savored the means. Richard Smith moved fast when he saw what the bartender was about to do. It always slipped his mind, Richard's, whenever he ordered a bourbon and soda, every damn time, and the bartenders, from Wyoming Street to Canada, all went to do it. No fruit, he said, actually clamping his hand over the mouth of the drink. Hate fruit in my drinks. The bartender frowned. Okay, mister, no big deal. Richard knew he should let it go at that. Here he'd planned on ordering six or seven more from the pimply kid, but some things were hard to let go of. "'I say it was a big deal?' Richard asked. He removed his hat and placed it beside the elbow of his rolled-up shirt upon the bar. His thin brown hair was plastered across his skull with sweat. "'You covered it up like I was planning on dumping roaches in there.' Richard raised a finger, preparing to teach the kid a thing or two. Then he realized he didn't have the energy for a lecture. I don't like fruit in my drinks, he repeated. Turns them into vacations. Maybe you could use one, the kid said. Now Richard had no choice but to lecture. But just as he began, a man's voice, firm and from over Richard's shoulder, cut him off. I hope you're not planning on taking a vacation any time soon. Richard spun on his stool and wished he hadn't removed his hat. The summer sun coming through the dump's front glass had him feeling like an ant in a jar. You are Dick Dick, aren't you? The stranger stepped deeper into the bar, and Richard could see his features now, the pain in his eyes. They always had pain in their eyes. Nobody ever celebrated anything by contacting a private eye. Not to you I ain't, Richard said, spinning back to face the pimply schmuck. He didn't know which direction was worse. I'm sorry, the man said. He stepped to the bar, took the stool next to Richard's. But you are Richard Smith, are you not? Richard nodded, sipped his drink, fruitless and gorgeous after all. I'm sorry I used your other name. I suppose I imagined it would make me cooler. Richard squinted at the man, then fanned a dismissive hand. Forget it. Some of my colleagues like to make light of me, but that's only because I cast such a big shadow. The bartender snickered. Yes, the stranger said. That's why I tracked you down. I need your help. With what? You've read about the woman. He couldn't get the rest of the sentence out without tearing up. Richard slid him a napkin. Shredded, the stranger said the pain pouring now, always the pain in the eyes of those who tracked him down. Richard knew exactly the story the man was talking about, a blonde on Woodstock. The paper said the cops found her reassembled, arms where her legs ought to be, a toe for a nose, shredded indeed. 
It's the talk of the town, Richard said. He pulled a smoke from his shirt pocket and lit up. The stranger nodded. My wife, he said. Richard had anticipated as much. I'm sorry, he said. Then to the bartender. Hey, punk, get this man a drink. No fruit. The stranger wiped the tears from his eyes with the bar napkin, then sat up straight again. Can you find who did this? he asked. Aren't the cops looking? The cops can't determine the brand of the knife. Excuse me? The brand. They say, that's a front. The stranger's drink came. He drank it. A front for what? For everything, Richard said. They don't know anything. Then Richard saw new life in the stranger's eyes. It took center stage, pushing aside even some of the pain. Walsh, he thought. Patty Walsh, the name of the blonde in the papers. Reassembled. I'll pay you. People usually don't come to me until the case is long cold. I like it that way. Keeps me away from the cops. Please. Richard smoked. He drank. What am I supposed to do when I catch him, Mr. Walsh? The stranger, Walsh, sighed with what could only be read as relief. Richard had used the word when, after all. Phone me immediately. Richard shook his head no. I don't get mixed up in revenge, no matter how deserving. Walsh laughed, but it sounded more like tree bark torn from the trunk. What's so funny? Richard asked. Isn't that exactly what you do? Isn't that what you're hired for? Revenge? Richard smoked. He drank. I don't mean to sound unsympathetic, he said. But I have to ask, why come to me? Why don't you think the cops will find him? Mr. Walsh downed the rest of his drink and then ordered another. Because, he finally said, I am one. Check, please. Richard said to the bartender. Walsh shook his head no. Look, I've heard of you. The boys talk about you, often. Eh? Flattering poetics, I'm sure. No, Walsh said. They hate you. He removed his checkbook from his suit coat. That's why I'm here. Easy, Richard said. Keep the money dim, eh? Walsh looked over his shoulder to the almost empty bar. He smiled, but it didn't quite reach his eyes. You think I care if anybody sees me hiring a disreputable dick? He asked. My wife was found with knees for elbows. Walsh slammed a fist on the bar. How much? Richard eyed the checkbook. He thought of the article he'd read in the free press. He considered the seemingly unnecessary idea that the cops couldn't pinpoint the brand of knife. A new blade? He thought. But there was no such thing. A sawed-off automobile door could be a knife if sharpened right. Walsh was right. The cops were already stalling and probably would for years. He imagined a shriveled version of the stranger beside him, shrinking at work until he was fired, growing smaller by a telephone in his home, waiting for news, waiting, waiting. I'll do it, Richard said. But it's not going to be easy spotting somebody who'd do something like that. Why should it be any harder than any other crime? Richard drank. Because nuts stand out, but crazy fits right in. William Duncan Eddy stood staring at the tree, his head cocked to the side, unsure what to make of the fresh crop. He had justifiably expected to find knives growing from the branches, just as he had the week before, but instead discovered what at first looked like stumps but up close was clear as candy. Hammers. Buchanan and Goodman blasted out of his window across the yard, their novelty hit about a flying saucer oddly fitting. William related to the patchwork nature of it, as if someone was up in his bedroom changing the stations on the radio. But the offering, the hammers, had him thinking. A feeling he'd known only peripherally had wormed its way to his heart. Worry. He had trotted out the back screen door with the confidence of a money salesman, but found himself, now, looking over his shoulder. Like someone was pranking him. Like someone was pulling his chain. Like someone was watching him make a fool of himself out here under the sun. 
But the voice of the tree spoke, and with it came an unseen closed fist, mighty and centered, there to crack the concern. Pluck one. The tree spoke. Pluck many. William did as it said. Later, as he sat upon his window sill, staring out the window screen, watching the sun descend between the brick apartment buildings, eventually burying itself behind the lime grove, he imagined a face, forever smiling. He fingered the hammers in his lap. He had plucked two, and hardly said a word when Mom poked her head into his bedroom and asked how his day had gone. She was replaced later with Dad doing the same. In both cases, William had been thinking about the fact that knives had become hammers. At midnight, the Danes on the radio once again, William stuffed a hammer each into his respective pants pockets and waddled out of his bedroom, sure to be quiet on the stairs, before slinking out the front door with a mind to savor the means. Along with worry, he had been experiencing a second rare feeling as of late, something he'd known in pieces, surely, but never quite like this. And as he trotted down Indiana Street, the hammers bobbing in his pants like he'd crapped himself, William Duncan Eddy came up with the right word for this second fresh feeling. He was inspired. Savor the moment, he thought, and savor the means. He did both. It was easy to sneak under one crime scene when a second, equally grisly crime had been committed someplace else. Wait a week, Richard Smith always said. Wait for them to tear the yellow tape down and put it up somewhere else. Then that first scene was all yours. So when the papers told him that a teenage boy had been found on Elizabeth with his face hammered into a smile, Richard went straight to where Patty Walsh had been reassembled. Woodstock was about as far from downtown as Richard ever went, and the suburban neighborhood sparkled under the Detroit summer sun. The tape had indeed been taken down. But the bundle of crosses in the grass just beyond the warehouse marked the spot. Richard knelt above that very spot and thought. He looked up to the homes, far enough away that it was probable none had witnessed. Judging by the lack of leads for the cops, Richard believed none had. He looked to the warehouse itself, no doubt devoid of life at the time of Mrs. Walsh's misfortune. Smells like crap, he said. But that wasn't true, and he knew it. In fact, the air was loaded with a scent that was quite the opposite of crap. Disinfectant is what it was, big and pungent, like a diner at two in the morning, like a hospital any time of day. As if the police had mopped the sidewalk where Patty Walsh was felled. As if they didn't want to leave even a scent for a private dick to pick up on. Murphy's oil soap, Richard said. Then he frowned and spat in the grass. Sure, the cops and other eyes had a name for him. Dick Dick. But Richard Smith knew nicknames weren't for nobodies, just like he knew that if you arrived at a crime scene long after the evidence had been taken away, the only thing left to do was imagine it. Richard removed his hat and closed his eyes. He tried to imagine the scene. The papers hadn't mentioned if the killer was in an automobile or on foot. On foot would place him living close. Close enough. The papers also said nothing about the killer being a man or a woman, but then again, they never did. In matters like these, everybody always assumed grown man. But based on the creativity of this particular scene, Richard was guessing it was a dame after all. Grown men didn't think to reassemble. They stabbed, they shot, they got it over with, angry. But this? Only dames were this cruel. Poor Patty Walsh. Richard said, opening his eyes. He spat again in the grass. Though the papers didn't say so, Richard knew the second incident was the work of the same killer. Sure, the weapon was different, and the crime scene was a long three miles away, but Richard could spot an artist from farther than that. The creative type, Richard said, still trying to imagine what played out. And who? It would be some time before the cops cleared the second scene, and so it would be some time before a man like Richard Smith, Dick Dick to the blues, could go there. But in the meantime, it didn't hurt to mull things over. And over. And over. Finally, dissatisfied but aware that he had begun, Richard put his hat back on his head and walked. Dish soap, 
he said, his dress shoes clacking on the cement. He didn't like it. Too strong. Made him think of vacations in places where he was expected to loll about in shorts. He imagined the cops mopping the sidewalk, the grass, the trees, after they tore down the tape, cleaning the scene of every speck and spackle of a clue. William Duncan Eddy had a collection accumulating at the filthy bottom of his closet. He had no magazines, no discarded or fallen clothes, no stowed-away items from yesteryear. But he did have knives and hammers, and the blood of two people upon them. As he laid in bed, he wondered if it was possible that the person the free press was calling the comic killer could actually be him. It didn't fit. William knew guys who collected comics. William did not. He could care less about comics. He had his rock and roll in that broiling summer of 56, and comics were for kids. Was it possible the paper was referring to the stand-up comics? Girls and guys who made jokes? He sat up in bed and swung his black sneakers to the wood floor. Sweat pooled in his pits. He closed one nostril with his scabbed pointer finger and snotted onto his bed sheets. Did the paper think he was joking? The comic killer. William frowned. They didn't think he was anything. They weren't talking about him at all. Someone that fit that title must have been out there, too, doing similar things. William stood up and walked to the window, thoughts of the lime tree in his head, as though the grove were sprouting from the very folds of his brain. Far at the end of the backyard, a step beyond the backyard, wedged between the two brick edifices, it all looked gorgeous and peaceful, righteous and true. There certainly wasn't anything funny about it. Nothing comic at all about the objects that shined out there, reflecting the roasting sun, as if the tree itself wore a necklace, something Mom might wear out to dinner and dancing. Subtly nodding to the radio, staring out the window, William Duncan Eddy started dancing himself. First it was only with his hips, side to side, languid and soulful, then the inertia of his hips brought his knees to sway, too, until he was pumping twin fists to the beat of the music blaring from his bedroom radio. He stared long through the screen, not trying to guess what had grown, but knowing something new had grown for certain. He danced back and forth, elbows at his hips, pumping his fists. Boom, 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 boom. A new offering out there. Boom, 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 boom. Before the song ended, he'd left his bedroom and taken the stairs and kicked open the back door on his way to the yard. The radio was up as loud as it could go, giving him that same beat, propelling him toward the lime grove and the tree that awaited him there. He could see the glossy shapes lolling lazily beneath the green leafy top, and he spotted something else, too, many somethings, darker objects between those that glossed, shapes that looked like rubber as he approached. He had gotten just close enough to determine what they were, squinting into the sun, when a dog barked at him so loud, so violently, that he brought his hands up to protect his face. But it was only a small lab behind the apartment fence to his right. Its owner, sitting upon the stairs to the building, half-waved William's way, then called out to her dog. William didn't wave back. He stopped walking. It felt then as if the papers were talking about him as if he was the oddly named comic killer, as if the woman and her dog were somehow aware of this, and despite looking as ordinary as blades of green grass, they were actually waiting to see what he'd do with the tree. Sorry, the woman called. She wore a tank top, and her face was half hidden by an awning shadow. She's loud. William didn't respond. He only stood still in the middle of the yard, the woman shrugged. Her dog came to her. The two entered the building, swallowed by the back door swinging closed. William still didn't move. He only stared at the building, the fence, the place where the dog had been when it barked. The fear he felt then was unlike anything he'd felt before, as if, as good as the tree could make him feel, that's how bad he felt instead, like a ratio turned against him. Did they know? The woman and dog? Did they know he enjoyed the tree? Then, as if cued by unseen instincts William could only half-fathom, the tree itself spoke to him in a voice as calming as Carl Perkins. 
Pluck one, it said. Pluck many. William walked to it, his eyes scanning the windows of both apartment walls. But when he reached the tree, he only had eyes for its fresh crop. Shovels. And more. Rope. And more. What had looked like rubber to him on his walk turned out to be black plastic. Black plastic bags. Body bags, he thought. He smiled, not because he knew exactly what he would do with this incredible array of offerings, but because he simply liked the two words together, the way they seemed to hold hands and dance. Body bags. Where the plastic was rooted to the tree was particularly fascinating, and William reached up immediately and gently plucked one from the tree. He gripped it with both hands, stretching the plastic, then brought it to his face. He held it there until, in his mind, he saw stars and his lungs cried, Stop! Then he removed it, breathed, and the tree spoke to him again. Savor the moment, it said. Savor the means. And later, around midnight, using one of the body bags as an actual bag to carry a shovel and some rope, William Duncan Eddy went out cruising for the night and savored both. The moment and the means. Richard Smith sat at the bar at Crazy's and held one hand over the top of his drink. The bartender had already made one attempt to put fruit in it, and Richard wasn't taking any chances. These kinds of places, they didn't give you the drink for free if they yucked it up. That was on you. His hat beside him on the bar, Richard looked through the joint's front glass and considered two things. One. The crime scene where they'd found the Boyles kid with the forever smile. Richard had gone there and imagined. There wasn't much to go on, as it appeared the cops had cleaned the place just as niftily as they had the first one. Two, the news this morning of a third crime the papers were saying was no doubt the work of the comic killer. I called her artistic first, Richard said to nobody. He shook his head. Sometimes he wondered if he didn't have a little of that ESP the way the cops and the papers were so predictable. The comic killer was not. Richard gulped his bourbon and soda and tried to imagine what it was like for the 56-year-old Rosella Briggs, who had first discovered, then unearthed the third crime. He didn't know one thing about Rosella Briggs, but he guessed she'd never touched anything like the bottom of the pair of sneakers she'd found in the black plastic bag in her yard. Richard would put good money down that she'd never tried to pick a pair of bagged sneakers up, only to discover there was still a couple of feet in them either. The fact that those feet were still connected to legs, and that those legs... Buried alive! Upside down! The bartender was talking to someone down the bar, talking about the crime. Everybody was talking about the crime, and every sap had a theory. Sounds like the mob, the suit at the end of the bar said. Sounds like something they would do. Oh, yeah? Richard asked, unable to keep quiet. How would you know what they would do? The man looked to the bartender, then shrugged. I don't know. It just sounds like something they'd do. The bartender at Crazy's, Mikey J., knew Richard well. What do you think happened, Dick? Richard fanned a dismissive hand. I think some unlucky dope ran into the darkest dam in Detroit. I think some hapless ignoramus went strolling on the wrong night, met the wrong woman, and met the wrong end. You think it's a girl? The suit asked him. Squinting from the smoke of his own cigarette, Richard nodded. He was just drunk enough to give away one of his guesses. Yes. Yes, I do. The suit shook his head no. No way. No dame. <laughs> no way. Mikey placed his elbows on the bar and smiled at the suit. Dick Dick is good. The suit looked over at Richard and shrugged. Well, not this time. The truth was, Richard felt weird about the guest, too. And yet, he couldn't pinpoint why. The crimes, to him, had all the marks of being anything but a man. Too creative, too imaginative, too strange. No mug I ever met thinks like the comic killer. Richard said. And no cops, neither. He'd been thinking about the blues all day, imagining them mopping both crime scenes, leaving a scent of fruity dish soap from one scene to the other, as if the yellow tape they'd taken down had somehow pollinated the air completely. 
The cops, he huffed, staring into the row of bottles behind the bar, are looking for a white male, thirty-something, maybe high twenties, fit body, average face. And, the suit asked, doesn't that sound about right to you? Richard shrugged. He was talking too much, but he wanted them both to hear it. He wanted to hear it himself. Ain't no grown man capable of an ambush like that. You gotta be small to hide, and whoever done this either hid or walked straight up to them victims in plain sight. And I'll tell you what, too. The comic killer is a wise head. He sipped. No, I don't think it's a man at all. I don't think it's someone who has to hide. And the only people who don't have to mask what they do at midnight are the clucks, the boobs, and the dames. Mikey and the suit considered this. They seemed to buy it for a beat. Then at once, they shook their heads no. I'm with Ben on this, Mikey said. Can't imagine no dame tying a man up like that. I'm tight enough for him to sit still as she dug a hole, Ben added. Then put him in it, upside down. Yeah, Mikey said. Bottoms up. They drank. Hang on, Richard said. Who says the hole wasn't dug before the man come along, huh? And who says he wasn't tied up after he was already upside down? And who says that the comic killer didn't disinfect the whole scene before doing what was done? The two men stared blankly back at him. Disinfect? Mikey asked. Uh, what do you mean, Dick Dick? Richard turned quick from them and grabbed his hat from the bar. He stood up and stumbled. He'd said too much. The confusion in Mikey's eyes told him so. Yeah, he said. He slapped his palm on the bar. The crime scenes smell like... like... He looked to the black cup of lemons and limes by the napkins at Mikey's elbow. Like fruit! Then he stormed out of crazies and crazily shuffled up the sidewalk home. William Duncan Eddy didn't know what to do with scissors any more than he knew what to do with a treadmill. The roots, where the handles had grown from the tree, muddied up the finger placement, and no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get comfortable with them. The man chained up to the lamppost at Gallery and Gomez Streets couldn't get comfortable with them either. What to do? William asked. And it wasn't the first time he asked it. And it wasn't the first time the man, his mouth taped shut, shook his head, wide-eyed, as if more afraid of the killer's indecision than if William had simply stuck him with them. The man also couldn't help but notice how foreign the scissors looked. As if the lunatic teenager standing above him, backlit by the post, had purchased them at an Asian boutique just for this reason alone. And yet, what to do? Savor the means, William said, and the man shivered all over again. The kid had been talking like this for five minutes. Serial stuff. Savor the moment. Pluck one. Pluck many. Madness. He had no doubt that this was the person the papers were calling the comic killer. But right here, right here under the light of the lamppost, it was clear to the man that the kid was going to get caught, and probably soon. He was as careless as the man's college roommate had been with alcohol back in 33, had the same dim look in his eyes, too, like the last thing he was thinking of was getting pinched. And yet, on the long walk downtown, William Duncan Eddy had worried a great deal that someone might spot the scissors and the tape and the chains in the black body bag. Man, oh man, if someone were to stop him, a cop, for example, William would have a worm's chance under a steel hoof of squeezing free. And yet he carried on, sallied forth, almost propelled by the lime tree itself, its black leather voice continuing to circle his skull, like those insane motorcyclists in the ball cages at the circus. Savor the moment. Savor the means. But still, what to do? He looked to the man again, thought about the tree. The thing was, the tree asked you to be imaginative, asked you to open your mind and let out whatever lived in the darkness of a closed one, 
to gulp down the miracle sunlight that must squeeze between two doors, two brick buildings, and to use that sunlight immediately, no time to waste, as long sleeping snakes uncoiled, their bodies so big you couldn't tell where their heads were, unfolding, unspooling, a hundred, a hundred thousand shadow black snakes rising toward an opening mind, ready to reshape things, reassemble, get creative with all that light. The tree said, I don't grow like normal trees. I don't offer what normal trees offer. Why should you? Suddenly William knew what to do, and he was doing it, so that the grime under the man's fingernails almost acted as eye shadow. The blood acted as rouge. Ten toes for ten teeth. Oh, the works, the wonder that William Duncan Eddy let out into the light. I don't grow like normal trees, he said to the man. I don't offer what normal trees offer. Then he was off, out from under the lamppost, back in shadows, as the snakes in his head did the same, slithering into perfect circles as the doors of his mind slowly closed, as his imagination was put away for the night. Richard sat across a booth from Officer Martin Walsh, the frustrated expressions on their faces mirroring each other's, just as their drinks did the same. They'd already spent the better part of an hour going over what Richard thought. Martin had little, if anything, to offer. Walsh, Richard thought, looked worse for the wear. He had no doubt the widower was sinking with each story in the paper, four now, sinking into the pit of wanting, wanting the killer to be found. It wasn't a good place to be, Richard knew. That pit. The more you clawed at the muddy ridge, the higher it got, until it was so far out of reach that you didn't even know you were clawing at your own hands. Tell me, Richard said, out of meaningful things to say. What's with the disinfectant? Walsh looked at the private eye out of the top of his own. What? Richard waved a hand, as if stirring up something aromatic, something neither of them could see. The smell of all these crime scenes, the, the fruity smell, you know, the clean-up smell. Walsh shrugged. He didn't know and his eyes were so far into that pit of wanting that Richard wondered if he could see him at all. "'Well, tell your boys to lay off it,' Richard said. "'Gonna drive the locals crazy. Every time they walk by the crime scene, they're gonna be reminded of it because of that crappy smell.' "'What are you talking about, Richard?' Walsh looked bad, real bad. "'What are you even talking about?' Richard knew a man at the end of his rope when he saw one and not just the hanging kind. Nothing. I'm talking about nothing because we got nothing is why. He flagged the waitress over, a tall woman who looked stronger than him. He imagined her on Gallery and Gomez, a pair of scissors in her hand. Another round, he said. No fruit. She made a face that said he'd told her enough times to hold the fruit. Then she was off. Where does he live? Walsh said, gripping his near-empty drink so hard the whites of his knuckles showed. Richard imagined all of Detroit at once. It hurt his mind's eye, the aerial view, the winding ways, the possibilities. The waitress returned with their drinks and set them on the table. She was halfway back to the bar when Richard saw the present she'd left on the rim of his glass. The goddamn dame had done it on purpose. "'Hey, sassy!' he said. "'Hey, you!' She had turned around and was looking at him, and so would see it when his hand connected with the glass, sending it rocketing to the floor, but halfway to intentionally destroying his drink. Richard froze. He stared down at the slice of lemon, the slice of lime. He imagined. It didn't make any sense. Something big was missing. But when you had nothing at all, what wasn't? Walsh, he said still staring at the fruit, his eyes wide enough to be pinned that way, perhaps the fifth victim of the comic killer. What do you know about urban farming? Walsh shook his head no, his eyes still deep in the pit, still wanting. Bad place to be. Walsh, Richard repeated. Richard, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're... Urban farming, man, Richard said and Walsh was stunned to see the private eye had his wrist in a grip as tight as the cuffs. What are you asking? Come on, Walsh. You know this city better than the mayor. 
Are there any urban farms, uh, lemons, limes? Walsh started to shake his head no, then stopped. Yeah, he said. Some. Some. That was good. Much better than many. Where are they? I don't know every place. Name one. Walsh sat up straighter, adjusted his loosened tie. Um, there's an apple orchard on Grand Boulevard. Name another. Richard, your boys really don't use disinfectant? They clean up the blood. Right. Fruit scented? I don't know. Fruit scented? No. I don't think so. Name another. Um, there's a lime grove at... Where? On Indiana Street. Back off Indiana somewhere. Walsh shrugged. I know it because it's between two of the crankiest apartment complexes on the north side. Between two buildings? A lime grove? Yeah. Walsh sat up even straighter. What's up, Richard? You're not giving me false hope, are you? Richard thought about it. Yeah, he probably was. No. He let go of Walsh's wrist and fell back against the booth. He sighed and looked at his drink, then up at Walsh. To the drink. To Walsh. Then he was out the door faster than Walsh could ask why. The teenagers sang about falling in love on the radio in William Duncan Eddy's bedroom, but he wasn't feeling the beat. He wasn't up and dancing, pumping his fists, eyeing the tree in the lime grove. He was sitting on his windowsill, staring out through the screen, staring at a man who thought he was hiding, but was doing a very poor job of it. He'd seen the man coming, suit and hat and all, and wondered if the man might think he, William, was the comic killer. It still didn't fit with William, didn't sound right, wasn't him as far as he was concerned. But if the man thought that's who he was, well, then he might tell someone that's who he was. The man had checked the back doors of both apartment buildings, then vanished for a while on the other side of the bricks. William imagined him searching the front doors for whatever he was looking for. Who knows? Maybe the loud laugh. Who knows? And while the man was away, William did look to the lime grove, to the tree, to the fresh offering there, no doubt, positively glossing under the perfect summer sun. What might it be? William didn't know, couldn't tell from his window sill, But he wanted to know. And perhaps later tonight he would savor the moment, savor the means. He'd looked so long at the tree that he hadn't seen the strange man appear again inside the lime grove. William saw him moving in there like a very bad insect, a one-man infestation that could cripple everything, kill all the crops. And yet the man hardly seemed to notice the glossing tree, the giving tree, the shimmering beacon of imagination. Rather, he paused before it, then continued, out of the grove again, over the fence to the right, then... Then the man hid... William saw him duck down beside the same stone steps where the lab's owner had waved at him. But after the man went down, he didn't come up. William stared out the window a long time. The man didn't come up. Maybe there was a basement door there. Maybe the man wanted to get to that basement. Maybe he had. William stared out the window. By the time the Danes came on the radio, Once an hour, local boys, be here! William Duncan Eddy was licking his lips, his fingers itching to touch the new crops growing on the tree. Faces came and went in and out of the windows of the apartment buildings, and people passed by on the street beyond the grove. He considered going out there, out to the tree. Mom and Dad were both downstairs, it being a Saturday, but William wasn't worried about them. What would they do? Tell him to stop toying with the trees? They'd be so excited to see he'd gone outside, they'd probably make him a brother or a sister. William eyed the tree. The unknown offerings practically winked at him, practically said, Come on, come on down, William, come pluck one, come pluck many. But the tree hadn't spoken. No, the brilliant, radio-ready voice never spoke to him this far away. William looked to the apartment building windows, looked to the street, looked to the stone steps leading to the back door of the building to the right, looked to the tree. 
Then he was up, off the sill, as the Dane's hit song reached its peak, as the guitar sang a note that was somehow equal measures sad and happy, righteous and cruel. William plodded down the stairs, stopping to adjust his crotch on the way. When he passed the living room, Mom called out to him, but William ignored her, couldn't have repeated what she said. A beat later, he was out the back door, under the Detroit sun, dragging his black sneakers across the green grass to the grove. Halfway to the tree, he knew what it was, the new offering, the fresh crop, and the lock on the doors to his mind cracked apart, and the snakes within began to wake, one eye opening at a time. Axes. It felt somehow fitting, as if the ante of the offerings had upped with each bloom, knives to axes, old William to new. He was already reaching a hand out to touch it, touch the offering, before he was close enough to do it. His hand was extended, the same hand that he'd pricked so long ago, his initiation with the tree. The blade glossed and glimmered, shined and shone, and William imagined the things he could do with just one, one simple axe from the tree. He reached for it as a hand clamped hard upon his wrist, stopping him from going any farther. A second hand gripped the neck of his black shirt, and suddenly William Duncan Eddy was walking backwards, being forced backwards, as if the tree itself were repelling him, telling him, No, not this time, William, not this time. This time, no. William reached, through a blinding sheet of glittering axes, he reached out, desperate for the lime grove, the tree that didn't grow like normal trees, that didn't offer what normal trees offered. He heard words. Was it the tree, after all? Speaking yet? A kid, the voice said. <laughs> Not a woman. A fucking kid. William vaguely understood that he was at the back screen door, could hear it opening and closing, snapping shut like one of the mind snakes biting, angry now, being told no, no, you can't come out. You can't come out and imagine today. The voice continued. New words. Was it the tree? Ma'am, ma'am, call the Detroit police. Call them now. The force continued, too, as the screen door got smaller and the tree beyond it even smaller yet, farther away, too far away, so far away it hurt to think of the distance, how far he'd have to reach to pluck one. Ask for Officer Martin Walsh. Tell them you've got the comic killer. William's mind felt a swarm with writhing black bodies angling to get out, but the doors were not open. You've got the comma killer, William said, his own voice like that of the tree, rich and leathery. Radio ready. That's great. Then Mom was talking, repeating the things the first voice had said as the man, hey, the man with the hat, after all, was walking down the hall of William's home, getting smaller, smaller, until he was about the size of the screen door, then beyond the screen door, out under the sun, out on the grass like a good dog, a quiet dog, until William understood, could see, that he was walking straight for the tree. William turned around and saw Dad was holding a pair of scissors in one hand, hammers in the other. The look on his face said he thought William should be exercising, should get out more. Should, should, should. Mom had the phone to her ear. She was nodding, talking. William couldn't have repeated what she said. Instead, he walked slow to the screen door, already able to hear the sound of the thwacking before seeing for himself the man in the hat bringing an axe over his shoulder, then bringing it down again at the base of the tree. William Duncan Eddy shook his head. No, no, the man couldn't do that. He couldn't do that. And yet there he was, out past the screen door, out just beyond the edge of his family's property, thwacking away at the base of the lime tree, chopping the lime tree down. And William thought that someone with a little more imagination might know how to open the back door, might know how to cross the yard and stop the man from doing what he was doing. He heard the man yelling as he worked, saw faces in the windows of the apartment buildings, saw them all mixed up, each with each other's features, each with fresh offerings. A kid! The man yelled, and William heard sirens. Sounded bad with the music from upstairs. Didn't go together. Didn't dance. But the man chopped on beat. Looked like he was savoring the moment. Savoring the means. Another chop. A chop. Chopping the lime tree down. 
Sherlock Holmes, The Adventure of the Pinpricked Corpse by Lois H. Gresh Dr. John Watson, London, 1890 He's dead! My Horace is dead! A woman shrieked. I slapped down my newspaper and stared at Sherlock Holmes, perched on his stool by the chemistry bench. Adjusting a slide in his microscope, he squinted at a specimen. He seemed not to hear the wailing coming from Mrs. Hudson's apartment below us. "'You've lived through worse, Sophia. Do compose yourself,' came our landlady's soothing words. "'Sit and tell me—' Mrs. Hudson's voice trailed off as the other woman erupted into a fit of weeping. Moments later, two sets of heels clacked up the stairs to the flat I shared with Holmes. I recognized one as that of Mrs. Hudson. The other, I assumed, belonged to her distraught visitor. Mrs. Hudson rapped on our door, snapping Holmes to attention. He glanced at his pocket watch and frowned. So late, he muttered. What the deuce does she want? I dare say it's not to bring us tea and biscuits, I said dryly, as I crossed the room and swung open the door and with a sweeping gesture bid our landlady to enter, with a sobbing woman of perhaps ninety years. "'Come now, let's talk to Mr. Holmes. He'll help you, Sophia. Of this I'm sure.' Holmes rose from his lab bench, his eyebrows arched, his gaze upon Mrs. Hudson. "'And to whom do I owe the pleasure?' he asked, as he helped the landlady maneuver the visitor to his favorite chair by the fire. She continued to weep, sniffling and mopping her nose with a cloth she clutched in her right hand. Although she sat on the edge of the chair, her feet dangled several inches from the floor. Her figure was boyish and slight, and I took her to be no more than four feet eight inches tall. Damp gray hair curled to her shoulders, and she shivered from the night's rain. "'This is my friend from two doors down,' Mrs. Hudson said. "'Mrs. Sophia Fritz.' Stepping to the desk near the fireplace, I removed the blanket we kept in the third drawer down, then wrapped it around Mrs. Fritz's quivering shoulders. "'The fire will warm you,' I said gently, and placed my hand on her arm. She choked down a sob. Her eyes lifted to mine. They were kind eyes, a watery blue, lighter than any London sky. Wrinkles curved like open fans by her cheekbones, laugh lines— her face was soft and fine-poured, not the skin of a working woman, but rather that of a lady who perhaps had once led an elegant life. Holmes sat in my favorite chair, across from Mrs. Fritz. "'Pray tell, madam, what can I do for you on this blustery night? You've come with urgency, and despite the rain you're soaked. You didn't take time to don a coat or shawl.' Her lips trembled, opened, then closed. "'Go on.' "'Tell Mr. Holmes,' Mrs. Hudson urged. "'My life is over,' Mrs. Fritz said. "'Only you can help.' "'An odd statement,' Holmes said, and then, "'Horace is your husband, madam, as in Mr. Horace Fritz, "'and am I correct in assuming that he has been?' "'Yes,' the old lady whispered, lowering her eyes to the floor. "'I found him in his study, murdered, and it was most dreadful. "'How did you know his name?' "'Most gentlemen are aware of the Horace Fritz tailoring business.' "'Holmes paused. "'You found him when? Uh, just now?' Y "'Yes.' "'And where were you, Mrs. Fritz, when this deed, this murder, occurred?' "'She wasn't anywhere near,' Mrs. Hudson burst out. She's my friend, Mr. Holmes. She loved Horace. Everyone knows it. I work in the kitchen at the St. George Orphanage, Mrs. Fritz said, keeping her eyes averted from ours. I'm a volunteer. I've been there for decades helping the orphans. You see, I have no children of my own. I'm barren. I was at St. George's all day and all night. I got home just now, as you say, and there I found him, my Horace, murdered. <laughs> At this, she started weeping again. You must help her, Mrs. Hudson said. 
She begs you. I beg you. Why not the police? Holmes asked. They will come soon enough, Mrs. Hudson answered. They may think she murdered Horace. She wants you to see him in the study first, before the police get involved. Holmes stretched his legs, then stood and returned to his stool by the lab bench. But he did not peer into his microscope, or so much as glance at the slide. Instead, he stared at me. I do have this specimen prepared, and hence am rather busy this evening, and yet, uh, what do you say, Dr. Watson? Shall we investigate the death of Mr. Horace Fritz? The widow covered her face with her hands. She heaved with sobs. Tears fell to the rug. How can we not help? I said. She's Mrs. Hudson's friend. Your answer is as I thought, Holmes said. There you have it, Mrs. Hudson. We will go to your friend's house and to the study of the deceased Mr. Horace Fritz. In short measure, we arrived at the widow's home, where she pushed open an unlocked door. A gas lamp flickered in the hallway, illuminating oil paintings on the walls and a dark rug. A woman's handbag sat on a table near the front door. Your home is lavish, Holmes commented, and yet you left it unlocked in your rush to obtain my services. Did you lose your key? Are there other keys? As if gathering her strength, Mrs. Fritz sank against a dark railing where stairs led to an upper floor. Her dress was much finer than Mrs. Hudson's, and in the light from the gas lamp, the diamond on her wedding ring sparkled like fireflies. One key is in my handbag, she pointed to it by the door. My husband had the other key. There are no others. And the study? Always locked. Was it locked when you came home from the orphanage? Yes. You have a key. It is the same as for the outer door, the widow explained. The question seemed to calm her, perhaps taking her mind off the brutality of her husband's murder. I see, Holmes said. And where does your husband keep his key? In the desk drawer in his study. When he's inside, he locks himself in so as not to be disturbed. Holmes and I exchanged a glance. We both realized that Mrs. Sophia Fritz had been the only person with access to the room where her husband was murdered. Nobody else could have gained entry, or so it seemed. We followed her down the hall to an open door on the left. This is the study, the widow said. She turned on another gas lamp, which cast an eerie glow across the room. I stifled a gasp, and beside me, Holmes tensed. A long stick protruded from the dead man's neck and pointed straight at the ceiling. Is that a knitting needle? Holmes exclaimed. Mine, Mrs. Fritz said softly. But it's wood. Holmes stopped in mid-sentence, and I knew he meant to say something like, so how could it have penetrated so deeply without snapping in two? Yet the needle had not been broken. Alive, Horace Fritz might have stood six and a half feet tall, and I estimated his weight at four hundred pounds. The man had been as obese and tall as his wife was thin and short. He lay on his back in the middle of the room, with his arms limp at his sides, and his legs bared and riddled with spots of what I presumed to be dry gore. He wore a short, blood-spotted nightshirt, and gore saturated the rug around his body. "'Stay here,' Holmes said, as he dropped to his hands and knees and began crawling across the rug, peering at the fibers. He plucked something up and placed it in his coat pocket. I noticed several sconces on either side of the door, and asked Mrs. Fritz to light them. She tottered off and returned with matches, and soon wavering slats of light broke through the dark. To my left sat an ornate desk with a huge upholstered chair behind it. Gold filigrees highlighted the wood of both desk and chair, and on the opposite side of the desk, closer to the corpse, was a matching sofa. To my right, set against the wall, an equally ornate table held several empty gold candelabra. Focusing, I thought I smelled a trace of burned candles, but I wasn't sure. Holmes jumped to his feet and waved at me to join him by the corpse, while the widow shrank back into the hallway, her hand over her mouth. 
Oh, Horace, she sobbed. Why do you think he was killed? Holmes asked. Here, I said, in the middle of the room, right where we see him. Holmes flashed me a smile, and for a moment I was proud of myself. I quickly stifled the emotion, for arrogance has no place in a room with death. How do you know? Holmes pressed. Other than around his body, there's no blood on the rug, I said. He was stabbed here repeatedly, I'd say, and then he fell. Exactly. Now, he had locked the study door from the inside, and the only keys are his own, which I gather are still in his desk drawer. Go check, would you, Watson? And his wife's, in her handbag. I did as Holmes asked, pinching my nose to keep out the stench as I stepped around the corpse. Despite the sconces, shadows gripped the room, making the pools of coagulated blood appear larger. At the victim's desk, I slid open the middle drawer, followed by the top drawer on the left side. There I found a skeleton key, which I held up for Holmes to see. A most sophisticated design, I commented, examining the hooks and angles of the metal. No windows in this room, Mrs. Fritz? Holmes asked. None, she answered, between sobs. Horace demanded complete privacy when working. One of the sconces flickered and then died with a crackle, making me jump and sending shivers down my spine. A feeble light wavered around the room and seemed to settle on the corpse. Averting my eyes from the strange scene, I edged along the floor-to-ceiling bookshelves lining the walls. They held the types of books pompous men show off, but never read. Ancient classics, such as William Blake's Songs of Innocence and of Experience, from 1789, and Thomas Paine's The Age of Reason, from 1794. Horace Fritz's shelves lacked any books from this century. I didn't see a single volume by Charles Dickens. The sleeves of his nightshirt are carefully smoothed over his arms, Holmes said, interrupting my thoughts. What little hair he had is smoothed back, as if combed with a delicate touch. His finger poked aside the nightshirt by the fat man's neck. What do you see, Watson? Please, for Mrs. Fritz's sake, just tell us what you've deduced, I urged. Very well, Watson, he said, though he frowned at me. Beads of dry blood are all over the corpse. The murder weapon is the knitting needle in his neck, but something else happened here as well. It appears as if the killer pricked the entire corpse with pins, either before or after murdering him. Further, Holmes said, notice the candelabra. And I followed him across the room, where he touched the black wicks. The candles are all burned down. The wicks are cold to the touch. Meaning? I asked, but he ignored me. On the rug, I found strands of grey hair, nothing else. He paused, then added, uh, Where is the twin of this needle, Mrs. Fritz? In the hallway she leaned against a painting, worth a fortune, I presumed, and clutched at her chest. In the sitting room, she said, and I will die now, too, from a broken heart. Uh, take us to the sitting room, then. I said kindly. It'll be good for you to sit. Marriage, Dr. Watson, is forever, she said, as I led her down the dimly lit passage to the far end. It's as my great-grandmother said. I do means you're locked in forever, just as my Horace was locked in his room. She turned on a gas lamp by the sitting-room door, and I steered her to a sofa and sat beside her with my legs outstretched. She sighed with relief, mumbling about aching bones. A half-knitted afghan hung from the armrest next to her. A dozen colors intertwined in the afghan to form a pattern so complex that I couldn't imagine how Mrs. Fritz kept track of it. "'I've been working on this for years,' she said. "'And now look at it, a ruined mess.' I was no knitting expert, and neither was Holmes, but what we both noticed was that one of the knitting needles was missing from the afghan. The remaining needle held half the stitches, while the other half had unraveled several layers down. Beyond that, all I noticed were motley clusters of tight stitches and dozens of markers and circular hoops dangling all over the piece. 
Old age, dim vision, the widow muttered. I must try to fix it. Leaning forward, she dug through a sack of needles and other implements by her feet. Procuring a needle distinctly narrower than the murder weapon, she set to work, trying to loop the unraveled stitches onto the new needle. I must work on this! Her voice suddenly shrilled. One hour each day! Oh, if only! Holmes had said nothing during the brief knitting interlude. Now he asked politely about the origins of the Afghan, and why it was so important, and what Mrs. Fritz said shocked me, making me wonder about her sanity. Horace and I married when I was sixteen, she began. My great-grandmother said, This will be your wedding blanket, Sophia. It is the pattern of the loving eye. Follow it exactly as I tell you. Work on it one hour each day. Marriage is forever, Sophia. The loving eye protects. Mrs. Fritz wound a strand of green gold yarn over her narrow needle and continued to babble. Her hands whipped into a frenzy, looping yarns and clicking the pair of wooden needles. Her eyes glazed, as if in a trance. The loving eye has watched over me and Horace for seventy-four years. You're upset, and with good reason. I touched her arm and smiled. Get some rest. Then I asked Holmes if he'd asked enough questions of her, and he nodded. I'll contact the police, he promised, about your husband, so they can begin what will pass as their investigation. I offered her a dose of Dr. Parker's soothing serum to help her sleep, but she turned me down. Knitting is soothing enough for old ladies, she said. Upon returning to 221B, Holmes sent word to the police as he'd promised, and then we warmed ourselves with tea before settling to bed. We arose in the morning to a less bleak day, overcast it was, but the rain had ceased, to be replaced by a fog that smelled of decaying leaves. Holmes pressed tobacco into his pipe, struck a match, and puffed. He leaned back in the chair, occupied by Mrs. Fritz the night before, and crossed his long legs. With his eyelids half-closed, he stared into the fireplace. Smoke curled from the logs, and, as if on cue, smoke curled from his lips. Mrs. Hudson sat across from him, meaning I was once again relegated to either standing, sitting on a stool at Holmes's bench, or pulling up the hard chair tucked by the desk. I chose the third option, sitting closer to Mrs. Hudson than to Holmes. Her face flushed from the fire dancing before us. She smoothed her dress over her lap, tucked her legs beneath the chair. Then she poured tea for both me and Holmes. He ignored the clatter of cups and saucers and seemed not to notice the fragrant bergamot set before him. I nibbled on a warm biscuit marbled with jam. Poor Sophia! I'm sure the gossip has already started. As for me, I don't believe in gossip, but I do say, Dr. Watson, that I am interested in people. Mrs. Hudson sipped tea and gazed thoughtfully at me. I chuckled. With a little prodding, she'd gush with as much gossip as anybody I knew. And so I prodded, and she immediately gushed. Everyone disliked Horace Fritz, she said. In fact, most people hated him. Twenty years ago, he stole his tailoring business from his partner, Mr. Archibald Lyons, who then was forced to work for Mr. Fritz, earning such meagre wages that his own wife died from starvation— can you imagine, Doctor? Sophia always stood by her husband, however, no matter how despicable his actions. Uh, where is this tailoring business? I asked, and she'd barely gotten the address out, when abruptly Holmes turned and trained his sharp eyes on her. His elbow jostled the cup and saucer on the table next to him, and tea sloshed onto the wood. I assume you've been out already this morning, he said, gathering additional gossip. Did anyone see Sophia Fritz arrive home from St. George's last night? Why, I don't gossip, Mr. Holmes, Mrs. Hudson exclaimed. The answer, please. Her hands fluttered at the tea dribbling from the table to the floor. Please do wipe that up, she said, and when he ignored her, waving his hand at her to hurry up and answer his question, she complied, though still flustered. 
Mrs. Castile, across the way, saw Sophia return from the orphanage and enter her home right before she came here. Mr. and Mrs. Blanc, both prone to sleeplessness due to arthritic pains and stomach ailments, observed Sophia take out her key, open the front door, and enter her house, whereupon minutes later she stumbled here without her handbag or umbrella. Did these witnesses hear anything? Holmes rose and tapped ashes from his pipe into the fireplace. No. No screaming, arguments, uh, scuffling, uh, nothing whatsoever? As I said, no. Uh, Mrs. Castile and the Blancs are older than I am. We don't hear all that well, and it was a rainy night. Uh, one final question. Did Archibald Lyons also die of hunger? No, she said slowly. Very well. Come, Watson, wipe that jam off your face. We must visit this tailor straight away. Leaving his spilled tea for Mrs. Hudson to clean up, Holmes strode to the door and grabbed his coat, top hat, and walking stick. I had hardly slipped into my own coat and donned my hat when the front door slammed shut. Muttering a quick apology to Mrs. Hudson, I raced after Holmes, who flagged down a carriage and barked the address of the tailoring business to the driver. One snap of the whip, and the horses started trotting over the cobblestones. I had leapt into the carriage, falling against Holmes on the hard seat. The smell of decaying leaves was more potent outside than from within our rooms, with the windows ajar. I sneezed into my pocket cloth several times, while Holmes sat serenely by my side, his hands clasped on top of his walking stick. "'Do you think this Archibald Lyons murdered Horace Fritz?' I asked, and immediately felt silly, for Holmes's serene countenance darkened, and he frowned at me. "'I don't have the facts yet, Dr. Watson. We must visit this man who hated Mr. Fritz and ask where he was last night.' We found Mr. Lyons in a fancy townhouse refurbished to be an expensive tailoring shop. Horace Fritz, fine clothes for the fine gentleman. Custom-made suits and shirts, trousers and cravats. Paying the driver, we hopped from the carriage and pushed open the door to the townhouse. Bells jangled over us, signaling our entry. Near the door, propped on shelves over workbenches and nailed to the wall, half a dozen signs proclaimed, You deserve only the best, and impeccable trousers and coats for the man of means, and so forth. I fingered my own coat, which was of excellent cut, though at least a decade old. My trousers had seen better days as well. Holmes reached up and jiggled the doorbells, looking inquisitively past bolts of wool, gabardine, and silk toward the rear of the shop. An ancient man, bent at the waist almost parallel to the floor and clutching a cane, hobbled between a table stacked with a mountain of plaid and another piled high with felts. He wore an apron with deep pockets, bald with cracked glasses, and a cocked head, as if he was constantly straining to hear. He might have been the oldest man alive. I raced over to him and took his elbow. "'Mr. Lyons, I am Dr. Watson, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes.' "'You need a new suit?' the man wheezed. "'We're fine with our present attire,' Holmes answered. "'but have some questions regarding a murder that's taken place on Baker Street.' Uh, "'Where?' "'Baker Street,' Holmes repeated. "'The cracked glasses turned toward Holmes, and dim eyes peered. "'Stunned, I realized that Archibald Lyons wore a tattered waistcoat and knee-length breeches, "'the type of outfit seen in England a hundred years ago. Uh, uh, "'Baker Street, you say?' He turned and tottered toward the back of the shop, and we followed, clasping his elbows to keep him from falling. "'That's where Mr. Horace Fritz lives, the thief and murderer.' Shoving aside towering bolts of cloth, we pushed through swinging doors into a back room, where we settled Mr. Lyons onto a stool by a high work table. There were no other types of chairs in the room, so Holmes and I perched on stools. I placed the old man's cane nearby, and with both hands the man grasped the edge of the table. Holmes narrowed his eyes and studied our surroundings. Needles, pins, threads, and scissors littered the tables, along with various tools that reminded me of scalpels. 
Holmes fingered some of the larger needles on the table where we sat with the old man. In a fit of rage, had Archibald Lyons rammed needles and pins into the body of Horace Fritz? The poor fellow didn't seem capable. "'What is your age, sir?' Holmes asked. "'Some say ninety-eight, others say a hundred and two. "'And you're still working?' "'No choice,' the man rasped. "'I have to work with needle and thread to buy a few slices of bread. Twenty years ago, Fritz forged documents and bought off lawyers. "'He took me for everything. "'My Josephine died of starvation.' Fritz didn't care. Sophia tried to help me and Josephine, but when he found out, Fritz beat her up. He beat her up? I exclaimed. Literally? Mr. Lyons nodded weakly. More than once, and after, he said. Fritz always wore long-sleeved shirts of the finest fabric, of course, and high collars, though they choked him due to the girth of his neck. He winced as he walked, and he complained that his arms ached. This only after beating up his wife? Holmes asked. Again the man nodded, and he added that Fritz wore black silk gloves for a couple of weeks following the beatings as well. When asked why his wife stayed with Fritz despite the abuse, Mr. Lyons shrugged. Who's to say? Married women have few choices, eh? It seemed clear that the tailor had no idea Horace Fritz had died, much less been murdered. Despite his access to needles and other sharp instruments, Archibald Lyons could not have broken into a locked house, and then into a locked room, and killed a man as gigantic as Fritz. Besides, why would he have waited all these years for revenge? I wished that I could help Mr. Lyons. Certainly I couldn't afford one of his suits, and I knew that the proceeds of the sale would funnel to Fritz, or rather, to Fritz's widow, Sophia. He's a bad man, Horace Fritz, the old man muttered. Twenty years it's been, too, that he fathered a child, a bastard daughter. At this, Holmes jerked to attention. And the daughter's name? <gasps> Don't know. It was a long time ago. The man's head sank to the work table, cradled by his arms, and I placed a hand on his back to keep him from falling off the stool. There wasn't much meat on him, poor fellow. He was still starving, after all these years. Holmes was already by the swinging doors, anxious to leave, but he stopped and asked a final question. Uh, Mr. Lyons, did Horace Fritz have other enemies, men he ruined financially, others he beat up, men to whom he owed money, perhaps? The ancient tailor was snoring, and I had to prod him to get an answer. He lifted his head, and I helped him off the stool, seeking a suitable place where he could nap. He ruined many, Mr. Holmes, and he regularly beat up suppliers, workmen, and anybody who got in his way or simply annoyed him. Horace Fritz could have been murdered by just about anyone, I thought. Let's ease him onto that pile of felt back there, Holmes said, pointing, and we shifted the tailor to a felt scraps bed behind a workbench. He rolled to his side, moaning with his head resting on a worn copy of Charles Dickens's Bleak House. As it turned out, we didn't have to do anything to learn the identity of Fritz's bastard daughter. She was waiting for us at 221B. And she was quite a sight, dazzling with gold hair, azure eyes, and a tight bodice that did nothing to conceal her huge breasts. She leaned on Holmes's chemistry bench, eyeing us as we entered the sitting-room, with her rear jutting in one direction and her breasts oozing over a frill of lace in the other. It was hard for me to focus on her face. Holmes had no such trouble. He seemed oblivious to her charms. "'You are the daughter of Horace Fritz?' he asked. "'Ada Fritz, and I come for me inheritance.' She swiveled from behind the bench, placed a hand on her waist, and thrust out a hip. Holmes placed his hat on the rack by the door, crossed the room, and settled into his chair. This time I sat across from him, Ada Fritz swiveled closer, and I broke out in a sweat. "'I seen about his death in the morning post. 
His wife remains, I know, but I'm his only child. Her voice turned sugary, the words softly uttered through pink-slathered lips. I deserve me payoff, don't I? Holmes cleared his throat and turned to me. <clears throat> uh, last night I saw the dead man's will poking from Sophia Fritz's sack of knitting tools. Odd that she had it close at hand when Horace was killed. She was so engrossed in her wedding afghan that she didn't notice when I snatched the will. He turned to Ada Fritz. I'm afraid, my dear lady, that— Nothing? I get nothing? Ada cried, and she stomped over to the lab bench and pounded it with a lace-gloved fist. Her lips twisted, and suddenly she wasn't so pretty. He cut me out of his will after all these years, working as a slave to men as hideous as he, me old father. Miss Fritz, uh, what was your relationship with your father? Uh, did you see much of him? Holmes inquired. No, she spat. He wanted nothing to do with me. I were a bastard girl, ain't even a boy. Cursing, she crashed her fist to the bench again, then turned and glared at us. I hated him, Mr. Holmes, and I still hate him, bastard. As quickly as we could relieve ourselves of the golden Ada Fritz, we did, and when I shut the door behind her, Holmes shook his head. A very bad situation, he said, and I can't deduce the nature of the crime. I should already know the identity of the killer— it's frustrating, Watson. Uh, what about this Ada? I suggested. She hated her father enough to kill him. Indeed. Uh, what you viewed as beauty, Watson. Why, I didn't. You did. I saw your face, pink, and your eyes softened, and you couldn't look above her bosom. Holmes! What you viewed as beauty, he said, was a facade that hid her true nature. Her hair was dyed a brassy blonde and assembled in a risque fashion. Her slinky walk and hip thrusts suggest that she might, shall we say, dance in private clubs for certain types of men. Well, I blustered, tell me then, did she kill Horace Fritz? It is a puzzle, he said. The only pertinent issue is how the killer exited the murder scene, leaving the door locked from the inside. Uh, perhaps Mrs. Fritz lied when she said this study door was locked when she returned from the orphanage. Perhaps, but Watson, the killer was very strong and overpowered a brutal, tall, and powerful man of enormous weight. Uh, Mrs. Fritz is tiny, short, and frail. And how did she plunge the needle into his neck? You mean without breaking the needle? I asked. She was much too short to plunge the needle straight into his neck. There was no angle to the murder weapon. It pointed directly at the ceiling. At best, she could have poked at his neck from far beneath him. Perhaps she stood on a chair, I offered. He steepled his fingers beneath his chin and stared at me. No, Watson, the only chair in the room is heavy, and it's behind the desk. Mrs. Fritz is too frail to move it. Besides, the murder occurred long before she found her husband dead. It occurred while she was at the orphanage with her handbag, and in that handbag was her key. How do you know the time of the murder? Elementary. The blood was dry on the corpse and the rug. The candles had burned down much earlier in the evening, leaving but a trace of smoke in the room. The wicks were cold. This is torture, I cried, leaping from my chair and pacing. Why couldn't Ada have killed her father and then left? No scuff marks on the rug. In fact, the only footprints on that carpet are from the dead man, gigantic prince, and his wife, tiny shoes. I found no blonde hair on the rug. I found only a few strands of the widow's hair. So the widow killed him, I exclaimed. Who else could it have been? Your mind spins, he said dryly. It couldn't have been Mrs. Fritz, and yet the sleeves of his nightshirt were carefully smoothed over his arms, and his hair was smoothed back off his face, both making me think the person who killed Horace Fritz also loved him, the type of love that comes with a seventy-four-year marriage. Ada had nothing but contempt for her father, I said. Her only interest in Horace Fritz was his money. Archibald Lyon certainly didn't love Fritz. He also hated him. 
Nobody loved Horace Fritz except his wife. I fear we must visit her again, Holmes said, slapping his knees, lifting himself from the comfort of his chair, and walking to the door. The murder has something to do with her obsessive knitting of that wedding blanket. I'm sure of it. Don't forget that the murder weapon is the needle from the blanket. I finished his sentence as I jumped up and joined him at the door. This would be our final visit to the Fritz home. We would never have another occasion to go there. Within weeks, a young couple would buy the house and move in, the wife expecting her first child. Within weeks, Ada Fritz would know the ugly truth, that she would never inherit anything, for the Fritz fortune would go to the St. George orphanage. The outer door was ajar, as if Sophia Fritz awaited our entry. We found her in the study, where the police had already removed the dead body of her husband. The only evidence of his demise was the dry blood on the rug and the smell of death. She sat in the heavy sofa in front of his desk, knitting the afghan and talking to herself, or perhaps to him, though he would never sit behind that desk again. She was so short that, with her back against the upholstery, her legs stuck straight out like a little child's. Holmes looked as perplexed as I'd ever seen him. Sitting beside the dazed widow, he gently lifted the two knitting needles from her hands and placed the afghan on the dead man's desk. I sat in Horace Fritz's gigantic chair and touched the afghan. The yarn was soft, the colors almost magical, as they blended into patterns I can only describe as variants of the bizarre space-filling curve postulated by Giuseppe Piano in the March 1890 issue of Mathematische Annalen. Both Holmes and I remained fascinated by Piano's curve, which passes through every point of a square. Mrs. Fritz's hands continued to twitch and tug at the air, as if she still held her needles. The watery blue eyes lifted from her task, and again I was struck by the kindness in them. She had such a soft face, lined only by years of smiles and gentle laughter. I saw nothing in that face of a tormented soul, a woman who had suffered at the hands of an abusive husband. This was Mrs. Hudson's dear friend. "'Did you kill your husband?' Holmes asked, straight to the point, and I tensed, awaiting the answer. Her hand stopped moving and sank to her lap. A tear dripped from her left eye. "'No,' she whispered. "'Never.' "'Then how?' Holmes asked, exasperated. "'How did this happen? You know, and you must tell me.' This is why you enlisted my aid rather than the police. It has to do with the Afghan, doesn't it? Your wedding blanket, Mrs. Fritz. You're being cruel, I intervened, for she is but an elderly woman, a friend of Mrs. Hudson, a recent widow, for God's sakes, Holmes. But she hushed me with the flutter of her hand on mine, and a smile that creased the wrinkles by her eyes. The laughing eye watched over us since our wedding night. It's always been here in case of need. Uh, but what does this mean? I asked, as Holmes shook his head in frustration. Knitting needles can't kill a man as powerful as your husband, Holmes said. It's impossible. Now it was she who shook her head. The loving eye keeps us together, always. It's a woman's right, possibly our only right. My great-grandmother told me. She returned to her dazed state, speaking in a monotone. You must knit the pattern each day for an hour. If you miss a day or drop a stitch, the eye hurts your husband, pricks all over his body, blood as if from a needle, the curse of the eye. The high collars and black silk gloves, I whispered. Yes, she intoned. If your husband hurts you, then you drop stitches. The loving eye atones and keeps the marriage together. He is laughing for a while. If he hurts you badly, you don't knit that day, and the eye atones with enough pricks to teach him. Dash it all, I don't believe this hogwash. Holmes bolted from the sofa. Surely you jest. You attempt to make a fool of me. I thought again of Piano's strange curve, passing through every point in a square. It was hard to visualize such a curve. It felt infinite to me. How many points or pricks, I asked, if you don't follow the pattern precisely for days on end? How bad can it get, Mrs. Fritz? 
Marriage is forever. The loving eye protects. She's trying to tell us, Watson, that her husband died because she dropped stitches on this blanket. Ha! Ah! Holmes openly laughed at her until his face went red and tears sprung into his eyes, and he had to wipe them off with his hand. I didn't drop stitches, she said. Look at the mess of the loving eye, far more than dropped stitches. But I didn't kill Horace. I loved Horace with all my heart, for we were glued together for good and for bad. I'm old. My eyes are dim. My hands feeble. Seventy-four years knitting the loving eye, forever it is, and in old age a woman's comfort is in her knitting. And why me rather than the police? Holmes demanded. Had I not involved you, eventually police would have found both Horace and me. They would have investigated nothing, you know that. Any case you pursue is news, Mr. Holmes. Now our story will be splashed across the front pages of newspapers. The world needs to know that wives have no recourse to understand, to give us options. Watson? Holmes curled his finger, motioning at me to join him at the far end of the room, where the dead candles thrust their black wicks straight up, like the needle in Horace Fritz's throat, I thought. The trace of dead candle smoke still lingered. Sophia Fritz remained on the sofa, her head and body hidden from view. The loving eye was on the dead man's desk. "'I think it best that we leave now,' he said. "'As I see no way to prove who came into this room early in the evening, "'killed this man in such a bizarre way, and then left, whether the room was locked or not.' "'But you never give up on a case, Holmes. "'Surely if we think this through—' "'In circles?' he barked. "'Perhaps we're looking at this incorrectly,' I said. "'Perhaps it's not a who that killed him, but rather a what. "'Have you lost your wits?' "'If she really believes this,' I pressed, "'do you think she messed up the pattern on purpose to kill him?' "'He beat her up. He broke her heart. "'He was a terrible husband, father, employer, a loathsome man,' Holmes said. "'But she loved him. "'That's why she smoothed his clothes and hair when she found him, "'murdered on the rug. She did not kill him. "'Will you tell the newspapers as she wished?' He shook his head. No, I deal only in facts, not in the ruminations of this senile. And yet she had inadvertently destroyed the intricate pattern of the Afghan, as set forth by her great-grandmother. Suddenly Holmes grabbed my arm, and his eyes went wild. Watson, look! he cried, pointing over my shoulder. Sherlock Holmes was not a man easily frightened. I'd never known him to fear anything— other than the inability to solve a mystery. Startled by his behavior, I turned in the direction he pointed. The loving eye was on the rug, right where Horace Fritz had died. Dark settled around it. Light crept from the hallway to the wedding blanket, which glowed like Ada Fritz's hair. "'What is this?' Holmes cried, but we didn't stop to analyze it. Instead we raced over to Sophia Fritz, but as we reached her, her body spasmed and knocked us both aside. We stumbled back, clutching at the sofa for balance. Marriage is forever, she whispered. Trance-like, she walked to her wedding blanket. I grabbed for her, as did Holmes, but again her limbs held surprising strength and knocked us aside. We could do nothing. We froze in place, not by our own volition, but by a force we did not know. She squatted on the knitted monstrosity, then lay on her back. She looked up at the twin of the knitting needle that had killed her husband. I struggled to form words. Holmes's face flooded with emotion, something I'd rarely seen, and it frightened me. The knitting needle plunged, and then plunged again. It riddled her with pricks, and beads of blood soaked her dress and popped out on her face and limbs. Then the needle rose out of the light and into the shadows, and as we huddled together, shaking, Holmes and I saw the unimaginable, as the needle plunged down one last time, straight through the light and into Mrs. Fritz's neck. She twitched, then lay still, blood spreading beneath her, a smile frozen on her lips, the laugh lines crinkled at her eyes. 
the loving eye kept them together forever. And then it unraveled the yarn fracturing to dust. The Empty Grave by John McGoran Red's Tavern was technically a speakeasy in that it didn't have a sign out front. It was as much of a home as I had, more so than the one-room walk-up I rented around the corner. Close to the Philadelphia docks, it was off the beaten track enough that no one gave Red any bother, but near enough to the historic section that the occasional loudmouthed and thirsty tourist could find it. They stuck out among the regular patrons, like brightly colored candy wrappers blowing across a gray gravel road. Eye-catching, all right, but ready to tumble away on the wind at any second, or be disposed of in some other way. I hated them, but they were good for business. Really, they were business, and Red's Tavern delivered just enough of them to keep me going. But late October wasn't tourist season, and the guy who walked in that afternoon wasn't a tourist. He wasn't a stevedore, or an ex-con, or a desperate drunk on his final lap, either. He didn't belong at Red's. As the newcomer walked up to the bar, Red cocked a burning bush eyebrow in my direction, making sure I'd seen the guy, and wondering what I made of him. I acknowledged that I had with a slight nod over my whiskey. "'What'll it be?' Red asked as the guy perched one foot on the bar rail. "'Gordon Bessick.' said the newcomer, extending his hand over the gouged and pitted wood of the bar. Red looked at the thing like he was trying to decide what to lop it off with. Bessick pulled his hand back before Red came to a decision. Red squinted at him, like he was some kind of strange creature. Bessick said, A beer, then flashed a nervous smile and added, uh, Please. He looked around the place, at all the regulars staring into their drinks as usual, until he met my eye. He gave me the same smile he'd given Red, this time accompanied by a dip of his head. I dipped my head back at him. Red put a mug of beer on the bar, and Bessick put a fiver next to it. I'm a reporter, Bessick said, as Red pulled out the fiver in the till and pulled out four singles and a handful of change. Red looked like his squint was becoming permanent. I got up from my table and went over to the bar. A reporter, I said. Bessick turned to me and nodded, visibly relieved that someone was responding to him. "'For the public ledger,' he said, as if that was impressive. Then he leaned closer and looked around, as if he was sharing a secret with me. As if anyone in that dive gave a rat's ass about him or anything he had to say. "'I'm looking for stories,' he said. I finished my whiskey and put the glass on the bar, eyeing up Bessick's pile of scratch. Fill that glass for me, and I'll tell you a good one. There were benefits to my job, but the pay was not one of them. What little I managed to make, I spent right there at Red's, and I always tipped proper, so I was always looking for ways to offset my expenses. Bessick smiled at me, trying to look friendly, but coming off condescending. Sure thing, friend, he said, making it a little too plain that he didn't expect me to deliver on the story. He motioned to Red to fill my glass, and Red did so, looking at me meaningfully as he pinched a few coins from the pile of change. I picked up the glass and slid off my stool. Best we go to a table for this, I said. Vasek smiled again, smug, like he was playing along with a child's game. Uh, what line of work are you in, Mr. Uh, Ames, I said. And I'm a private investigator, or I used to be. As we sat across from each other, Bessick looked at me with a little bit more respect and a little more doubt, like maybe he didn't completely believe me already. That was okay. I'd be happy to show him proof of my story. "'Aren't you going to take notes?' I asked. "'Let me hear the story first. I'll take notes if I have any questions.' "'Suit yourself,' I said, thinking, "'Oh, you'll have questions.' He leaned across the table and raised an eyebrow, waiting for me to begin. I took a slow sip of my whiskey, letting a couple of seconds go by before I started, letting him start to feel eager, in spite of himself. It's not all my story, what I'm about to tell you, but enough of it is, and at any rate, it's become my story by rights. Another slow sip. 
I was working a missing person's case, a missing body, really, back in 1918, during the worst of the flu. There was this rich dame from Rittenhouse Square, a real looker. She went into the hospital, and she died. I shook my head at the memory of those days. I had seen plenty since then, but it was still enough to give you pause. Uh, the hospitals, then, they couldn't keep up with the living and the dying, much less the dead. This dame's family wants her body, as you would, for burial, for saying goodbye and that. But this beautiful young thing, her body disappears. The family's beside itself. It's not my usual work, but they're rich as all get out. I tell them I'll take the case, but it's going to cost them, and there'll be expenses. They say just get her back. So I'm thinking, yeah, it's possible some sawbones has taken her for experiments, and between you and me, better they learn on her dead body than muck things up on my live one. Or some pervert took her who's got a taste for cold stillness. But especially with that flu killing so many, they'd probably both take a pass, which means it's almost a sure thing she ended up in one of the potter's fields. You know what they are, right? Bessick nodded, like, of course he did. They're awful places, them potter's fields, I continued. And back in 18, they were at their worst, busy as hell, and I believe that wasn't the only similarity. But I've got a photograph of this girl. She's such a knockout. I figure even after the flu killed her and that, they'd remember her coming in, with all the dead laborers and criminals and booze hounds, even if they didn't write her down. With the family's money to wave around, I'd jog someone's memory. And with a little bit more of it, I'd get them to find her and dig her up. She'd be a piece of cake. I just needed to find out which one. So I go around to all the ones I know about, the ones the hospital tells me they send their bodies to, and God bless them, they're doing their best as far as I can tell. They've got lists of who's coming in from where, which graves they're filling on which days, keeping track of everything like that. But they all say they haven't seen this dame. No one like that has come in. So I get to the last place on the list, a tiny little place, not far from here, actually. It's pretty quiet. In fact, there's just the one fella there, this grave digger, and he's sitting there on this ratty wooden chair next to this open grave with a shovel in his hand, like he's just finished digging, or he's just about to start. He looks at me as I'm walking up to him, looking behind me like he's trying to see the body I'm bringing him. He's an odd little guy, and I says to him, I just need to ask a couple questions, and he looks like I've spooked him, like he's going to run off. So real quick, I hold up the photo, and I tell him I'm just looking for this girl. Her body was sent from the Pennsylvania hospital by accident, and the family wants to bury her proper. He shakes his head before I got close to him. She ain't here, he says. He doesn't have any list or anything to check, and he doesn't really look at the photograph. Then he tells me he hadn't got any bodies that week at all. I'm thinking, that's crazy. People are dropping like flies all across the city. But when I look around, I can see that there's just that one fresh dug grave, and it's still open and still empty. And I can tell, just looking at him, that he's lying about something. Maybe he's in cahoots with some perverts or the grave robbers, and they took the girl's body. But regardless, the guy stinks to high heaven like he's lying. So, what did you do? Bessick asks. He was literally on the edge of his seat, and he hadn't touched his beer since we sat down. I knew I had him hooked. I leave him, and then I circle around and climb up onto stables across the street, I told him. And I wait. And I watch. Not an hour goes by before a van pulls up, and these two fellers in white jackets open the back and hoist out a body on a stretcher. They carry the body over, and the grave digger tells them to put it down next to the grave. He signs their paper, and they leave. Then he picks up the body, pretty handy about it, too, for a little guy, and he chucks the body into the grave. I'm kind of relieved to see the body actually make it into the hole, considering what I've been suspecting him of. But instead of filling it in, he just stands there, looking into the grave, all intent-like. Must have been fifteen, twenty minutes. He only snaps out of it when another van pulls up. Two different fellers get out in their hospital whites, and they take another body out of the back. The same thing happens. They put it on the ground, the gravedigger signs the paper, and as soon as the van leaves, he chucks it in on top of the first body. I'm rubbing my eyes, making sure I'm seeing straight. But that's what happens. 
He stares into that hole for a while, then he sits back down in his chair, produces a bottle of rock gut from somewhere, and takes a few long drinks of it. He puts two more bodies into that hole before he quits at six o'clock. The last one comes in at 5.30, and he spends the next half hour staring into that hole and drinking his rot gut. When the church bell strikes six, he snaps out of it, finishes his bottle, and buggers off. I wait until he's turned the corner, then I go look into that grave. What do you think I saw? Bessick shook his head. Four bodies? Just dirt. He filled it in when you weren't looking? I shook my head. It wasn't full. It was empty. It looked just like it had when I first got there. It was like the bodies had just disappeared. Where to? I took a slug of my whiskey and put the glass on the table. I didn't know what to make of it, but one thing I did know was that I needed a drink. Turned out this was the closest place. He raised his glass in toast to the place, and I did too. So I come in here and I order a whiskey, I said. Bessick tilted his head toward the bar. Was Red here? I shook my head. This was before his time. Anyway, I get my drink and look around the place. Wouldn't you know it? The grave digger is sitting in the corner, right there. What did you do? I tell him he needs to explain what the hell is happening there, or I'm going to gut him like a fish. So what did he say? Bessick asked, leaning even closer. I raised my empty glass and smiled. That was my story. If you want to hear his, it'll cost you another drink. We squared that away, and I took a leisurely sip, again milking the suspense. So, did he talk? Bessick finally asked. He did, I said. But first, he cried. He cried? Like a little girl. I drink my whole drink, waiting for him to stop, but finally he does, and I'm still there. And then he starts talking. I leaned forward and lowered my voice, partly for effect, and partly because even with that lot of degenerates in Red's Tavern, I didn't want anyone else to hear me. He tells me that years earlier, a pair of gents had come to that graveyard one day. They said they worked for something called the Agency. They ran a secret prison— and they were planning on sending him the body of a lunatic named Cosimo, a crazed adherent of the dark arts who had killed dozens of people and eaten some of them. They told him weird tales about how Cosimo got inside the guards' heads, twisted them, gave them horrible nightmares, how it took the executioner three tries to execute him. Jesus, Bessick said, leaning back a little. These gents from this agency told the gravedigger they'd pay triple his usual fee, but he had to dig Cosimo's grave extra deep, a full ten feet. He said, yeah, sure. It took him the rest of that day and some of the next morning, and even as he did it, his head filled with strange, dark thoughts. Just as he finished, they came back with the body. He said it was wrapped tight, like an Egyptian mummy or something. The gents from the agency measured the grave, decided it was deep enough, and paid him his money. They watched him start filling it in, and once the body was covered, they crossed themselves and left. The gravedigger had just gone back to filling it in when a cart from one of the hospitals showed up. They paid him as usual and gave him the body. Now, this was a potter's field, so they didn't care how he buried it. The poor feller was exhausted, and even with a couple of feet of dirt on top of Cosimo— he still had a seven-foot grave there, so he dumped the next body on top of it and took a break for lunch. By the time he was done eating, there was another delivery coming in, but then he looked into the grave. The second body had vanished. He put in the next body, and it vanished too. I stared into Bessick's eyes when I told this part, just like the gravedigger had stared into mine. Finally, yet another body came in, a fourth one. The gravedigger put it in the hole as well, but this time he waited and watched. What happened? Bessick asked in a hoarse whisper. He said the dirt at the bottom started to move, to writhe around, like the dirt itself was alive. Then this black ooze started to well up out of it like oil or pitch, but the blackest he'd ever seen. 
It was snaking up around the body like tentacles, more and more of them, wrapping around the body, covering it up completely, like it was filling the bottom of the grave. And after a few minutes, it seeped back into the dirt, and the hole was empty again. I sat back and sipped my drink, giving Bessick a chance to ask a question. But he just sat there, quiet, waiting for me to continue. So I did. The gravedigger says to me he knew he needed to tell someone what happened, but there was no one to tell, and no one that would believe him anyway. But even apart from that, he realized his feet wouldn't move. Then he heard a voice. He says it was like something from a nightmare. It felt like pure evil. He knew it was Cosimo, invading his mind. The voice told him that as long as the gravedigger kept putting bodies in that grave, he'd never have to dig another one. But if he tried to resist, if he didn't deliver, he'd suffer the torments of hell for eternity, and he'd end up doing Cosimo's bidding anyway. Bessick sat there, transfixed for a moment, his mouth opened half an inch, like he'd forgotten to close it. And then he sat back and let out a short, soft laugh. Well, I think you owe me a drink, he said, or maybe two. How's that? I said to him. It's a hell of a story and all that, but I'm a reporter. For a proper newspaper, we publish true stories that really happen, more or less, not scary stories from the land of make-believe. He raised his glass. But you spin a hell of a yarn. Maybe you could sell it to one of them pulp magazines. Are you calling me a liar? He shrugged. I'm saying that sounds like bullshit. For a moment, I wanted to slug him. But then I started to laugh. <laughs> That's exactly what I told the gravedigger. The laughter died out in my throat. Then I saw it myself, just the way he said. He took a deep drink of beer and sat back, looking doubtful. I can prove it, I said. One eyebrow inched up. How? he said, studying me. I studied him back, waiting, not wanting to appear too eager. I can show you, I said. It's just a couple of blocks away, on Elm Street. You might even get to meet the gravedigger. Bessick looked dubious. Surely gravediggers don't work at night. Sometimes they do, if they need to. I thought the potter's field on Elm closed years ago. I shook my head. Places like that never close, not really. He stared at me for a long moment, shaking his head at his own gullibility, as if that was the biggest problem he faced. Okay, he said. Let's go. As we got to our feet, I caught Red's eye and pointed to the pile of Bessick's change. We'll take what's left in the bottle. Bessick opened his mouth to protest, but I cut him off with an upraised hand. You'll never get a better story for the rest of your life. A cold mist had begun to fall and we kept warm by finishing the bottle as we walked. At one point we even sang, some song I'd long forgotten that bubbled up from the depths of the booze. Bessick kept up admirably, with both the drinking and the singing. I wondered if he knew the song, or if he was just that quick a study, that ready to go along. He was different from me, Bessick was. I liked him. I felt bad. After two blocks of cobblestones and one block of gravel, we stopped. Across the street from us was a gate, and it was just as I'd described, just as it had appeared those many years ago. Stretching across the field, the old graves were covered with grass and weeds, mostly reclaimed by the earth itself. But in front of us was a wooden chair with a shovel leaning against it. Next to it, yawning black, was an empty grave. But it wasn't a fresh one. It had lain open ten years that I could attest to. Bessick was duly quiet, duly respectful, and for that I was grateful. He was all right, that Bessick. He looked around as we walked up to the grave, maybe taking in the details for his story. The gravedigger tried to push me in, I said quietly, reliving the moment. Bessick shuddered and stepped back, then bent forward and squinted into the shadows at the bottom of the grave before turning to me. Jesus, he said with genuine sympathy. What happened? I smiled at him. I got out. He looked around, nervous despite himself, then turned to me. So I guess he's not here, though, huh? Uh, the gravedigger? Actually, I said, 
You're looking at him. He laughed, like this was a put-on. I thought you said you were a private investigator. <laughs> I said I used to be. I'm retired. You're digging graves for extra cash in your retirement? I do it for the benefits, I told him. It's not such a bad job, less actual digging than you'd imagine. I swung the shovel hard enough to stun him, but not so hard as to knock him out. Cosimo had started to prefer them awake. Besides, I felt I owed Bessick the rest of the story. He groaned when he hit the bottom of the grave. Then he rolled over and looked up at me. Sorry, Bessick, I said. It's been three days now, and Cosimo's hungry. He was gingerly touching the back of his head. In the moonlight, I could see his eyes coming into focus as his head started to clear. What the? The gravedigger hit me with this very same shovel, like I just did to you, and knocked me into that hole. And I felt the dirt squirming underneath me, like you're probably starting to feel right about now. Bessick sprang to his feet like he'd been bitten. His eyes were wide and almost clear. Get me out of here, he said. I stepped back from the edge, still holding the shovel. Lucky for me, as I struggled to climb out, the grave digger tried to push me back with this. I held up the shovel. A mistake I'll not be making. I grabbed hold of it and pulled myself out. Then I chucked him in. I could remember the wet thwack the grave digger had made when he hit the dirt, and seeing him already half covered with that horrible black slime. Jesus, you're crazy! Bessick said, frantic, but maybe still not quite believing what was happening, what was going to happen. You really do need to see such a thing to believe it. I sat in the chair with the shovel between my legs. I thought about helping him out of the hole, even though he'd pushed me in first, I went on. But my feet wouldn't work, you see. I couldn't move at all, so I just stood there watching and saying to myself, I'm glad that's him in there and not me. Then I heard another voice in my head, one that wasn't my own. It was Cosimo, telling me that since I'd killed the gravedigger, I'd be taking his place. And now that Cosimo had tasted the living, that's what he'd be demanding from now on. Bessick stared up at me like I was insane, which maybe I was. But who could blame me? Then the hole began to fill with black ooze. As it pooled around his ankles, he looked down and said, Ugh! His face twisted in disgust that replaced his fear, but not for long. A shudder ran through him, and his eyes widened as he looked back up at me. Jesus, he said, it's so c c cold. He tried desperately to climb out, but the hole was too deep. Uh, try not to damage the edges there, I told him as he clawed at the sides. I might be the grave digger now, but truthfully, I'm not much good at digging graves. Black tentacles slithered up his body, and Bessick lost his balance. His feet were probably gone by then. He tumbled backward with a wet splat. Oh, God, he said. Oh, God. And I thought, no, not God. He began to shake as the stuff closed over him. When all that was left was his face, his eyes looked over at me. Whatever was left of him was asking, begging, beseeching. But there was nothing that I could do for him. Not that I would have, anyway. Better him in there than me, I told myself, like I told myself every time. Then the blackness closed over him, and he was gone, mercifully, or maybe not, depending on where he went after. It's a terrible thing to watch, but impossible to look away from. The darkness writhing and rippling in the shadowy hole, so absolute, it's more a sensation of movement than anything you can see. After ten minutes, or maybe fifteen, the stuff soaked back into the soil until it was gone, and with it, any trace of Gordon Bessick. I got up and looked at my watch, then I leaned the shovel against the chair and started walking. If I hurried, I could make last call at Red's, and I needed a drink. A Tiger in the Night by Rachel Kane Read by Karen Allers A Tiger in the Night by Rachel Kane Narrated by Karen Allers The first thing Mr. William Pinkerton himself ever said to me was, This is not the case for you, Miss Fay, as he plucked the summary of the case from my hands and returned it to the desk. 
It was pure happenstance that I was there in his outer office that day, and that I had idly picked up the summary to read while I waited, for I was waiting to be briefed on another assignment by his brother, Mr. Robert Pinkerton, who was running late. Why not? I asked before I could stop myself. It was not a politic question, and I much enjoyed my position at the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. My forays into detection had been frustratingly mild and calm thus far. Ten cases, one in which I accompanied a suspected murderess in her travels through Europe, hoping to gather information about the poisoning of her husband. In all my cases I had been successful, which was something of a wonder among my colleagues. I was thought very suited to the work. Though in these unsettled times following the bloody war between the states, detection was a lesser part of what the Pinkerton Agency was asked to do. I had never been sent on a strike-breaking operation, and for that I was very grateful. But there was something about this particular case, this report, that had insisted on drawing my attention. It was as if it had glittered in the sunlight, tempting me. And once I read the first paragraph, I knew that I must take this job. Why, I didn't know, only that it called to me very strongly. Now it was up to me to convince my employer. Mr. William Pinkerton turned slowly to look at me. It was not comfortable, that look. He, like his legendary father, who had only passed to glory last year, had an intimidating aura about him, and his gaze knifed me more surely than a cutthroat. Ms. Fay, you had something to say? I took a deep breath, in for a penny and pound alike. These murders in Texas seem to be quite unusual, I said. At a glance, it seems very likely that a female detective might have a better chance of interviewing the surviving victims than a man. You miss the fact that all the victims are, in fact, Negro, he said. Are you a Negro? I am not, I replied evenly. You have only a few employed of that race, and none of them are women, sir. I am less than ideal, but still qualified in ways even a Negro male detective cannot match. That earned me a raise of eyebrows. Ambition? It hardly flatters a woman to be so forward in her wishes. On the contrary, sir, nothing but ambition flatters a woman who wants to advance in this world. I am twenty-six years old, and while women of my years are burdened with a husband and three or four children, I am unattached and dedicated to my career, I said. Ambition flatters me very well. Mr. William liked boldness. I could see the flash of it in his eyes, the quirk of his lip, but he quickly suppressed it. Are you not here to be sent on an investigation in the more domestic side of the business? Fraud, theft, and the like? I am, I said, but I have a taste for the criminal. Pinkerton leaned against the frame of his office door and folded his arms. Then tell me what you've gleaned of the case thus far. I hadn't had more than a minute or two to study the papers, but I plunged ahead. By all accounts, the first victim on New Year's Eve last year was Miss Molly Smith, a domestic servant violently attacked in the cabin behind her employer's house. In itself, a woman attacked wouldn't be out of the ordinary, but Miss Smith was asleep beside her common-law husband, Mr. Spencer, who was also found severely wounded with blows to the head on the floor of their room. The poor woman had been dragged from the home into the yard, hidden behind an outhouse, violated and murdered. His eyebrows slowly lifted, and as he considered my unflinching account, he took a pipe from his pocket and tamped in some tobacco. And the next? The next, we know, is Miss Eliza Shelley, who was found hacked to death in her cabin behind the residence where she worked. Most horribly, her three children were in the cabin at the time of the brutal killing, but none were harmed. He nodded. Go on. The same evening, Miss Irene Cross was killed in a similar attack with her nephew nearby, and there was a report of a third that night. The sheer frequency of attacks and similarities is why I believe, with some diligent questioning, we might uncover more attacks that were unsuccessful and even apparently unrelated. He struck a match and held it to the bowl of his pipe and puffed it. The scent of his tobacco blend, a hint of orange in the warm cloud, tinged the air around him and drifted slowly to me. That was one thing I enjoyed about these expensively paneled offices the brothers Pinkerton shared. They were unreservedly masculine, full of heavy furniture, thick carpets, and the ever-present smell of pipe smoke. It all reminded me of my late father. Conclusion? 
he asked. From these spare notes, Mr. Pinkerton. Conclusion, Miss Fay, or move along. I took in a deep breath and nearly coughed on the suddenly thickened air. I was not and never had been a smoker myself. This man, for it is a man, obviously, given the frenzy and strength, will kill again. He has a taste for it, and no fear of being caught. He has identified a vulnerable population, and, like a tiger in the night, he will continue to snatch victims. Mr. Pinkerton shook out his match and dropped it into a silver ashtray on his assistant's desk. Said assistant, Mr. Butterfield, was absent today, having fallen ill with a summer ague. You think an insane man the killer? Perhaps, I said. I confess, I have not read all the way to the end of the paper. He laughed, shook his head, and pushed away from the doorframe. Miss Fay, your conclusions are most entertaining. But I could hear the qualification in his voice. He was going to turn me away. At that moment, Mr. Robert Pinkerton, his brother and my usual supervisor, threw open his door and ushered out a very pale and chastened-looking detective, who hurried off without meeting anyone's eyes. Mr. Robert's face was florid and muddled with anger. Lucy, he said, I fear I've wasted your time. I've nothing for you, after all. Come back tomorrow. He stepped back in the office and slammed the door with such force it rattled the paintings hung on the wall. I slowly turned back to Mr. William. The echoes of that slammed door hung in the air between us, and then I said, I find myself at loose ends, Mr. Pinkerton. If you'll take the chance on me. I can hardly send you alone to the wild streets of Austin, he said. The place is hardly civilized. I will send Mr. Ward with you. I believe you work well together. No, no, don't bother to argue the point. I will not send a woman alone into a city where they are, if you are correct, pray for a madman. The bursar will issue the funds, and I will arrange for Mr. Ward, who is already in Dallas on other business, to meet you by train in Austin. I trust you will go armed. I am armed always, sir, I told him, which earned me a smile. The proper thing for a lady to do was to dip a curtsy. But I had learned that the working world was not the world of social propriety, and I extended my hand, not to be kissed, but to be shaken. Mr. Williams seemed surprised, but he laughed and gave me a firm but not crushing hold. Then see what you may discover, Miss Fay, he told me, and take no chances. If you, in fact, are dealing with a tiger, you must take especial care to be the hunter and not the prey. I nodded, and we shook on it. I was only to identify that later as the exact moment my life descended into a nightmare that had always been there, waiting. I can't recall a time where I didn't understand that my mother's life was eccentric. In the beginning, she was simply interested in spiritualism, but merely as a hobby. In my early years, we lived in a bright upstairs apartment in Chicago with my father, until both the apartment and father perished in the great fire. After that, the two of us lived in drab little accommodations that, I remember it clearly, smelled strongly of blocked drains and rat poison. But habitations were hard to come by then in our ruined city, and I suppose she had done her best. She made her living in those lean years by turning what had been a hobby into a business. She became a practicing, consulting medium. As it continues to be now, spiritualism was all the rage in the latter part of the 1870s, largely driven by those eager to contact their departed loved ones lost in the late war or the Chicago conflagration. My mother had done it for friends for years prior to the loss of her husband and home. In those dark apartments, she covered up the old paint with draped cloth, invested in a large round table at which participants could be seated, obtained the proper sort of evening dress, not too daring, not too demure, that mediums favored, and then began to draw on her old friends for clientele. I was quite young when Hobby turned to profession, but I remember the scene well. The smell of incense covering the less attractive odors, the blur of candles and dim lanterns, a parade of silks and suits, tears and cries of joy that I eagerly observed from a hidden corner of the stairs. Gradually, my mother's name became known as a reliable and steady communicator with the dead, and her fame grew wider. I became old enough to join in her work, not as a medium, but in the mundane tasks of greeting her guests, seating them, 
offering them water and bracing brandy. When I was fourteen, I began to feel unwell. I felt constantly ill, and I grew pale and ever more weak. We had money for doctors, but there was little enough help from them. No one knew the cause of my illness, and my mother began to turn to less scientific methods, to the spirits that had served her so very well before. The last seance came on a day when I could only just attend and do the small work of lighting candles and standing by with smelling salts for any lady who fainted at the table. My mother intended, she'd told me, to ask first for a spirit of healing. And she did. My mother made the usual invocations, summoning spirits to enter and speak. All went well for a short time. Her clients seemed well satisfied and impressed. And then she called upon a new spirit, not one of the departed, a more celestial summoning. It ought to have been safe enough, but it was far from that. It took control of a man seated to her left, a young man of fragile stature, with wavy blonde hair and an uncertain smile, whom I had formed a little dreamy crush upon as I hovered near to the proceedings. My mother opened her eyes and said in a very loud and frightened voice, "'Who is here?' It was not the way she normally administered these events, and it startled me. The young man next to her dropped her hand, stood, and picked up the crystal gazing ball my mother kept upon the table. He looked down on her for a breathless instant, and I saw the terrible, gleeful smile on his face. To the outright horror of all of us, he then smashed it into my mother's skull three times. Then he looked directly up at me and smiled. There were flecks of gore on his face and smears of brain, and his eyes were indescribably wrong. I looked deep into evil. Evil looked deep into me and healed me. I felt it as an electric bolt through my body, one that knocked me nearly senseless, and I felt the sickness in my body recede. And then, as the other seance participants broke their frozen shock and fled screaming into the street, the young man crouching over my mother picked up a thin-bladed letter opener from a side table and plunged it first into my dying mother's left ear, then her right, and then began to fumble at her clothes, ripping and tearing. I think that was the moment, why then I still wonder, that my horrified paralysis broke, and I ran screaming from the house into the street. I hardly remember the rest of the evening, though I have the bare impression of a church, a kind pastor, impatient policeman who disbelieved my story of ghosts and mediums. They never found the young man who so destroyed my mother, but I believed then, and still believe, that he was only a victim too. I remembered the sad, shy smile of the young man as I'd seated him, and his murmured thanks for the glass of whiskey I'd poured him. The thing that looked from the young man's eyes had not been present in him then. My mother had birthed it into this world for my sake and been murdered by it, and I had been troubled for years by the notion that once summoned such a terrible beast would be difficult to destroy, if any even recognized it for what it was. Troubled even more that I had benefited from the horror of my mother's death. I have avoided spiritualists and all things supernatural ever since. Even when I was in the company of Miss Lurie, the murderess who'd poisoned her husband, I managed to steer her from attending seances and the like, no matter how benign or popular. I had the strong and abiding feeling that I had been seen by something that did not forget. I spent more than a decade since avoiding even the memory— but reading the dry descriptions of those crimes in Austin brought it back to me. I had not saved my mother. But perhaps scotching this very human killer in Texas could help me settle that score. The train to Austin was only two days, but in the heat of late summer it felt like an eternity, packed into an overcrowded car with sweaty people whose tempers quickly rubbed raw. I occupied a seat near the back, and in between reading Wilkie Collins's detective novel, I Say No, which I was delighted to find featured a young female detective, I took lunches and dinners, held conversations, twice broke up arguments, and once a fistfight between poker players, and slept very badly in the upright seat, cursing the requirement of a corset. 
Arriving in Austin meant arriving into a fiercely hot and humid afternoon, in a town that aspired to greatness but had only just arrived at mediocrity. There were only a few dominating buildings, some still under construction. Most were simple storefronts. Gaslights on the street, I quickly gathered, were common only on the main street that led to the new congressional building, still swarming with workers' dust and noise. I proceeded at once to the main telegraph office, where I found a communication waiting from Chicago. It directed me to a hotel close to the center of the city, a step above the boarding houses I was used to enduring, where the lady proprietors set rules that I refused to obey. I was signing the register when I felt the presence of a man looming behind me. A lady alone soon learns to have a fine-tuned sense of such things, and saw the stiff look of the face of the hotel clerk as he stared above and behind me. I needed no more clue to say without looking, "'Mr. Ward, how have you been?' His chuckle had a seat of delight in it. "'I've been tolerably well, Miss Fay. I see the company has put you up nice.' I suppose success has its privileges. I turned and smiled. Lige Ward was not a man to take in at a glance. He was simply too large and too vibrant. He favored well-tailored suits and waistcoats of shimmering watered silk. Today's was a dull gold, further enlivened by a gold watch chain and fob. His nose had been battered to a peculiar offset angle earlier in his career, and he'd earned a thick scar along his chin. The smoothness of his skin for all that would have been the envy of many a society matron. He was also black as charcoal, an uncompromisingly African color. He had been born a free man in Massachusetts and worked for the Pinkertons for almost twenty years. I found him delightful. He found me amusing. It was an excellent fit. "'Where are you staying?' I asked him. It was unlikely he had been put up here, from the scandalized look on the clerk's face. Down the road, he said. I thought I'd see you settled in and provide you with your evening's reading material. He handed over a surprisingly heavy leather valise, which, of course, he handled like a bag of feathers and I like a bag of lead. That's all the newspaper accounts I could collect so far, including some from the free man's press, which is a local colored news. You know Mr. William wired me to make sure you don't go out poking about after night, don't you? I know that you won't take any real note of what Mr. William says if you think it will stand in our way, I said. But this evening, perhaps a little study is a good idea. Shall we start tomorrow? Eight sharp, Mr. Ward said, and touched the brim of his excellent derby hat. I suppose we could meet in the street— they might toss you right out of this fine establishment if I impose too much. I turned to look directly at the clerk and take the room key from his limp fingers. If they object, then I suppose they will have to endure a call from Mr. William Pinkerton about that, I said, and produced the silver badge that identified me as a genuine agent. The clerk gulped and nodded. Tell me, do you serve a good breakfast here? The clerk looked as if he wished to melt through the floor, but he nodded and cleared his throat. In the room to the right, he said, and pointed. He couldn't keep from gazing at Mr. Ward as he did so. Is your associate also? Yes, he will be joining me, I said. Do you wish to see his badge, too? No, no, not at all. I'll inform the staff that he is m most welcome. I turned back to Ward and smiled. He shook his head. One of these days you will find a limit to that sharp charm of yours, he said, and this time he was serious. I hope it isn't here in this backwater. The room proved quite lovely, but when I was safe in bed with my pistol beside me on the nightstand, the reading that followed was not lovely at all. The breathless, lurid descriptions of murdered women filled me with a terrible foreboding, and set my pulse thudding heavily in my head. Memories stirred, and I shoved the ghosts away. I made notes in a bound notebook I had brought especially for this purpose. The intruder does not care if others are present. That was obvious. He hadn't shied away from murdering Molly Smith while she shared a bed with her common-law husband, 
nor poor Eliza Shelley, whose young children had been left in the bed to suffer their mother's horrible death, nor Irene Cross, whose nephew had been just a room away and forced to hear the entire brutal assault. I pored over the endless pages of newsprint until my eyes ached, and made an extensive list of reports of attacks that no one, not even the reporters, had seen fit to connect to the murders. It struck me hard that on the evening of the unsuccessful attack of two Swedish servant girls, the only two white victims so far, there were no less than seven other attempts made on Negro women in the same area, all between the hours of midnight and dawn. All were foiled, but it was a horribly alarming trend. I put out the lamp at the ghost-ridden hour of three in the morning, and if I dreamed I don't remember. I had no way of knowing then that as I slept, the worst outrage yet was occurring only three blocks away. I woke at seven, but had not even begun to dress when a knock came at my door. I threw on a thin dressing gown and rushed to open it, and saw a uniformed porter there, eyes averted as he thrust a note toward me. "'From a visitor downstairs, ma'am,' he said with that peculiar Texas twang, and rushed off as if the sight of me could have turned him to stone. Shy, these Texas boys. I shut and locked the door and opened the folded note. In Elijah Ward's strong, distinctive handwriting, it said, Come at once. There is another. I settled for a severe bun in my hair, something fast and simple, and dressed as quickly as I could. I wanted a bath, but Ward's note left no time for it. I paused only to put my pistol in my sewn-in pocket, I had long insisted on them, though dressmakers were scandalized, along with my wallet and Pinkerton badge, and then hurried out to join Mr. Ward. I found him pacing the lobby, looking as grim as I'd ever seen him. His suit was tidy, his waistcoat plain black silk, and for him it was very near to funeral attire. I slowed as I approached him and said, "'What is it? What's happened?' "'Come,' he said. "'We've time to see it for ourselves.' It was a shockingly short walk from my hotel, which was on the main avenue that led to the Capitol building. The murder scene was a mere three or four blocks to the north. Within a few steps, we had left commerce behind, and instead passed large wood and brick houses that spoke of wealth and status. That was still the case when we arrived at a particular house on East Cedar, which seemed for all the world the home of a successful family. There was a buzzing crowd around it, and most of it composed of dark faces. Ward parted the press with gentle firmness, and I came in his wake down a narrow alley between two houses and into a generous backyard that held a kitchen garden and clotheslines. Some fifty feet separated the main grand house from a cabin and a wash house that would be for the servants. There were some onlookers here, too, but pressed near to the fence. Three men decorated with brass police stars were on the scene, and at least two soberly dressed gentlemen I immediately thought were doctors. Accustomed as they no doubt were to death, they were still ashen and unsettled as they left the premises. A Negro woman was being borne away on a stretcher as we arrived, with an awful cut to the head. She was alive by the rise and fall of her chest, but completely insensible and bathed in blood. "'What's her name?' I called to one of the stretcher-bearers. "'Rebecca Ramey,' he said. "'God damned awful thing done here. Downright evil.' A living victim. That might be helpful. I felt a surge of relief, and then I saw Mr. Ward's grim expression. He nodded toward the wash-house, and we began to walk toward it. One of the men I'd marked for Austin police intercepted us. He was a banty fellow that I was fairly certain was stronger than he looked, for he faced the pair of us down without a blink. "'No gawkers wanted here,' he said, and pointed back to the street. "'Get out!' For answer, both Ward and I produced Pinkerton badges. "'We are here to work on the case at the invitation of the city marshal,' I said. "'Please, show us the scene.' He sneered at us. "'Don't care where your tin badges come from. "'Turn your pretty caboose around and—' "'Please send the lady in, Officer Akis. called another voice from inside the wash house. "'Always happy to help the pinks.' "'I exchanged a look with Mr. Ward, "'and I knew we were, as usual, in accord. "'We were not welcome, 
and this was an opportunity for the police to shock us with what lay inside. I made certain that I was ready before I stepped across the threshold, but it did not help much. I had been prepared for a woman's body stretched on the floor, but instead I encountered a wretchedly small form. A child. I took in the stench of fresh blood, the pooling around her head, and not one but two more doctors in attendance who were wiping their hands clean with restless motions. The poor girl victim was no more than a dozen years old, I judged. Her head was terribly misshapen, and her nightdress, sewed with gentle pink flowers, had been wrenched up under her arms. "'Well, Miss Pink, have you got an eyeful?' rasped the detective, a sallow man with a thick mustache and bitter sarcasm thinly disguising disgust and rage. Mother's head's all smashed in, and this poor child took hours dying here on this floor after the brute was done with her. Put those Chicago smarts to work and tell me who did it. I slowly crouched down, careful to keep my skirts brushed behind me and away from the area of the body. I studied the dead girl. Her skin had begun to go ashen. No one had closed her eyes, and they had taken on a thick, dry look as they stared up at the dark roof. I had seen the dead in all manner of poses in photographs, and a few in person, but never a child. I did not allow myself to feel much in that moment. I made myself a camera, capturing light and shadow in minute detail. There was something familiar about this scene, hauntingly so, and yet so very different. "'What is that object near her head?' I asked. My voice sounded quite calm and quite distant. The two doctors exchanged glances. The taller one said, "'An iron spike. It was stabbed through both ears to the brain. If it didn't kill her, it hastened the end along.' I felt a shiver grow through me, though I did not otherwise react. "'Hauntingly familiar.' "'Was she also assaulted?' I asked. It was clear to me that she was a victim of sexual outrage, but one did not directly ask such things. Assaulted was the common oblique term. The doctors avoided my gaze, preferring to fix their stares into the middle distance over one another's heads. It was the Austin detective who said, Of course she was assaulted, dragged out of her bed over the bleeding body of her mother all the way out here, to be violated and tormented and murdered. We'll get the bastard who's done it. I guarantee that. I did not doubt his passion. I did doubt his intelligence. I had also read the methods adopted by the locals to solve their murders and attacks. It most simply targeted young Negro men in vast numbers, attempting to force confessions from them. They would not find this killer with such tactics. I did not think they would ever find him at all, not unless they admitted what was plain as day to me. The same fiend who'd killed three others had done for this poor child, too. I stood up again. If they thought to see me waver, they were disappointed. I nodded a thanks to the doctors, then the detective. May we read the final autopsy reports? No, the detective said. Good day, and get on your way back to Chicago. We don't need the damn pinks meddling in our affairs. The city marshal had hired us but it clearly cut no ice with the Austin police. That did not much trouble me, nor did I imagine it troubled the very silent Mr. Ward still behind me. Pinkerton detectives were well acquainted with working independent of the local authorities. In fact, it was quite encouraged, since so often the police's methods were driven by political pressures rather than evidence and fact. Thank you, I said and turned to Mr. Ward. Have you questions? Not for them, he said. His deep voice seemed to fill the room, and in it was pure, grim anger. They don't know much anyhow. Here now, boy, who do you think you're talking to? The detective said. I ain't your boy, and I think I'm talking to a man who won't get this girl any justice, Mr. Ward said. Come on, Miss Fay, let's get to it. We walked away. And when I was a few steps from the wash house, I drew in a deep breath, as deep as my corset would allow, and fought back a convulsive shiver. There was evil in that place, as dark as I could imagine. I'd felt its brush before. 
I'd seen the gleam of it in the shadows. I followed Mr. Ward to a group of Negro men and women gathered near the fence. I kept myself distant and listened to the conversation Mr. Ward had with the onlookers. He was calm, quiet, and quickly established a rapport with many of them, who readily gave him stories of the injured woman Rebecca Ramey and her poor daughter Mary. But my attention was drawn to someone who was not saying a word. She was an elderly, withered woman, leaning on the arm of a strong young man. The eyes behind her gold-rimmed spectacles were sharp. Despite her many years, and her old-fashioned black morning dress seemed appropriate to the day, stifling though the heat was even at this early hour. She watched Mr. Ward with singular intensity, and finally cut her gaze toward me. I nodded to her politely, and she inclined her head back. Hot out today, I said. May I fetch you a cold drink? She didn't blink, but that gathered me a startled look from a number of those around her. The old lady smiled slowly. A lady Pinkerton and a Negro one, too. Ain't that a nine days wonder? Some might say, I agreed. May I? She nodded, more to see what I'd do than from thirst, I believed. I turned, marched smartly up the steps to the rear door of the fine house, and knocked. There was silence for a moment, then a slender young white woman in the black dress and lace apron of a servant opened it and looked at me uncertainly. When I asked for water, she seemed utterly unsure how to proceed, but I sensed there was no one to ask, and she fetched it for me quick enough. I carried the cut crystal glass back to the elderly woman, who accepted it with a gracious nod, sipped, and admired the fine glass before handing it back. I drained the rest of the drink, which caused another murmur in the crowd. "'Ain't afraid of catching the black, are you?' she asked. "'All right, then. Ask your questions.' "'What do you think happened here?' I asked her. Everyone else had fallen silent, listening for her reply." Even Mr. Ward was paying heed now. "'I think the devil's walking here,' the old woman said, and in the heat of an Austin morning I felt chills freeze through me in spikes of pure ice. "'And I don't think he's leaving of his own accord.' Mr. Ward and I sat in Mrs. Tussie Benjamin's parlor. The house is well to the north of the Ramey murder site, in a modest, clean neighborhood of mostly Negro families. Mrs. Benjamin was the moral authority of this community, a woman of such impressive dignity and presence that she could have been a queen in another land and time. One of her three daughters served us strong coffee and honey cake, and it seemed as fine a meal as I thought I'd have in my fancy hotel. Pinkertons, Mrs. Benjamin said. Well, at least you seem more inclined to look for the truth than the town police. Young black men can't walk these streets without being rounded up like cattle and beat half to death on suspicion. Do you believe the killer is a Negro man? I asked, and sipped coffee. Mrs. Benjamin hadn't been served coffee or cake, and I wondered if we'd taken all the bounty of this house. I left the cake on the plate and handed it with a smile and a wink to a young boy standing nearby, who was looking at it worshipfully. He looked to Mrs. Benjamin for permission, and she graciously gave it. Mr. Ward did the same for a small, underfed girl. Mrs. Benjamin seemed gratified. "'I can't say about this unholy creature's race,' the old woman said. "'But I know it ain't the human race.' You take one look at his work, you know that. Brain and women in their beds right next to their husbands and children, dragging them out like trash and having his way. Ain't a one of these women deserved these deaths, and that child today. She clucked her tongue, a sharp, angry sound. Devil does his work, somebody has to stop him. I don't know that it'll be us on our own, ma'am, Mr. Ward said. He sipped his coffee, too, and the cup looked laughably tiny in his hands, like a child's toy. Three times that size might look like a decent mug to him, but he was careful with that china. 
we don't know this town or your people. We're going to need their help if we mean to start right and go right. Mrs. Benjamin's eyes narrowed. You sound like all the badges who tell us it's our fault that we can't read the tea leaves and tell them who it is. Like all of us are one and then some. No, ma'am, that isn't what I meant, Mr. Ward said, and put the cup carefully aside. He leaned forward toward her, earnestness in every line. I mean that our folks see what the white folks in their nice houses don't. Servants see the cruel men in private, when no one's looking. You send me those who work for such men, and we'll make a start. You send me the names of ladies who fear their men, and we'll make that start, too. Mr. Ward, I realized, had not bought the wholesale assumption that the killer was a black man. I realized that just perhaps I didn't either. A white man wouldn't be stopped and questioned. Not in this climate that saw mass roundups of young blacks. Easy for him to move about. And if he was spotted near a home, it would be assumed that he was meant to be there, most likely. It would be worse after today, I thought. The murder of Mary Ramey would bring all this to a boil. Mrs. Benjamin considered Ward's words for a long, long moment. I sipped coffee and waited. One thing a Pinkerton soon learns is patience. You may use my parlor, Mrs. Benjamin said to him. I'll see those with knowledge find their way. She turned her clouded dark gaze to me now. Your time, Miss Pink, would be better spent with those fine ladies in their houses. They know more than they're saying. I inclined my head. We finished our coffee and cordial conversation, and with the sun high and the day striking nine o'clock, I took my leave and set about my business. By three o'clock, I was thoroughly full of cakes, tea, and coffee, and I had learned very little from the polite white society of Austin, except that they still held resentment about being forced to join the Union and thought that free Negro servants were nowhere near as efficient as slaves. It had been an effort to choke down even the finest cake while listening to these pampered, somewhat desperate women discuss how servants who looked up to their mistresses properly had quite disappeared. No one, of course, believed anything but that a gang of young black men were responsible for the outrages, but they were sufficiently bored in their insular lives to share gossip. Not with me, of course, but with each other, and I silently committed it all to memory for later use. Two or three ladies spoke in pitying terms of friends whose marriages were miserable, due to the cruelty of their husbands. I quickly jotted down names in a small book I kept handy in another hidden pocket, under the cover of my plate. These clues led nowhere at the time. I knew I'd have long and wearying days of this ahead if we were to make any headway at all. Mr. Ward had left a note at my hotel that he would be occupied through the evening, and for me to meet him in the morning at a restaurant down the street. I went to my room and disrobed down to my underthings and a silken robe, grateful to be out of that sweat-soaked corset. My once crisp steel-gray dress had gone limp from the heat and humid air, and I took out a similar one made of navy blue and laid it out for dinner. Three hours of rest and a bath restored me, and I feasted happily in the dining room of the hotel— though as a lone woman I received cold treatment by the staff until I laid my Pinkerton badge on the table without comment. Service considerably improved. Well fed and rested, I set out to do precisely what I knew Mr. Ward did not want me to do. I ventured out into the dark. Austin, I reflected, was not a terribly large place, and if the marauder was set on visiting the homes of the wealthier white families to attack servants— then that narrowed the field even closer. The navy dress was a fine choice for nighttime prowling, as it blended well with shadows. I have to take care not to be fired upon by some nervous householder, but all in all I felt comfortable in the darkness. I was aware of the risk, of course, but this was not the first place I had gone hunting, and hardly the most dangerous place. I observed a number of black youths, none older than sixteen, roaming and pelting houses with stones. 
the typical behavior of young men in any city hoping to stir up trouble. I glimpsed someone else watching them from the shadows. Mr. Ward had also picked up the trail, and as I watched, he grabbed two of the leaders by the scruff of their necks, shook them like puppies, and warned them that they were going to get their fool heads shot away if they continued. That took the fun out of it, and they all scrambled away, disappearing into the night. Mr. Ward calmly strolled over to me and set his back against the fence. Well, Miss Fay. Well, Mr. Ward. I see you're taking advice as well as ever. I thought you were investigating possible killers among the white men of this town. Oh, and I have, I said. I've a list of twelve men of property who have a variety of deviances, according to local brothel keepers. Did you know that the brothels in this town also provide rooms for married assignations so as to avoid the gossip of a hotel? No, I didn't, he said. Seems gossip would follow more for a married woman visiting a brothel than a hotel. So you'd think, I agreed. But silence is a brothel madam's greatest virtue, and no man who glimpses a familiar face is going to breathe a word of it either. A dozen men on your list, Ward said. I have that many on my side, too. Some are known for their hatred of women, some just criminals of opportunity. I don't think that this is the work of any mere criminal, do you? No. I expect we're going to find someone we never saw coming. He heaved a sigh. You staying out all night? The murders happened between midnight and dawn, I said. When do you propose we catch him, if not then? These are women sleeping in their beds and a tiger on the loose. Who knows where he could be prowling? You expect to stop a tiger with that gun you have in your pocket? I expect to stop most things, I said, provided it has eyes I can shoot through. I was thinking now of the man who had slaughtered my mother, of the gentle kindness of his eyes before, and the inhuman gleam of them after. I wouldn't forget those eyes, not a moment of my life, and I had often imagined firing a bullet through one, then the other. Perhaps if I could do the same to this monster, it would settle the ghost of the other. Then, with a violent surge, I remembered Mary Rainey, an innocent child splayed on that floor in her own drying blood, head broken, ears pierced through with a spike, ravaged and destroyed, and a surge of bile caught in my throat. I hadn't allowed emotions to rule me in that wash house. I could not afford them now either. I opened my mouth to speak, then paused. I turned my head to catch a distant sound. A horrible cry. I swung my attention to Mr. Ward and recognized that he'd heard it as well. Without a word, we ran. There was already a crowd gathering when we achieved the spot, some four blocks distant. Dogs barked excitedly and lanterns blazed and we pushed through to find a Negro woman collapsed in the backyard of a fine brick house. Halfway between the residence and the small cabin, she must have occupied in the rear. She had blood pouring from a gash as long as my hand on her forehead, and was quite insensible. A shaken-looking young man of the same rich shade as Mr. Ward stood over her, as if he intended to protect her from all comers. He had a blind, anguished look that made me put a hand on Mr. Ward's arm to restrain him. I stepped forward, moving slowly, and pitched my voice to a quiet tone. Sir, may I ask your name? He blinked, as if it was the last thing he expected. I saw some of the day's look lift. But Matthew, he said. I realized that he was a young I realized that he was younger than I thought at first glance perhaps fifteen or sixteen at the most. She's my mother. And you saved her, I said, still in that soothing tone. But now you must let us help her. He was holding a blood-smeared rock in one hand. He must have immediately realized what I meant, because he quickly handed it to me. I put it carefully on the ground and knelt down beside the poor woman. Her pulse was strong, and when I carefully probed the wound on her head, 
I didn't feel any break in her skull, though it might well have been cracked. There was no bruising yet, but I thought the blow might have been from a kosh, a sandbag meant to stun but not kill. The young man, I realized, had been hit as well. He collapsed to his knees, and Mr. Ward rushed forward to examine him. "'Skull's broken,' he said flatly, and looked up at the milling, anxious crowd. "'Fetch a doctor! Go!' At long last, the door to the main house flew open, and a squat, fat white man in a voluminous dressing gown hurried down the steps, followed by a woman who was almost certainly his wife and another younger man. This one, I noted, was fully dressed in a shirt, trousers, and street shoes. "'What the devil is happening?' the elder man barked, staring at the scene. "'Lily? Matthew? Has there been some kind of fight? What have you done to your mother?' He immediately turned to blame the young man, which sickened me. It was clear that the woman had been dragged here, and when I took in rapid assessment of the landscape, the attacker had clearly been taking her toward the outhouse building. Molly Smith had been found behind an outhouse, and Mary Ramey actually inside one. There was no question in my mind that poor Matthew had interrupted the same intent. This young man is himself injured, I told the homeowner coolly. He stopped the assault on his mother. You owe him your admiration, not your accusation. The man's face turned florid. Like most of his ilk, he didn't care to be corrected. And who the devil are you, madam? Summon the police, I told him, and didn't bother to answer his question. All of you onlookers, keep back. There may be footprints here. I had to shout that at some curious neighbors who were edging forward to catch a glimpse of the downed woman. This is my property, and I won't have some damned northern hoyden come in here to— Silence, sir, I snapped at him. If you know what's good for you, you will take your family within and dress before the police arrive. They will have questions for you. I would make sure of it. The fact that the son was fully dressed at this hour certainly sparked a doubt in me— as did the way he studied the fallen victim. But there was something here that I was not comprehending, not yet. I could feel it hovering like a bad spirit in the darkness, a shivering sense of what might almost be glee. The young man, Matthew, lifted his bloody head and said something. Though I didn't catch his words, the effect they had on Mr. Ward were profound enough to make him let go and step away, and give me a look that froze me in my tracks. All calculation fled. I had known Lijah Wood for quite some time, and I had never seen such a look. I didn't even know what it meant, only that it was significant. What? I asked him. He shook his head, looked at the boy again, and said, Nothing. He was lying to me. I could feel it, and I could not for the life of me guess why. Mr. Ward left while I engaged with the police, who had hours of tiresome and blunt-edged questions about the events of the evening. Some could not seem to comprehend that I, a woman, was the rightful owner of a Pinkerton badge. When the detective I'd seen at Mary Ramey's murder arrived, he dispersed them like a cat among the pigeons and strode right to me. "'Miss Pink,' he said, and it sounded very much like disgust. Ah, uh, see, this time you are here early. This time the lady is not dead, I said, and thank God for that. We'll see who to thank, he said, and began a sharper interrogation of me before moving on to the trembling Matthew, who was being tended by a weary-looking physician. He picked up the rock and examined it, frowning. You found this here? I did not want to say it, but if I didn't, others would. The boy was holding it, I said. I think he grabbed it to defend his mother. He was half insensible when we arrived, but still guarding over her. Or about to beat her to death, the detective said. She was not struck with a rock, I pointed out. The wound is a split made from the force of the blow. But there is no evidence of the type of irregular gash this rock would provide. And how the devil would you know what sort of wounds a rock could inflict? He practically sneered it, 
and I had to firmly restrain the urge to brain him with one to prove my point. "'You're a sensible man,' I said. This was doubtful. "'You know very well that this is the sort of wound a sandbag weapon makes. You use them often enough on your suspects, I imagine.' That earned me a narrow look, but I knew I was right. The Austin police were not kind and gentle souls. I'd heard the tales of young Negro men being beaten, kicked, threatened with, and dragged with nooses on their necks. It would only get worse, following Mary Ramey's tragic death. I feared for young Matthew most sincerely. This would be a simple matter to blame him for this attack, and there was nothing I could do to prevent it. Already the husbands and boyfriends of other victims had been dragged in and charged, never mind the evidence. Matthew would fare no better, never mind his cracked skull. And I would not be able to save him. It was frustrating, infuriating, but arguing with this man would do no one any good. And how did you happen on this scene, Miss Pink? We heard a cry, I said. We, he repeated, and I knew I'd made a misstep. If Mr. Ward had faded away from this scene, he'd had a good reason. You and your dusky friend, I assume. I smiled. We heard a cry, I repeated, and hurried here. Mr. Ward might have spotted someone of interest to pursue. I don't know. I was suddenly desperate to keep the glare of this man's attention from Mr. Ward. He'd had some information to tell me, something that had knocked him off balance. If he 